center from here. Yeah, you will give it a go. Okay. <coughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, hello and good morning, everybody. My name is Yeet Boyar. I'm a member of the UI Toolkit team in Android. But today we'll talk about Android architecture and mostly about next billion users. That's what MBU stands for. Clicker. So what happens when you develop an application is Usually, you live in the United States, or like you live in these like developed parts of the world, and this is your main user base. Like internet is good or reliable, everything like all the new stuff comes up there, and then you're like, oh, I'm doing my job very well. My application works very well. I'm a good developer, but that's not actually true. Most of the world cannot use your application, or they don't have a good experience. And by I say most of the world. Is 78% of the world population. It's like this huge. Four out of five people cannot have a good experience with your application. Why? Because what you leave, the, the circumstances you test your application is so different than what they actually observe. So today we'll try to talk about like how do we close give this gap? Like how can what are the things that we should pay attention to make this a lot better? So this is from the International Communication Union numbers. In year 2000, uh, like most of the world was in, develop, in the developed country, like 75% of internet users from developed countries. There was only 25% from these developing countries, and they, they were not buying in-app purchases or whatever, you would mostly ignore them. Well, there was, I guess, no in-app purchase in year 2000. But you got the point. But in year 2015, there are 3.2 billion internet users, and most of them are in these developing countries. So if you ignore these people, you're actually ignoring the like, huge chunk of user base. You're ignoring your future. Like, it's your, you know, if you want to be successful, you, your application needs to work very well for these users. It's very important. It's a feature. And I, you may think like this is another number. It's how many people have broadband subscription. In developed countries, this 90%, like almost all of us have internet connection on our phones if you are living in one of these countries. But if you go into developing countries, it's 40% of people, like half of the people don't have mobile broadband subscription. And even if they do, most of these people like keep it off. Uh, if you've been to like India and uh, like other parts of the world, people are very, very careful about their data. And only 40% has it anyways. But you might think about, hey, like the mobile internet is fast, right? Like when, when they have and they want to use my application, it will still work very well. Now let's look at some other numbers to prove this. So overall in the world, the 3G coverage by population is 69%. There's a very good number, like 70% of the world population has 3G coverage in their area. That's like very good internet by many means. But if you look at the rural population, it's 30%. So if you're not living in a city, there's a 30% chance that your area has 3G, co 3G coverage. And what's below 3G? We're talking about like edge. I don't know. So if you look at urban population, so if you live in a city, there's 90%. It's a very good number. 90% of people have 3G at a given time. So I was giving, like, talking about these numbers before, and I, in a conference, I asked people, when was the last time you have seen Edge on your phone, right? Like, you don't do that. You never get it. And as someone replied me on Twitter, you asked me last time I had Edge, it's here in DroidCon San Francisco. So even if you're in San Francisco, this sometimes what you get. Like, it happens because it's very hard to have a good coverage for populated areas, and then it doesn't end up working well. So how do we fix this? Cache, right? Like everybody does this. So you use whatever networking library, it caches your data, you cache your images, you are good, right? No. So we'll look at an example about that. Let's say I have this application. Right? It's showing the news from you know, Sharks, the Bay Area uh, team. So I, I click on the news, I read the news, it's all looking fine, wah, wah. And then I see this. How does this happen? Because I did go somewhere else. I use my phone, 
I'm out of network. I come back to that page. The TT was killed, restarted. Hey, you never fetch that page because you only fetch the list of news, but you never fetch that particular news page because you did not cache it properly. You show a loading bar to the user. Although you have the data, like you have a HTTP cache that has that news item, but you cannot show it to the user. That's very sad. That should not happen. So learn is request caching is not enough. If you're caching, you should be caching your data. So then we say, OK, hopefully we're a little bit agree on we should embrace the next billion users. And how do we do that? This is always the question that comes up. I always put this slide, which architecture I choose. Every other day, there's a new architecture article on the internet. It's crazy. Like Everybody implements something new, like this architecture, that architecture. I have no idea which one to choose. But the actual thing is, it doesn't matter. Who cares which architecture you use? Like your user doesn't care. It's good for you. You should. It's good for you to scale your application, you know, have it stable, test it well. But your users have no idea what you are using. All they care about is their user experience. So this is what should be on your mind every time you write some code. So what to do? There's two main things you need to do. First, your application should work offline. Think about your writing an app for a desktop 10 years, 15 years ago, where there was like usual no network. Think when you're writing an app, plan everything that way. So your application should always work offline. It should never require network. And you optimize for the bad network. Because even if you have network, it's not necessarily a good network. I know on your desk in your office is usually a good network, but that's not what your users have. So you need to, you need to think about them. OK. So let's start with offline applications. So what do, what do I mean by offline apps? The first, the major thing you need to be careful about is removing network from your user experience. So when users is interacting with your application, hopefully there should never ever be a network request in that flow. Well, if you are doing a login page, yes. But that's only like a few times it's mandatory. Usually it's optional. So let's look at an app. There's a dating app, so there's a guy. And then you click on the like button, because you want like that, and you are seeing a model dialogue. Liking Joe. <laughs> I told you to like Joe. I know. Yes, you'll do that. Why do you have to block me for that? Like, don't do that. This is so unnecessary. User doesn't need to know about that. OK. So we say, remove that. Like, don't, don't block the user about this. And if you very briefly, like very abstract level, if you look at the application, what happens there is you click on the button. It calls your like, presenter view controller, whatever you choose to use. And then it calls the network. When the network decides to come back, you get it off the model dialog. But like, who cares? User doesn't even understand. Like, my mom doesn't really understand that there's a network request somewhere. Like, she doesn't know what network is. Get it off it. So instead, do something, a model, like model your data locally. So that when user clicks, hits the click button, you just update the model. Your market is liked. They say, like, you know, 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds. It comes back. You update the view. Then your model tells it to the network, hey, like there's a change I have locally. Can you apply it to the server? And the server comes back. You refresh your view again because now you know you really change it. So if we implemented it this way, it will look like this. You tap on the button. There is some sort of indication that user intake, like user receives a feedback instantly. And then when you finally synchronize it, it turns red. So it's important that you give a feedback to the user so they understand something has changed. And then you finally also let them know. And the users learn this. And this is what we call the responsive user experience. So we'll look at the same application again. I tap on it. Oh, it's yellow. Nice. I know something is happening. It received my tap. So I go back. There's other people. You tap someone else again. You go here. Nice. It's still doing something. Like, ah, it's, it's consistent. This is good. Then I go to, OK, I did that again, another use case. And I go to this page. Like, I'm just reading news, right? I, I stay there I'm doing something else. And the Android decides to kill the application because we needed memory. And I, Time passes. I come back to the application, and bang. I don't see it anymore. <laughs> that was yellow. I put some information, like, this is so annoying for the user. You put some comment, 
you come back, it's not there anymore. Now you have no idea what happened there. Like, did it post? Did it not post? What happened? Is a buggy app? So you don't want to do this. And how do we fix this? So in the previous one, where we said we have control calls the model, model calls the network, blah, blah. OK, let's improve this a little bit. Introduce something, like, call it application logic, and make the model persistent. It's very important. Like, you should use it. You should definitely use, use SQLite, use Realm, use whatever you want. We don't care. But use persistent data storage. So when the application logic does any network request, it always updates the persistent model. And then dispatches an event, or you might be using RxJava observables. Again, we don't care. Dispatches an event, and the view shows the state on the model. The important, there are two important parts here. The model should be persistent, and the view should always reflect what is in the model. So you don't ju just go and change the button to like a uh, selected state while you try to make a web request. Don't do that. Update the model. Let the view refresh itself. Because when you do this, as a user clicks click, you tell the application logic, I want to send a like. That updates the model. Model says, hey, I have changed. Or the application logic says, I have changed. And the, your view knows, if user is there, I'm like, all right, I should refresh myself because the data I'm displaying has changed. So you go there, it refreshes the UR. This is when it is yellow because you know data is pending. It's not synced yet. And now when the application logic finally syncs it, maybe three days later, who cares? It updates the model again. And if your view is still there, it's going to refresh itself. The idea is you write these views. They try to represent what's in the model and nothing else. Of course, some like transient temporary UI state. So we look at the application again. We go there. There was a profile you see. You go back. You go to another profile. You go back. Like you're using the application for a while. And now what happens is you go back to this list again, and there's a loading. It's like, I was on the application two minutes ago. I saw that list. Like, there is no way you are loading that list because I know the list is there. So what went wrong here? So it's what was happening. Every time you go into a UI, you fetch the list of users, right? You fetch the, you know, the data, if the user liked it. So this is your like, background thread pool. You keep consuming these things. You have multiple workers. So one of them is refreshing user data from network. The other one is, uh, again, like doing stuff, sends the user stats. And like, you went back to that UI. You want to read the list of users from the disk. So you implement the right way. You are trying to load it from the disk. But the problem is your background trends are busy trying to make a network request. Like, this is so bad because you know disk is there. You know you will be able to access it. But the network, you don't know. And you are making the user wait for no reason. And the solution for this is very simple. You just have different queues for different type of events, have different queues. Well, you cannot just create a queue for every type of event. But usually, at least, you should have one for your network-related stuff and one for your local access. Even for local access, you'll probably just use a loader or an async task. That will be fast enough, because those things are like under 200 milliseconds, 300 milliseconds, very fast. So once we do this, as we add these tests, because we want to get data, they, they get consumed in different queues. So even if the network is slow, locally, everything is working. This is what we call like application should work offline. Like Everything just works. And then you're trying to sync it later on. Of course, it's not always everything. Whatever. So we look at the other section. How do you optimize for the next billion? And the next billion looks like this. So this is 101. You need to translate your application. If you want people to use it in other areas of the world, you want it to be translated. So you translate the application. You translate your assets, because you may have text there. And you also translate your in-app purchases so that they can spend money. But actually, this is not completely true. Translating is not enough. That's not the right word. The right thing you should do is localize. So localize your application. Don't just translate it, because let's say you have an application about a family like communicating with their kids, whatever. On the place or page, if you have an American family in the United States, put an Indonesian family in Indonesia. And if you're in China, put a Chinese family. Like you should 
localize your assets also within the application because this is what will make sense to that user. Every culture has their differences. And you, if you want to make best of localization, this is what you should be doing. And the other thing is text-free layouts. Now, when you can do this, it's really useful. For example, if you have a messaging app, if you just want to say send, don't say send. Put a checkbox. WhatsApp does this very well. Or if it is red, put double checkbox. This helps you first. You don't need to translate it. It's fairly global. Your users learn it. And even if, you know, if your application is not messaging something else, the literature rate may not be very good in that area, this will help more users be able to use your application. And another example, if you don't have Wi-Fi, don't say no Wi-Fi. Just put this. They learn. People learn these things. And multiple applications use the same icons. And if you use like, the material team and stuff, when user lands in your application, they actually know it. Like, they get a head start. It's very important. The other thing is about adaptive content fetching. So let's say this is an application that shows photos. And this is the same UI. Pretty much looks the same. Of course, the one on the right is kind of low quality. But the one on the left is 100% is JPEG. And the right is 10% JPEG. And it's almost one tenth of it in terms of size. And it looks OK. Now, of course, you don't want to show a lower quality image to your users. But you need to think about they either see the lower quality image or they see a blank screen. There's a big difference between seeing a blank screen and a low quality image. And bonus points, you can refresh the content. So you realize the network is not very good. You refresh the lower quality image. And once you figure out somewhere else the network recovers, you refresh those images. Especially if it is free, you should do that. And luckily, now the Connected Media Manager API actually tells you if the network is metered or not. So I want to give some examples what we do at Google about these things. For example, if you're using Google+, in the settings menu, there's a way to say, OK, commerce data usage. Now, like, if you're even living in the United States, you probably don't really check because you have unlimited data. But the rest of the people pay premiums for their data. So they're very, very conscious about it. So you put the settings like that. And in Google+, these are what we actually do. If the network is fast, we, we fetch a high quality JPEG. As the network goes slower, we go lower on WebP versions. So we show a version. At least like, instead of seeing a blank screen, users see some data. We help them save their data. This is a win-win. And they get a better user experience. And we also educate the users. This is also important. It's like, what does it mean to commerce data? Why don't you always do it, right? Like, why are you wasting my data? And if you users click on that, we, OK, we explain them. This is what it means to save data. Another part is adaptive behavior. Now, it's very common in applications to have like auto-playing GIFs or auto-playing videos. What you should do is, OK, at this point, my user is showing my feed. Is the network fast? If the network is fast, it's cool. Just go auto-play the video. But if the network is slow, don't do that. Just put a play button. Don't waste their network just because they may want to watch that video. That's a bad thing for your users. And I have good network here, so I will play this video. Yes. <laughs> good girl. <laughs> Applause for Frida. <laughs> OK, so for example, this is what we do in YouTube, right? In YouTube, if you go to quality settings, there's an option that says auto. It's actually what it does. By checking the network quality, we adjust your bitrate. And I'm sure you are so used to this behavior, you maybe don't even notice. But it takes time to implement. But the good news is the Exo Player library from Google already supports Dash and smooth streaming. All you have to do is use this library and let it handle these you know, different network protocols. Of course, also your server side needs to support it. Well, it's not hard. It's easy. It's important. OK. All right. So this is another use case. We'll look at Uncle Bob. So this guy goes to work every morning, takes the bus, maybe Google bus, reads his news on the bus, does the same thing on the way back. This happens all the time. But what also happens all the time is this. He's seeing a loading dialog when he tries to read his network, read his news, because 
there's like another 60 people in the same bus trying to use the same internet connection, and there's a lot of other cars there. It's where like the network gets congested, and he cannot get like no one gets a good experience. How can we fix this? Well, good news is that this guy goes to work almost the same time every morning. So he wakes up at 6.30. No brainer, set an alarm, right? We can set an alarm to prepare the content for him. And also, maybe he leaves the like, work at like 5.30 every night. Then we set an alarm for that and prepare the content so that they get some content when they open the application. And the way we can do this is we have the alarm manager class that will help you wake up your application every morning 6.30, so you can prefetch your content. So let's say we implemented it. We are good, right? So all these users have a good experience. Every morning 6.30, they get the latest news, and they are happy. But then we get more users, and more users make this request at like 6.30, and then this is what happens. Your cloud goes down. And you know what comes up when your cloud goes down? Your system admin. That guy slept at like 4.30 a.m. in the morning. You woke him up at 6.30 with a pager. Why? Because you just made that request at 6.30 from every single client. And actually, it's a real story. We, we once received a bug request, bug request from a provider. They said, there's a bug with Android phones. Every morning, we, at this time, we are getting so many requests. Turns out it was an application like this. So we don't do that. How do we fix this? Super simple. So instead of just waking up at 6.30, you randomize it. Wake up between 6 and 7. And then you wake up each application in that random time. And then your server admin is happy. But then we are unhappy. <laughs> Using Alarm Manager, seriously? It's 2016. Come on, how do we do this? We do this with Job Scheduler. <laughs> or you can use GCM Network Manager for the older API versions. So we wanted to do this with Job Scheduler. You create a job. You say, OK, this is my service. You say, we want the unmetered network. There is no reason to cache the data if the user is going to pay for it. And then we say, OK, start the earliest, around 6.30, and then make it only if the device is idle. And you say, if it's only charging. Like, these are all optional things. You say, all right, deadline. These are all optional things that you can do depending on your use case. So what does this override deadline mean? So the idea here is that, let's say we have this thing and user forgot to charge their phone. So we will never wake up in the morning. But what will happen is the job will be just waiting there, sitting idle. Maybe user will go to work, and then they will plug their phone, and then we will fetch the content. It's already passed. Like We missed the deadline. Why would you do this? So we tell the job scheduler, hey, if you cannot do this until 7.30, wake me up. So what we can do is, when the job is started, you can simply check, OK, did I get the deadline? Did the deadline expire? If the deadline expired, if that's why I was woken up, this is all custom magic. But you say, OK, is the connection unlimited? If it is not, just return force. I don't want to run this job anymore. Or if you can say something like, if the battery is charging or is like at least 75%, otherwise, I will not run this job. So this completely depends on your use case, but you get the idea. Like, think, be, try to be thoughtful about these things. I think we provide enough many APIs on the framework side to be able to implement these things. And it's not hard. And at the end, your user receives a really, really good user experience. It's important. So for example, in YouTube, you can go ahead and download a video for offline. So that like, you, know, you do it at home, you watch the TV series, you download it, and while on the bus, you can watch it. Or in maps, like recently, I was on vacation outside the country, and I just downloaded the area on Google Maps. And even, if, even though I didn't have data there, I could use my phone to navigate. It was so nice. So these are like little things that makes a huge user experience difference. Or for example, another example of prefetching. This is slightly different, but this is what we do in Google Plus. So we have, whenever we detect that there are new posts, we show a like, little touch button that you can tap to refresh. So in there, what happens behind the scenes is we detect there are new posts, we let the user know, and if the user taps, we are going to go ahead and fetch the content and then refresh the UI. 
Now we changed this a little bit. This is what we did. When we detect new posts now, we actually go ahead and fetch it. Because users in the application, we detect the new posts. Like they want to see it, right? We are like fairly comfortable that they want that content. So we fetch it for them. And then we let the user know that there is new content. Look, we don't just refresh it because they might be doing something else and it will be a really bad user experience. Instead, we just notify the user there is new content. And if they tap, we will refresh the data. Now, the difference between these two user experience flows is the first one takes around three seconds. The second one takes 0.3 seconds. This is like almost 10x. There's a 9x difference. You just change you know, the order of two operations. It's a huge user experience improvement with very, very little effort is important. But if you're doing prefetching, it's, it's a very dangerous thing. It's really good for users, but it might be also really bad. So you need to be careful. First thing you should be doing is balance for the available storage. That just don't fill out their phone, especially in the rest of the world. Like the phones have similar, like lower memory, so you shouldn't be filling it out with your prefetch content. Or if you are going to fetch some data that's expensive, let the user know, like, you know, I want to do this update, provide them a settings for these things, you know. Like, these people are really, really, uh, like, they care about their data. They're really, really into it. So you should give them options, and they will use them. The other part is, so now I always get this thing, like, oh, now the Android devices have two, three gigabytes of memory. We don't need to care about it. Wrong. It's not like that because first, the screens got a lot bigger, so we need to use a lot more graphic memory. Your SS got a lot more higher quality. Those things are wasting a lot more memory than they used to do before. Plus, we try to run a lot more many applications because that's the best for the user. So always measure your memory. And like in the latest versions of Android Studio, this is so easy. You just tap on a button. I remember before, you will need to use like get the memory down from DDMS, and then HProf convert it, and I open it in Eclipse Matte. That was a mess. Now in Android Studio, you just click on a button, takes the heap top for you, it opens this in this nice UI, and you know, like, you know there's like usual suspects there. So you just click on that, we will show you all instances of it. You can check, okay, why am I retaining this object? And the coolest thing, I love this thing, you can just right click on the selected item, we have bitmap. Like, how cool is that? You know what you have leaked. This is so much faster than what you were able to do before. So we're always spending time on making these tools better, and you should take advantage of them. Uh, so also in N, so you guys have seen, like, in Marshmallow, in N, we are spending a lot of time in battery life. Like, this is very important for us, oral system health. And we cannot do this without your help. So in N, we also introduced this new feature called Data Saver, where user can say, you know what? I want to like, limit the application data for the background apps. They don't get any data unless the network is limited. But if you're a good application, user might whitelist you. So if you implement it properly, they will whitelist you. So you will get the data while your competitor doesn't. And it only works in meter networks, so we only block you if we have a reason to do so. So how you use it? So the connectivity manager now has this new API. We could say, hey, is the active network metered? And if it is metered, there is, you can get the background status. Like you know if it is enabled, or if you are whitelisted, or you are disabled. So the idea is that even if the user, if user put data saver on, but you are whitelisted. You should still be cautious about, OK, I don't want to spend too much data. Hey, I have like user stats data. Just, just postpone it. You can send it later. You don't need to send it now. OK. So we'll go into some more offline use cases. And then I want you to like start thinking about, OK, how can I make my application more offline? So it's one use case. The first time we gave a talk, this talk a year ago, people say, OK, like if I were Commercial app, right? There's a place where people buy products. I cannot make it offline, which is true. You cannot make it offline because the price changes. There's no way you'll tell them, hey, you bought this for $500, and then one day later you charge them $700. You cannot do that. That would be rude. But there's still things you can do. In your application, like product information, right? When you buy something, when I'm going to buy something, mostly like, like electronic, I go to the same page again and again and again. This will happen. This is like user behavior. 
So optimize for that. Keep the user data. Let them search. I will probably search for the same products. Let them do a local search. Remember when we talk about having a proper persistent model? It helps you here, because you can let them search locally, but still let them know that like, you know, I'm showing the local results only. If they go to the product page, show some sort of animation saying that you, know, you cannot buy this right now. I'm fetching the price. Your designer will give you a better asset. And then when the price comes, you show it to them. So you don't block the user. But for important data, you just don't show it. Or show it grayed out. I don't know. But think about this. Another example is a messaging gap. So they say Jenny, Jenny and Michael. So there's a couple of Jenny says, OK, let's go to a movie. Michael says, sure, let's watch the big short. Jenny says, fine, pick me up at 7. And then, OK, we'll meet at 7. But around 6.30, Michael realized that, hey, like, his dog is sick. He doesn't want to leave the dog home. So he says, hey, Jenny, like, my dog is sick. Well, how about you come over? We hang out at home. That's all cool. Unless, well, you know, the message couldn't be sent for whatever reason. Fail. Tap to try again. So as a developer, you know, I let the user know I'm done. You're actually not done. Because Michael, you know, he wants to call his vet to get some like, tips and stuff. So he already left the application. So Michael did not know that you couldn't send the message. When Michael couldn't know that you didn't send the message, Jenny never saw the message. And this is Jenny's heart. It's broken because of you. <laughs> sure? oh, yeah. OK. No, no, no. All right, we have a solution. What could you do? You can do something better, right? It's important. You don't need to, like, if you like the dating profile and you couldn't send it to the user now, it's fine. Like, it's not that important. There's a messaging application. It's an instant messaging application. You have some responsibilities. So if you couldn't send the message and you know user didn't see it, let them know. Show a notification. Because you already know that user is not in your activity. You already know that they did not see the message. So instead, you show a notification. Michael calls his girlfriend, and they're a happy couple, thanks to you. And another thing, too, you, that you can like, further improve the user experiences, you can always let them know. Like If, if you're in the screen, they're messaging. If you know there's no internet connection, you know, just put it. <laughs> By the way, if you are listening for internet connection in N or O, well, like, you only receive that broadcast if you are the front application. Like, don't register for that broadcast in your manifest. It will actually stop working. So you, know, you can try. It's not going to work. Uh, but in your application, you can still use the connectivity manager and register that broadcast programmatically. So there's another example. If you have like TV schedule application, of course, they cannot watch TV offline. But you can do some stuff. You can let them like, click on a button and schedule an alarm, right? This is like. There's still things they can do because you can implant all of this within the device without requiring a network communication. So the idea here is that if you start thinking about what can I do offline, what can I do offline, you will find really, really good use cases, and it's going to differentiate your application. So even though when we talk about this talk, we say like it's next billion users offline, this actually helps those users everywhere around the world. It's not only for them. Okay. So I want to quickly go through this. It's like, OK, I'll say you synchronize the data, right? Like, you update the persistent model, and I use synchronize data. How do we do this? So luckily, scientists have been working on this problem. We don't have to solve it. There's something called operational transform, where like, things like Google Docs uses. Or there's conflict-free replication. And there's a bunch of things I don't know. There's a lot of articles, but you don't need them. What we apply is the Pareto principle. We will do the 20% of the work, we'll get the 80% of the benefits, and we will run away. For example, if you have a post or a user, that's something you can like. And when user likes it, your market is like, you update the model. But what happens is next time, like there was another request running, and it, it fetches the list of posts again, it just overrides what you have put there. That's a bad problem. How do we solve this? Very easy. You add another field that you only modify locally. So it's yours. I call this like local here. So when you want to check if user liked a post, all you do is, hey, you update that field. When you fetch, fetch the feed, it doesn't override because that field doesn't exist on the server side. And if you want to get, like, when you are 
putting the UI, if you want to check the user like this, well, it's very simple. You check if there's a local value, show it. Otherwise, use the value that you last received from the server. And this is like very, very simple thing, super easy to implement, and <coughs> gives you most of the benefit. Excuse me. So another example, let's say you were fetching posts. Some posts have been deleted on the server. Tell your server guys, let them send you the list of deleted posts. It's so easy for them to do. And this way, you can locally cache everything, always show everything locally. And if something has been deleted on the server, you will eventually get notified about it, and you will update your local data. This is very easy for them to do. So if you get another example, you could be sending the server, hey, I have the post between 8 and 31, when you make a call to get the new posts. You always send a C state or whatever, right? And now the server can again send you which items from that range has been deleted. I know it's sometimes hard to like convince your backend people, like there's a clash, everybody wants the other people to do the work. And like, there's this thing like, hey, I have a perfect REST API. So you make 25 requests just to fetch a feed. <laughs> Don't let them do that. Don't let them do that. Like, fight for it. It's important that they provide you the right APIs for your application. So there's another case here, like I'm trying to update the profile page. I have two different clients. One of them changes the favorite color, the other one changes the name, and I get a conflict. How do you solve this kind of conflicts? Add a version. Now, your data is versioned. So when you make a request, client says, OK, change the favorite color to this one on top of version 10. And then the server can say, OK, since this version, I can apply this diff and do it. Or decide whatever you want to do. Maybe you don't want them to do that. The, the thing is, it will happen very, very rarely, and you will be handling that case. So things won't override each other. And if you start versioning your objects, your value objects, you get this nice thing where, like, hey, you made a, like, fetch, you made a request to fetch posts. Some of them are updated. Server already knows. You told the server, I have these items with these versions. The stuff that has been changed, they can tell you, hey, hey, these are the posts that have been updated, and here's their new data. In one request, you get all of the diff. Again, I'm not telling you to do things this way. This is just a way of doing things. It's very simple and it's effective. OK. So if you want to read more about this topic, you can learn, go learn about like multi-version concurrency control. It's widely used in databases. Like maybe some really, really important, like learn about operational transform if it's really, really important for you to like multiple clients changing the same data. So these are solved problems. Like you just need to go ahead and check them. So that's not hard. OK, I will go through some quickly tips and tricks. It's like little bite-sized information. As I said before, about when we talk about network, design your API for your client. Like don't, so you can back to that thing, like I have a perfect REST API. No, that, that doesn't matter. But the perfect API is the one that my user experience fits the best. Like, this is what you want. So do it. Tell them to do it for you. I don't know. But your API should be for your application. And like, whatever you can do on the server, do it on the server. Like, if they can pass metadata, anything that will help you, do it there. Because like, it's much easier to scale than the tiny device you have on your pocket. And one more thing you do is batch your request. Now, again and again, we say that battery life is very important. Data is very important. If you batch your request, the battery life will improve a lot. Job Scheduler already does it for you. So you know, just use Job Scheduler or GCM Network Manager. You'll be a good citizen. We will love you. Like, you know, it's good things. So for example, this is an example of like a bad API. This is a terrible API. It gives me a user as a name and a photo URL. I have no idea what that photo URL represents. You put in a staggered grid in Recycle View. When you fetch the photo, grid starts moving because you, know, you don't know how big the image is. You just put something random there, and the image turned out to be a real weird one. So your UI had to reschedule. It's terrible for the user. It's very, very easy to fix. Like, tell your server to send you the width and height of the image so you can put a placeholder. Like, anything in Recycle View loves this. Like, when they call online, they want to have the final size. If your server sends it to you, you have the final size. You, know, you can even send the palette. Like, it's also very easy to calculate on the server side instead of doing it on the device. 
they send you the palette of the picture. So while you are fetching the picture, instead of just showing a gray box, you show another box that has the same background color. So you can like, easily transform to the new one. This improves user experience. It's very important. So to sum up everything, the main goal here is you architecture your application for the user experience. They can be in the United States. They can be Indonesia, China, doesn't matter. The important thing is their user experience. That's your responsibility. Have a real local model. You know, just don't keep things in hash maps. Put them onto disk, SQLite, use Realm, whatever you prefer. We don't care, but put it on disk. And when you write your application, don't think, like, OK, now I get this data from the server, and I update this UI, and user click on this, I make this other request. Don't do that. Think about, I have the data on the disk. That's what I show to the user. My user reacts. I have some logic to update the data on the disk, and I show it all the time. And you have some other application logic that tries to synchronize the data with the server. It makes it a lot easier. And decouple. Like, this is, like, you know, you should decouple these things, the part that's related to the UI and the disk. They know each other. You have an application logic that talks to the network. When you decouple things, it makes it a lot easier to test. But don't overdo it. Like, when I see, like, there's more popular architectures you know, and stuff, and, like, people, hey, I create an interface, and the interface for the factories, and the interface of the factory factories. It's like, don't do that. This is still a phone. Like, we, if you look at the framework code, we still write it as we write, Java, as you write C. You don't have to write it like that. You know, use enums, whatever, do it. Use it if it makes your application better. But like, don't over-architect. It's still a mobile phone. We are trying to run many, 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 many applications on the same device. And even if the device has you know, four cores, eight, eight cores, most of the time, only one or two of those cores are actually really like, capable of doing anything. Plus, we try to keep them low mode or not run them at all to say better. And act early, like, this is important. In a previous job I worked, I paid this debt. If you have this kind of technical debt, it's really, really hard to pay. So the sooner you start, the better it is. And one last note, something to remember from this talk, know your enemies. Network is unreliable. You don't want to be doing a network request. Every time you make a network request, you should feel like uncomfortable. Oh, like, what's going on? And then. Know your friends. Like, disk is your friend. Persist everything. It's very reliable. If the disk is broken, the phone is already broken, so you don't need to worry about it. <laughs> so, is your friend is actually your best friend. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I have like two and a half minutes for a question. Maybe I can take one or two questions. to try. Huh, well, that's weird. The, the constant definitely changed, but what happened to my animation? Well, it turns out to get this constant to animate nicely, I need to call layout if needed on my view controller's view within this animation block. We'll give it one more try, and oh, that's much better. I now have a constraint that I can change within an animation block, and everything animates smoothly to its final position, except in cases where I want to adjust something besides my constraint's constant. Let's take a look at another example. Here, I want to adjust this center square to expand or shrink to be either twice or half the width of its neighbors. Now, I could do that in theory by adjusting the multiplier on the center view's width constraint. But it turns out that changing that multiplier in code doesn't work. See, constraint multipliers are a get-only property, and Xcode will give me an error. So how do I change it? Well, the answer is I don't. Instead, I, can cre I create two completely different constraints and enable or disable either one as necessary. As long as I'm still calling layout if needed in my animation block, this kind of change will still animate. Now, there are two ways I can accomplish this constraint swapping. One way is to create both constraints in Interface Builder, like so. Now, Xcode will complain that these are incompatible, and it's right. So first step, we'll uninstall one of them by checking this box here. Next, we'll control drag both of these constraints into our code to make them IV outlets. And then I can enable or disable these as necessary in my animation block, like this. Once again, you'll notice I make sure we're calling layout if needed in our animation block, and we end up with a nice, smooth looking animation. Look at that. The other way to accomplish this would be to create a completely new constraint in code. This is useful when I don't know in advance what I'm going to want this multiplier to be, and I need to create it dynamically. So let's see that in action. This time, in my animation block, I'll first remove the old constraint. Next up, I can create a new multiplier. Let's make it slightly random, just for fun. 
Ooh, hey, that is fun. Okay, next I'll create a brand new constraint with this new multiplier and assign it to my center view width property. And then I can add it back in again to my view. Finally, I call layout if needed on the super view in the animation block. And I once again have some nicely animating views that use this new constraint that I've created. And because this is all done using constraints, you'll notice this works as intended on an iPhone, an iPhone in landscape mode, or even, say, a slide overview on an iPad. And once you understand that this trick simply involves removing an old constraint and adding a new one, you might discover a whole new world of animation is available to you simply by turning on and off various constraints. For example, on this screen, I can change all my views to be either left aligned or right aligned simply by adding and removing two different groups of constraints and then calling our now familiar layout if needed method. Pretty neat, huh? Oh, by the way, one fun little quirk about all this, if you add your new constraints before you remove the old ones, iOS will complain about all the incompatible constraints it has to deal with in those like few milliseconds. So always make sure you remove the old ones first before adding the new ones. So thanks to Jacob for the quick tip. Jacob, you're going to get a very stylish Google t-shirt in the mail. But hang on, we're not done yet. You see, now that you know all about constraint animation, I have a couple more quick tips from one of Google's engineers about more efficient ways to implement it. So follow me on to the next video, because we're not done learning just yet. Click here. Click here. And uh, otherwise, I'll see you on Route 85. Bye. People love to use different mobile devices in different ways that suit their situation and lifestyle. Michael uses a phone to play games on the go, while Tony enjoys using a large tablet as he relaxes on the sofa. And Jen carries a small tablet in her purse for reading on the bus. But they all want to use your app on the devices they prefer. So you'll want to make sure they each have a great experience, regardless of screen size, OS version, and the features of the app they use the most. It can be taxing to test each one of these situations so that all your users can be happy. We know you'd rather not have to buy and store stacks of devices and test your app in all these circumstances. That's why we built Firebase Test Lab for Android to make it easy and affordable for you to test your app with a variety of devices and be sure it works great for all your users. Our device lab, hosted in the cloud, offers a variety of physical devices ready to test your app. The selection of devices is always growing, so your tests will stay current with the latest hardware and operating systems. The easiest way to use Firebase Test Lab is to run a robo-test. This is an intelligent, automated test that crawls your app to discover and exercise its features. You won't need to write any additional code to make use of a robo-test. For more advanced testing, you can also script the interactions with your app to simulate specific use cases and verify that everything works as expected. Test results include a detailed report for each device used, including screenshots, device logs, and any crashes that may have occurred during the test. This allows you to verify that your app is working correctly on the variety of devices and configurations you selected. It's easy to make Firebase Test Lab a part of your daily development routine. And we have multiple ways to help you test regularly and spot errors early. First, you can use the Firebase console to upload and test your app. There is also a command line interface for testing with continuous integration servers, so you can automatically test every build. During Android development, you can deploy your app directly to Firebase Test Lab using Android Studio 2.0. And finally, in the Play Store Developer Console, there is a special automated launch test that will run for Android apps published to an alpha or beta channel. To get started using Firebase Test Lab and learn how to regularly test your app on different devices and configurations, you can start with the documentation available right here. Happy testing! The Firebase Notifications Console lets you re-engage your users quickly and easily. With it, you can manage and send notifications to your users easily with no additional coding required. Messages can be addressed to single devices, Firebase cloud messaging topics, or devices that you select using powerful analytics tools. So, for example, you can send a message to all of your users who have made an in-app purchase, giving them a special offer, allowing you to re-engage with them. The Firebase Notifications Console integrates with analytics so you can measure the effectiveness of your messages and explore insights based on your users' activities so you can grow your application 
by easily engaging your users through the Firebase Notifications Console. One of the driving principles of the mobile marketplace is that users want new, new apps, new updates, new content. In fact, over 60% of the users who go on to digital marketplaces do so because they want to try something new. While this is fantastic for user acquisition, this presents a problem for user retention, because if you are not keeping the user's attention, they will quickly be looking for something that will. In this episode, we will learn how to create a good retention strategy. Ready? Let's get started. The key to effective user retention can be broken down into three things. One, understand users' behavior in your app. Two, identify roadblocks to retention. Three, use tactics and tools to re-engage users. Now, of course, all of this starts with understanding your users. If you don't understand what they want, how they act, or their opinions, you can't really craft a strategy on how to keep them happy. The good news is that Google Analytics has a set of tools to give you insight here. First, check out your cohort analysis report. Why? Because cohort analysis is a powerful report that allows you to measure and compare users based on their specific customer journey. For example, what pages they visit, what they do, how they behave in each stage, etc. So you could measure the impact of your marketing campaigns on specific days see how effective they are in generating loyal users, and compare which campaign performed best. Another good report is active users. Find out how your users interact with your app over time, so you can better understand why they may be staying in or leaving it. It displays your one-day active users up to 30 days active users next to each other. This helps you answer some important questions regarding your user's retention. For example, if your 30 days active numbers is much higher than the one day active number, most users are not coming to your app more than once during a 30 days period. This can indicate that you need to add fresh content on a more regular basis. And maybe you need to re-engage users through marketing campaigns and notifications. The third report is about recency. This report shows how much time passed between app session. You might discover users who only open your app once a week. Once you identify users that engage with your app infrequently, you need to figure out how to re-engage that audience. You could send push notification to those users after three days to remind them about the app. You could even tailor the message to include incentives. A gaming app, for example, might want to send a push notification with an offer of a free in-app tool to users who haven't opened the app in a while. Now that you have an understanding of your users, you could start to think about what their experience is like and get visibility into what roadblocks they are encountering in your app. Here are three basic ways that will help you get this information. Screen tracking will help you learn where users spend their time. For example, if each level of a game used a different screen, you could track what percentage of people path through each level. If there's a level that has a massive user's drop-off, that may indicate that there is a technical issue associated with that level, or it is just too hard. Monitor your behavioral flow report. It takes your screen tracking, event tracking, and combines it in a visual user flow. Lastly, use the crash and exceptions report to identify possible roadblocks. You could break data out by app version, operating system, and device brand, so you could evaluate your app's technical performance in different environments. Want to take it one step further? Find out how much crashes are costing you. You could do this by creating two segments, one for sessions with crashes and the other without. Then compare the conversion rates and the average order value to see if these metrics are lower in the sessions with crash. Now that you've got all the basics down, the final step is building an effective re-engagement pattern for your users. This varies between apps, but the tools we covered today will help you think in the right direction. Do me a favor, stop spending money on apps installs if you don't have a retention strategy. It's like the dude that sells tomato at a loss and telling his friends that he's going to compensate on it by volume. <laughs> Game monetization today is more challenging and sophisticated than it used to be. A good monetization strategy depends on your retention strategy. You need to understand your user's behavior, 
identify roadblocks, and use tactics and tools to re-engage with your users. On the next episode, we will learn how to use in-app purchase househead as part of our strategy to increase revenue. Until next time, eat your vegetables and listen to your partners. So now Firebase is a part of Google, but I hear that you were part of Firebase for a long time. I've been Firebase for almost two years now, and okay. I was a big user back in the early days. And when I first discovered it, you know, I was building a lot of apps, and so having something that just made making apps so easy, I was kind of like, my God, they've done it! Like wow. they've built the holy grail of development. And then one day they posted up a developer advocate job, and so okay. sent my resume in on a Sunday. They called me on Monday, took a coding test on Tuesday, flew out on Wednesday, brought my whole family to my wife and my 16-month-old son. Wow. Got the job that day. So the only thing faster than the database is the hiring committee. <laughs> yeah, and it was a pretty fast process just wow. letting everyone know. I was like, oh, by the way, I'm moving to San Francisco. <laughs> See ya. Yeah, pretty much. Wow, and so now you're a developer advocate at Google and Firebase is a part of Google. How is that? That's been great. Like, you know, it's been about 15 months ago that we were acquired, and uh, it's been a really awesome experience because Google's just sort of thrown a lot of uh, resources into us. We've expanded the team so much, and we've been able to focus on the core product and, you know, making Firebase better. We have, are uh, in the middle of releasing a Unity plugin that's out there for beta for Unity people to test plugin. out. Yeah, yeah, no, there's some pretty cool samples. So lots of cool stuff there, David, but I mean, how does a developer get started with that? So the best place to get started is just like right on the Firebase website. Website. So firebase.com, okay. and then you can like sign up, but also firebase.com slash docs. Our docs are one of the things that like we really pride ourselves on. So uh, by just you know reading our quick start guides, you can already get a gist of how to get started. Okay. And then uh, and each platform integrates totally with uh, you know whatever dependency manager it has. So with Android, it's you know great with Gradle. With iOS, you can use CocoaPods and cool. you know web. You know, how Web's works. web, right? Yeah. Now, one of the things I remember about Firebase is that you guys used to do these like epic hackathons where you gave out like really cool swag. Right? Yeah. So is that, is that something you're still doing? Well, we used to make a joke that like Firebase was actually a swag company, and we just were kind of put on a front that we did. You <laughs> so know, it's a swag company data. that makes software. Yeah, that was, that was pretty much what <laughs> it's we a good used to say. Plan. So yeah, we uh, we used to make, or we still do actually, we make tons of like like pieces of swag. We did Firebase hot sauce was pretty awesome. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we did hot sauce. We did uh, my favorite is headbands. So like you have okay. these sweatbands. And okay. so I was at a hackathon once, and I saw this guy who was like, hey, can I have a couple? And by a couple, he meant like 16. And then he like started putting them on and kind of like mummified himself <laughs> and then just sat down and started hacking. And I was like, wow. Did he? I don't think so. <laughs> In all seriousness, though, that's um, I'm a developer. Middleware is really hard. You know, if I want to have some kind of a database, if I want to have some kind of synchronization of data, it's a case for I can just go out and use Firebase today, right? Yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's what we're doing. Like, uh, we always say our mission is to help people build like extraordinary applications. And so, like, there's so many pieces of building something, and the back end is just so easy to like get wrong or so easy. You can just spend so much time. Like, I remember one time I was building an Angular app, and I was like so excited. It was like, I'm gonna write directives, and I'm gonna build this cool web app. And then I spent like an entire month just building out the back end for it. And then I realized I was like, I haven't written a line of JavaScript yet. And so uh, with like, in Firebase, you don't have that problem. You can just immediately start doing like what the user is interested in because you're just only going to see the client side stuff. Like right. I always say, you're never going to get an email from a, you know an app reviewer or someone saying like, "Hey, man, your app is so good. I can tell you use so many databases. It's really <laughs> awesome." Like they're they're just going to tell I'm you. I'm going to review your app yeah. for that now. <laughs> yeah, if you ever get that review, let me know. I would love to see it. But uh, yeah, I mean, most people are going to say like.
There's a lot of parallel paths that you can go down. Oh, we did that in one hour. <laughs> okay. Here's a funny thing. Well, they were like going like this, so I was like, All right. Hello, everybody, and good morning. Uh, thank you guys for, for getting up and joining me here today. I know it was a, a late night for me. Um, my name is Eitan, and I lead the developer engineering team on Project Tango. And today, I want to walk you through some of the capabilities of the device. Uh, but more specifically, I want to focus on how you might build an augmented reality experience with Project Tango. So I know uh, we've been relatively popular here at I.O. How many of you have seen a Project Tango demo while you've been here? Yeah, did you like it? Yeah? All right. Um, great. So that's a lot of you, uh, but not all of you. Just a quick shout out. Uh, we will have the sandbox going uh, throughout the day today. So after this talk, if you want to go by and check it out, you should definitely get your, your hands on Tango for yourselves, do a demo. Um, all right, so for those of you who haven't heard of the platform, I'm going to do a brief overview. Uh, I'll keep it relatively brief. I really do want to spend most of my time talking about how we actually build applications for the platform, as well as the APIs that we provide for augmented reality content. Clicker. Awesome. Right. So our brief overview. Project Tango fundamentally is about extending the capabilities of our mobile devices beyond the screen. If you look at your phone today, you interact with it mostly with your head down, you know, touching different buttons, maybe swiping through photos. Really, the only way that your phone interacts with the world is, is through pictures and videos. And Tango seeks to enable your phone to do much more to gain an understanding of the physical space of your environment, to be able to track the position of your device as you move through space, and also to be able to sense the geometry of your environment as well. When you have these capabilities, it allows us to turn your device into a magic window into the world. We can play games like Jenga from Shell Games, where you place a virtual Jenga tower uh, on a table in front of you, and you don't have to clean up. Uh, we can do things like measure your sofa. You can measure the height from the ceiling to the floor without you know, playing the game where you see if your tape measure falls over. Um, and we can also, towards the future, navigate from point A to B in space. So imagine going into a mall and wanting to know even where your friend is in the mall and being directed in an augmented reality view to them. So that's kind of what we're working on. And to enable these kinds of applications, we provide a couple of core technologies to developers. And you've probably heard of these if you've been to some of our other talks. But they are motion tracking, depth perception, and area learning. And I'll go through each of them briefly over the next couple of slides. So motion tracking is really the core technology upon which Tango is built. And motion tracking allows Tango devices to understand their relative position and orientation to where they started. So if I just use my device as a prop, as I move with my Tango device in the world, it knows that I've walked, say, you know, a meter forward and turned 90 degrees to the left. And this is the motion tracking capability of the device. It's using visual features in the environments, combining that with inertial sensors to estimate position. The second piece of technology that we expose through our APIs is depth perception. And depth perception allows our Tango devices to see in 3D. So on our tablet here, we've got a special depth camera. And it projects infrared light out into the world. And it has a camera that can see that infrared light. And by seeing the pattern, it can judge, OK, my device is you know, a meter 
to this surface. And so I can start combining motion tracking with depth perception to do things like real-time meshing of environments. And it's very powerful. Now you have an understanding of where a table is, where a chair is, um, and where objects are in the world. And your applications can start to take advantage of it. And the third capability of Tango devices is area learning. And Wim gave a talk, uh, I believe, two days ago on area learning. But it's the memory of the device. It's the ability of Tango devices to remember where they've been before and to recognize spaces. So if you think about coming into this room and maybe you see you know, the exit sign at the back, if the device saw the same thing, it remembers roughly how the exit sign looks. It remembers how the scaffolding here looks around it. And so when you walk back into that space a different time, or if you have multiple devices, uh, they recognize where they are relative to that landmark in the world. And with that, you can enable multiplayer experiences because you have a shared reference frame for Tango devices. And you can also enable, towards the future, things like this indoor navigation use case going from point A to B because the device knows what space it's in. OK. So at this point, we have actually gone through everything that I normally get to talk about. I have never gotten to go deeper on Tango technology than this. And here, we're through it in like seven-ish minutes. Uh, so I feel pretty good. And I'm really excited about this next part. We're going to go deep on how you build for AR, the considerations that you take into account, uh, the different pieces of Tango technology that enable you on a journey to better and better AR. And also, we're going to talk about some of the limitations of augmented reality as well, and how you can be creative in building applications that work around it. Um, and so for something of this magnitude, I was thinking to myself, you know, OK, what are we going to build? You know, what am I going to show here? And I was browsing the internet and looking around and you know, thought, what really represents the internet? What really brings it to life in front of us? What could we do that just represents the magnitude and scale of the occasion? And so we are going to build a cat game in augmented reality in front of you. Um, the most majestic of creatures. And uh, specifically, we're going to take virtual cats and we're going to put them into our physical world. <clears throat> All right. Uh, also, in preparing for this talk, I was procrastinating a little bit. Uh, this Wikipedia page is way better than you think if you want to check it out. <laughs> I know, it's surprising, right? All right. So back to our cats. Let's say our idea is to bring as many cats as possible from virtual space into our physical environments. We've got 3D models of all of these cats, um, and we want to bring them to life in 3D. So where do you even start? You know, this picture is, is kind of the ideal of what we'd be going for, uh, but it's, it's really hard to achieve. So we're going to take some steps along the way, and we're not going to get all the way there. But starting is hard. So first, I'm going to take a step back a little bit. How many of you have experience with linear algebra, 3D geometry, coordinate frame transforms? All right, that you know, for an audience, that's that's pretty good. Um, all right, but I'm going to do a little bit of a refresher, uh, and also just as um, comfort for everyone else. I'm not going to go too deep into that. We're going to keep it like fairly high level. Um, but mostly, I'm going to talk about the coordinate frames that Tango defines as they relate to each other uh, and as they relate to the device as you move it through space. All right, we're back to our cats. So the goal, again, is to take a virtual cat and to put it in our physical world. So here, we've got a living room. We've got our virtual cat. And we want to place it on the ottoman. And the cat should stay fixed in the environment as we move around it. And ideally, it would even interact with the environment a little bit. So maybe the cat jumps down from the ottoman to the floor, or it jumps up on the table. Just a little bit of playfulness. Uh, so easy enough. All right, we've got a couple of things going on here that we need to cover first. We've got the camera feed. So the camera 
is the 2D projection of the 3D world onto an image plane is seen through the lens, and it comes in at 30 frames a second on Tango devices. So as I move my camera around the world, I might get a different view of the sofa, of the fireplace, of the TV and the table. And that 3D view is compressed onto this, this 2D image plane. And it's in color. And in the real world, when you're walking around, you, you don't have to worry about much beyond this, right? Physics takes care of it. Physics is awesome. Uh, and the light comes in, and you just get different perspectives based on how you walk around. But now we're talking about compositing a, a virtual character into this physical scene. And it gets a little bit more complicated. The cat doesn't actually exist in the real world. So to understand how we render this cat as if it's in the real world, let's forget about the real world entirely for just a moment and explore this problem. So say instead of in the real world, we've got a virtual cat, and we want to render it on the screen of our device. We want to place it approximately two meters in front of the device and hold it fixed and just move around it. Uh, for those who are familiar with building 3D games, this is very, very similar to how a camera system in a standard rendering engine works. Um, we're going to place our object in a coordinate frame called the world frame of the game. And then we're going to render it relative to the frame of our camera as it moves around it. And at the start, we'll view the cat from the left. And at the end of our motion around the cat, we'd like to see it from the right. And it always stays fixed. So with Tango, this is exactly what we'll do. It's just that instead of programmatically setting the transform of the camera as it moves in the world, we're going to get it from the Tango device itself. Tango has a couple of coordinate frames I'll talk about that are relevant for this. So the world frame for Tango is represented as start of service, and it's wherever you started with the device. And the device frame is wherever you currently are with the device. So if I start here, that defines start of service. And if I ask for the transform between start of service and device, when device is here, it'll give me sort of two meters. OK. So now to show this a little bit, I'm going to give a demo of what this looks like in action. OK. So here, I've got a completely virtual world. And I've got this cat. We'll call him Mittens, I guess. And as I move around Mittens, he stays fixed in the virtual world. But he's not tied to my physical space in any way. I can make him walk, but it's just on a plane that exists in space. And he can also, uh, I guess, paw on the camera when I get close to him. All right. <laughs> Yeah, it, it gets better, I promise. <laughs> All right, uh, we'll go back. So to make this a little more concrete, I want to just show the calls that you need to make uh, in our APIs to be able to do this. So Tango provides a function called get pose at time, and you can pass it the uh, base coordinate frame that you would like, as well as the target coordinate frame that you would like. Uh, and it will return you the transform at that point in time. So here, you can see I'm defining a frame pair where I want to ask, where is the device relative to the start of service? So my base frame is start of service, and my target frame is device. And I say, get me the transform at time t, where maybe time is now. Um, and that timestamp actually turns out to be really important when you're trying to do things like composites onto an image, because the camera takes an image at a very particular point in time. And so that's something that we'll be coming back to to make sure that the cat is well registered with the environment when we go to composite it. But overall, this is pretty simple, right? You can just at any time ask for where the device is in the world. And boom, you know, you've got a handheld AR cat viewer. 
All right, so it's not exactly what we're looking for, though. The goal, again, is to place the virtual cat on the ottoman in the physical world. Um, and the first thing you might think of doing is just taking the RGB image, and we're just going to like slap the cat onto the RGB image, and it's going to be fine. We'll just use that as the background. Um, but it's not going to look quite right. Uh, this slide demonstrates it, but I'll go to a demo again just to make it a little more clear. All right, so now we've got Mittens, but he's not looking super awesome. He's just floating in space in front of me. And, you know, here, I really would rather he be on the ground. So that's what we're going to work to do. Um, but if you were to build an application like, say, a, a sun, you know, with planets orbiting around it, this could be an appropriate visualization. But for Mittens, it's really just, it's all wrong. So we'll go back to our slides. And we'll see that it is really, really wrong. <laughs> all right. I really, I hadn't looked at that image in a while, so uh, I like it. All right, so what can we do to fix this? Well, there are a couple of things that we can try. Before we go down this road, though, it's worth mentioning again that perfect augmented reality is largely an unsolved problem. So we're going to talk about some things to make the cat look better, but it's not going to be perfect. I've learned to manage expectations, so you'll see me do this throughout the talk. Um, but we're going to get better. And we'll talk about the limitations in detail at the end. Next slide. OK, so with that public service announcement out of the way, how far down the road can we go with Tango? Step one is that we can tie the cat into the environment using Tango's depth sensing APIs. So I mentioned before that the device doesn't just understand its position in space. It also understands the geometry of the environment. So maybe we can use the Tango device to actually decide where to place the cat, to recognize surfaces in the environment, and then we can tie it to the floor at the correct size and scale. And Tango provides exactly these capabilities through our support libraries to developers. You can essentially ask for a given pixel in an image, give me the point and normal in the world frame of uh, that pixel and then we can place the cat there. And to show this, uh, you can see that this is the code needed to compute that point and normal in space. So the first thing that we do is we need to get the relative pose of the depth to the RGB image. And this is a little bit subtle. So as you're walking around, we're taking RGB images all the time, but we're also firing the depth camera. But they're not actually taken at the exact same time. There's a little bit of an offset there. So if I naively took the point cloud at the timestamp of the RGB camera and just selected a point, it would be off a little bit. It wouldn't look correct. And what I need to do is actually transform the depth information into the frame of the RGB camera. So here, what you can see is we're calling a support function that says calculate the relative pose between the color camera and the depth camera at the last time I had a color image and the last time I had a point cloud. And then from there, we call fit plane model near click, and we pass in the point cloud, we pass in the color image, and we pass in the relative transform between the two, which helps us do that alignment. And then we get back a point and a plane model uh, for that pixel in the image. And after this call, we've got a point and a normal that we can use to place the cat on the correct uh, surface in the environment. And we can put it in the real world. So I'm going to show a demo of that now. Can we? Oh, awesome. So here you'll see that Mittens is, uh, is actually looking pretty good. Um, he can move around the world. And every time I tap, 
I'm getting that detection. Uh, and you can see that I can make mittens sort of interact with the surfaces and the geometry of the environment. <laughs> OK, we'll still get cooler. I like the, the enthusiasm, though. It's sort of building over time. Um, so I can have Mittens jump on this as well. And he can jump down. Um, and if we like, we can also change Mittens to Rufus. Um, yeah. All right, so let's go back to the slides. OK, so we're getting better. Um, but you'll notice that I, I didn't have the cat go behind anything. And the reason I didn't do that is because we don't have support in, in that demo for occlusion. What that means is if I had placed mittens behind the podium and looked at it from kind of the incorrect angle, I would have seen through the podium, and mittens wouldn't have uh, rendered realistically. And so what can we do along the way to maybe do more about understanding our scene and our geometry and our environment to make mittens look even better and even more realistic? Well, Tango can create rough 3D reconstructions of the world environment. Um, and it provides developers with these meshes in real time, which is really, it's, it's kind of crazy when you think about it. And perhaps we can use these meshes to help a little bit with our occlusion problem. So now, instead of using a single point to determine how to render the cat and you know, to have mittens jump from the table to the chair to the floor, we can use like, the full 3D structure of the environment and aggregate many points over time. So under the hood, when Tango is meshing, it's actually taking many, many different viewpoints, doing sort of that same transform I talked about to get the point cloud uh, into the world frame and binning them over time and creating a representation of this surface that gets better, actually, the more that you look at a surface, because you get more uh, points of data and a better accurate of the surface. And <clears throat> this process is pretty complex, uh, but it is, again, abstracted for us by the SDK. And we've got a meshing library that you can use in C++, or we've hooked it up directly to Unity for Unity developers. Uh, that gives you the mesh inside the game engine in real time. And that makes it really easy to use it in our depth buffer as we render. So to see this, we're going to check out another demo. All right, so we'll put Mins over here for now. So you can see that as I move around the podium, I'm starting to build up uh, a rough mesh of it. Um, that's probably good enough for now. And we'll put mittens uh, sort of in the background. And as I move, you can see he becomes occluded. And we think that this is a really powerful thing for building AR applications. Um, we can sort of bring him out. Yeah. So one thing that you'll notice is that the mesh isn't perfect. And so we'll play some tricks. Like we actually alpha blend on the edge of mittens as he goes behind. And here we've even shown you his silhouette uh, when he's behind the podium to give you a sense that he's still there. I'm going to show another version right now that does a similar thing. Uh, but it's not going to show the silhouettes. So mittens will be fully occluded, and you'll, you'll get to see how that looks as well. Should have saved my mesh, but OK. So probably good enough. All right, so now we'll put mittens behind again. And you can see as I go, you know, he kind of pops out over time. And there's, there's alpha blending on the edges that we're using to sort of make him fade in and out. So it's not perfect, but it does give you know, the illusion of a more real experience. All right, let's go back to the slides. So 
So at this point, we've actually created a pretty compelling augmented reality application, I would say. Um, we've taken mittens, we've placed them in the world, he can walk on surfaces, he can jump on chairs, and now he can actually be occluded by objects in the scene. So you've got a lot of the components of making a compelling augmented reality experience right there in front of you. Um, but it can be a lot better. And one thing I'll say, have you guys noticed anything weird about this picture up here? Something look fake to you, maybe. Yeah? People are nodding. Audience participation. No, the Lamborghini's fake. It's fake. Uh, so the front one is actually not a real car. And the reason that this looks so good is that we're doing a lot uh, in terms of lighting and reflection. Um, we've placed it exactly where we want. We've done very detailed compositing of it. Uh, and this is kind of like the holy grail, right? This is the holy grail of AR. And um, this slide is really just to say that this is a journey, and we're moving along this path, moving towards things that we hope someday can look like this. Uh, but this is not, I guess, the expectation to have today uh, for where we are. And as an application developer, it's important to remember that. So if you're building something, you want to ask yourself, is it appropriate for the technology that I have at hand? And everything from the art assets that you use to the gameplay that you design can help to set expectations for your users. And you can still make really compelling experiences that use maybe a subset of the technology as well. So you could put a solar system in space. Uh, you could have your cat walk on planes but not be occluded. Uh, or you could have you know, objects and games that take advantage of the scene geometry. But all of them are compelling in their own right. And with a little bit of creativity, you can actually make experiences that feel really good to people, even if you're not leveraging the full capabilities of AR, and even if you don't get to the holy grail of Lamborghini rendering. And to illustrate this, I guess I'll provide two examples of augmented reality applications that I really like that don't even use depth. All right, so the first one I've been alluding to for a while, this was done by some of our friends at San Francisco State University, and it allows you to explore the solar system by placing planets in a line in your room. And I'll show a demo of that now. All right, so here I'm going to tap to place the sun. And now I'm going to walk. And I guess it recommends I go further than this, but this is about as far as I get. And I'll tap to place Neptune. So now as I walk back towards the sun, I can see the scale of the planets relative to each other. And it's actually correct. And I can zoom in to each one of the planets. And if I want, I can start to see how orbits work. And as an educational tool, this is spectacular. And from an augmented reality perspective, it's actually remarkably simple. I mean, this is the floating cat that we all laughed at before. But for the appropriate application, it's actually quite compelling. All right, we'll go back to the slides for a second. The second application I want to talk about is a game from our friends at Trixie Studios. And it's called Fantageist. And how many of you actually went to our After Hours event and got to play Fantageist? Oh, that is way too few of you. Um, all right, so Fantageist is a game and the premise is that aliens have invaded your world and you need to zap them before they take over the, the world. And it's not good for us at the end. Um, but anyway, 
there are a bunch of design considerations that went into this game that I really like. So the characters are actually semi-transparent. They feel like they're coming out of the wall. Um, and they're very clever about using the position of the device and making assumptions about free space to interact with the world even though they don't know where surfaces are. And I'll show a, a brief demo of this, actually. So I'm going to go to bonus contents, um, and we'll do a giant worm thing. All right. So you can tell they're already setting the mood with the music that they have for this. Um, and what happens is, as I start, the device records my position in space. Can we turn down the, uh, the lights? Awesome. So we'll get a brief text message that says something like, the aliens will get you or clear the area. And um, so as I move, uh, you'll see kind of something strange happens. So here we've ripped a hole in the actual floor, and we can see into, whoa. We're safe. So if we switch back to the slides real quick. Yeah. I think, I think it's pretty, pretty cool. All right, so everything that you saw there used only motion tracking. There was no depth. You know, there was no occlusion. And it's kind of shocking. I'm actually impressed with how well they pulled it off. But they're playing tricks. You know, they're making some assumptions and building gameplay that just works for the environment. And so really, this is to say that you know, there are ways in gameplay to make things feel real and immersive, even with our most basic APIs. And as you start to move down the road, it gets just better. And with all that said, I've said a lot of, you know, managing expectations type stuff, but we're continuing to improve. We're always working on new things. And in fact, uh, we're rolling out some drift correction code into our SDKs over the next couple of months. So Wim talked about this before, but another problem that you have with augmented reality is that when I place um, the cat in the world, actually, let's switch back to the demo just real quick. I think it's easy to show. So you can see that the cat is on a surface. It's relatively robust to when I you know, move the device around uh, because our tracking is relatively good. But if I'm really mean, OK, the cat is gone, right? It drifted off into space. So we can go back to the slides. So we've actually built software that allows us to correct for that. And so when the cat goes drifting off into space, we recover very, very quickly. It takes about a second. But you stop, you know, look at the world, and the cat shows up back in the correct place. And this is really just one of the improvements that we're working to roll out and that we're working to bring to you, our developer community. We're working on things like modeling the lighting in the room to give you realistic shadows uh, things like improving our meshing and doing texturing as well to give realistic um, textured meshes inside of Unity that maybe you could use in other games and even import them into different game worlds. We're just kind of taking steps along this journey to getting to that Lamborghini, to getting to really, really good and immersive and solid augmented reality. Uh, but we don't have to wait. We can already do a lot right now and build compelling experiences today. I also want to talk a little bit 
about the trade-offs that you make as you start to use more and more of this technology. So heat is your enemy on a mobile device. If any of you have used a mobile phone before, you know it gets hot. It's you know, hot in your pocket. You're using Google Maps, and it's just like burning up. Um, and it, it is a very real trade-off. So we've worked hard to optimize our algorithms, to optimize our computer vision software, and to make it run as quickly and efficiently as possible. But the more capabilities you use, the more heat and CPU and compute you use as well. So if you can make an experience work with motion tracking, then you have a lot more that you can throw at your game. But if you go all the way to full meshing, maybe you should be using some low poly models. And it's just important to be aware of the trade-offs that you make when you think about the applications that you could build. If I could sum up my talk with like one cheesy statement, I would do it with creativity is king. When you're developing for a new platform, you know, there are limitations. And we're super fortunate to have partnered with people who can be creative and who have worked around you know, the different capabilities and technologies of the device, as well as their limitations. Uh, and we're really looking forward to seeing what kind of creative applications can be enabled by what is super powerful technology over the coming months. Uh, there's a bunch that you should check out uh, at our sandbox to get a picture of what developers are up to. If you haven't done that, I really encourage it. And there are a couple of things that we've done that are really exciting at the platform level, too, looking forward. So first, we believe that Project Tango technology should become ubiquitous. All devices should have the ability to understand where they are in space and to understand the geometry of their environments. And one thing that we've done is we've worked closely with our friends at the Android team to start moving some of Tango's APIs into core Android. And so in Android N, you can actually ask for the six degree of freedom pose of the device through Android APIs. And Android N also supports depth sensors. And over time, we hope to expose more of Tango's capabilities in this way. And we're at the beginning of a very, very exciting journey on the consumer front. So we have announced a partnership with Lenovo where we will be shipping Project Tango smartphones later this summer. And this is huge. This is a big deal. This has been a three-year journey for us to take this technology from the prototype stage all the way to something that you can actually hold in your hands. And a lot of the applications we're showing here start to show the power of these devices for consumers. So now is really the time to get on board. Like the train is sort of like leaving the proverbial station. And I'm really excited to see what we can build together. It's a great time to get your foot in the door. If you haven't been thinking about augmented reality applications, I encourage you to do so. Um, and it's also a unique opportunity to partner with Google. So we're always looking for interesting ideas. Uh, we like to feature our partners at things like talks. And on occasion, we even put out like RFPs uh, for unique augmented reality content. And this all happens because it's a new and budding ecosystem. It's just an exciting time to sort of take the first step in this journey together. All right. And with that, I'm ending my talk. Hopefully, this gave you an idea of the kind of applications that are possible with Project Tango, as well as some of the considerations that you need to be aware of when you're building augmented reality content. I think it's a really exciting time. I'm really happy to be here, feel fortunate to be on the team. Thank you guys so much uh, for your time this morning. And yeah, hope you enjoy the rest of IO. So thank you very much. Assumption that somebody's going to come back again, right? Well, well, it's, I mean, it's your goal, I would say. It's your goal, but you don't know that somebody's going to. It's like paying a big, fat, hefty tax on the assumption you're going to get a repeat view. That's and you true. Might not. That is you true. might not. Yep. And, 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 and stuff falls out the cache all the time. Yeah, exactly. So Not the service worker cache, though. Oh, you and service worker. Here we go again. Service worker. Da, da, da. One trick pony, Jake Archibald. <laughs> uh, come on, but it's got a cache. You can rely on it. All right. Yeah. 
okay, performance that notwithstanding, I think for me, um, it's about code ownership somehow. It's about a tr level of trust that I don't necessarily feel. And what I want to do is I want to be able to feel like my application code is the thing that's running, that I'm not running through something else that I don't necessarily understand. But running through something else is fine because that's what a library is, right? That you've got, no. you're, 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 you've got hold of both ends and you're running through bits okay. of library that you don't understand. Yeah. But that's fine because if one of them starts misbehaving, rip it out, <laughs> either code it yourself or find a, a replacement yes. library. But when, you, when you're going through something else, well, you're kind of in get... something else, I think, yeah, with okay. a framework. You're, 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 and, and the framework will vend you little bits of... It'll give you scraps, and then <laughs> please, you, you sir, do can something... Please, can I have some more? I'd like to work with this application. <laughs> can you please send this data up more? here? More! <laughs> get out. But then the frameworks... You, you kind of... You're sat in a tiny bubble of, of the overall application mm. with a framework. And I feel like to get the most out of a framework, you need to understand how the framework is built. Mm. Like, and... And these frameworks are huge, so it's they really are. difficult to do I that. actually feel maybe, and maybe this is wrong, but it feels to me like it's a kind of, the decision is an ergonomics one. Like a developer's saying, my ergonomics trumps the user's requirements. I want to feel like, you know, my job is easy, um, and what the user gets is what the user gets. Mm. And I, I, my, my whole approach is very much the other, other way. I'd rather go the extra mile and all my users benefit than my life is a bit easier, and I'll take some of the, the bad performance or the, the tax of using that framework. Um, so I don't think that frameworks are inherently evil and uh, to be avoided, but I think you want to be able to transition to one and say, yeah, now it feels like we're getting to the point where we're gonna reinvent that. Mm -hmm. And I think you can only do that when you've got to a certain point with the build. So for you, it's start lights, start with libraries as when you need them, and then make the jump to frameworks only if you have to. Agreed. So service workers are powerful for offline caching, but they're also really good for giving you um, instant loading performance benefits when it comes to repeat visits. Yep. Right. And you can achieve that using an application shell architecture. Yeah. Now, so that's kind of the idea of kind of separating content from the actual visual UI. So in my head, it's kind of like native apps. You always have the banner. You've got the navigation drawer at the side. You yeah. might have some other bits. That could be common through like 90% of your app. Yeah. You always want it there. So when we talk about the shell, we're talking about the HTML, the CSS, and the JavaScript that's making up the bulk of your UI. Yeah. Stuff exactly. that, you know, if you cache that, you can still just like load up content in the very middle. Yeah. Um, and save yourself having to constantly reload that stuff, right? Yeah. And it's super nice when it comes to like, let's say they're visiting a page they've never been to before. If you know the layout's always going to be the same, you can still load that while you go and get the content in the background. Um, and it just makes sure that your user has like really good perceived performance. Yeah. Um, so the first time your app loads, you might show, you might like, um, you're going to have to render the shell itself. You'll cache that in your service worker. And you might show like a toast just to let them know, hey, this application now works offline. Yep. And that means that when they come back another time, like let's say they're you know, in airplane mode, uh, that shell will load up really, really quickly. Um, and then it might go to the network to fetch the rest of the content. You can then cache that content so that you know, that entire view is then available whenever they try accessing it without a network connection. Yeah, exactly. Spot on. We've got some performance testing we've done with the application shell model. Um, this is using web page tests. So on first visit, we've got um, a relatively fast uh, time to first meaningful paint. And this is super important because I, I think that there can be scenarios where someone might take advantage of service worker to be like, ah, don't worry about your first load, but I'm just going to serve up like megabytes of stuff that yeah. I'm going to cache. Afterwards, you'll be super fast. But that first load, if that takes so long to the point where the service worker doesn't even get registered, that's pointless. And plus, for other browsers that don't support service worker, you're then kind of just damaging yourself. Yeah, that's so, going to make your users go and cry in a corner. Exactly. You don't want that. So you still want to be serving up just that static render of your site, just so then it just loads up as fast as humanly possible, and then progressively enhance with service worker to then use the app shell model. And if you are using the app shell model, as you can see here, we've got um, really good, we've actually slashed our load times um, for first meaningful paints on repeat visits. 
Uh, speaking of like actually taking a look at what impact server-side rendering has on this, uh, you don't have to use Service Worker um, you know, to actually be able to get good gains. If you're building uh, with the AppShell model in mind, with server-side rendering in mind, you will get like a really good first paint, even in like Safari and um, like mobile Safari on iOS. Yeah, all the other browsers that just don't have Service Worker. Yeah. Now, if you're wondering, OK, well, should I be using the application shell model on all of my applications? Um, there are going to be types of apps, like super simple apps. This, this might be overkill. Yeah. But if you're building something that's you know, a little bit more complex, a little bit more dynamic, this type of model makes a ton of sense. Um, at Google, we're using it for things like Inbox. and It's working really well there. Yeah, I think it's one of those things you end up falling into the sit there and figure out whether it makes sense for your site or not. But I think it's a good overall model that works for a lot of different scenarios. There's a whole ton um, behind this model that you know, we, we way too much to explain in just one video. But we wrote up uh, a pretty amazing article on this, if we do say so ourselves. Well, you wrote it up, and I just read it. So you you just added your name to the end of it. Yeah, that's how pretty I wrote Pretty much. <laughs> Impact. Um, that's worth checking out. That's the format of this It's show a mediocre idea. article at best, but it's got pretty graphics. Yes, it does. Um, people should go check that out. Yep. Learn more about AppShell. Um, and then there's also the Getting Started Guide for your first progressive web app, where it actually talks about the application shell model, how you can make, like, take advantage of it, as well as how it applies to the demo app that you can build in this lovely code lab. Yep. And in that article, we also link out to tools that can help you get started with the application model like, really quickly um, that yeah. we're working on. So check that out. Yeah, build a weather app. Firebase makes authentication easy for end users and developers. Most applications need to know the identity of a user so they can provide a customized experience and keep their data secure. Firebase supports lots of different ways for your users to authenticate. If your users want to authenticate with their email address, you can build that for them. Firebase Auth has built-in functionality for third-party providers such as Facebook, Twitter, GitHub, and Google. It can also integrate with your existing account system if you have one. You're given the choice about how to present login to the user. You can build your own interface, or you can take advantage of our open source UI, which is fully customizable and incorporates years of Google's experience in building simple sign-in UX. No matter which one you use, once a user authenticates, three things happen. Information about the user is returned to the device via callbacks. This allows you to personalize your app's user experience for that specific user. The user information contains a unique ID which is guaranteed to be distinct across all providers, never changing for a specific authenticated user. This unique ID is used to identify your user and what parts of your backend system they're authorized to access. Firebase will also manage your user's session so that users will remain logged in after the browser or application restarts. And of course, it works on Android, iOS, and the web. That's Firebase Auth, allowing you to focus on your users and not the sign-in infrastructure to support them. Jordan, and this is The Developer Show on location at Google I.O. 2016. And I'm here with Noah. We're going to talk about Project Tango. I'm still overwhelmed by how cool Project Tango is. Absolutely. Uh, blurring the lines between the real world and the virtual world. Now, there is a Project Tango game that people are playing with here in the sandbox uh, called World. Can you tell us a little bit about it? So this is a game that's being done by a, a new company called Phenomena, but with some very old and experienced uh, game developers, uh, including a designer called Keita Takahashi. Mm -hmm. He worked on a game called Katamari Damacy. And it's it's an a, awesome game. Oh, Played just great it. Yeah. stuff. You know, but a very playful approach. Mm -hmm. And he's brought that to World. It's it's a game where you can actually set up little things in a virtual world that are situated in the real world. So as you move around with the Tango device, you can actually see them from different angles and set them up uh, on the real walls and floors of your room. Now you were telling me a little bit earlier about the first steps you take into the game. What is that like? 
Sure. Well, at the beginning, one of the things that you do, for example, is you're given a little seedling, and you can plant that in the ground, and then perhaps on a nearby wall, you can take a cloud, but the cloud is actually on a spring, so you put it on the wall, and it goes boing, <laughs> boing, boing, and you can click on the cloud, and it starts raining, and suddenly the seed will sprout and turn into a flower. So it's stuff everybody understands intuitively, but then you can play with the stuff, put the flower on top of another flower, have them start rotating, make them bigger or smaller, mm -hmm. the whole thing just sort of opens it up as a, a playground for you to try. Something I've heard you talk about before, which I really love with Project Tango, is the ability to make any space a play space, which seems to be evident in this game. So one of the great things is that you can use the Tango device to actually have it be a sort of a magic window into a virtual world that you create or that's been created by the developer so that as you move it around, it's as if you're seeing right into this other space that isn't even there. That's really cool. It's great stuff. Uh, one more general question for you. What is your favorite thing about being a game designer and developer? Wow, I think the best thing about being a game designer is that you get to make things that you enjoy, that are fun, that please the rest of the world. You know, it's, it's pretty much like other entertainers, just a lot more nerdy than uh, <laughs> being a rock star, for example. Awesome. Thank you so much, Noah. All right. Thank you, Timothy. Hey there, Polycasters, Rob here. Welcome back to the show. Uh, as we've been working on Polymer, one of the probably biggest requests that comes in from developers is, when are we going to get a CDN for Polymer and for web components? Because it's kind of a pain in the butt every time you want to sort of like hack on an idea and you've got to use Bower and install a bunch of packages and wait for everything to download just so you can, you know, play with stuff. So recently, the Polymer team has put out a brand new project, which is called PolyGit. It is a development CDN, which I'll, I'll talk about what that word means uh, in just a second. Uh, but basically, it is a CDN that includes Polymer, all the Polymer elements, and the Web Components polyfill. So if you want to hack around using something like JSBin and Polymer, you can totally do that. So if you go to the website polygit.org, you see that it bills itself as the Polymer Magic Server. And what it's actually doing under the hood is it's just using GitHub's raw Git CDN and extracting things from there and pulling them into you know, JS bin or, or wherever you want to use the CDN. So what I want to do here is just sort of like show you some examples of how you can use the CDN, how you can configure it to actually pull in your own packages as well, and, uh, and basically just get hacking really quick. So, uh, over on jsbin.com, I've already set up this little sample bin. And the main thing to notice here is I'm using this base tag right here. And if you're not familiar with a base tag, uh, in HTML, a base tag or a base element, it just allows you to set a URL. And then any sort of subsequent URLs that you use, like for script tags or imports, they will all be relative to that base. So what we're saying here is we want the base URL to be polygit.org slash components. This components directory is where Polymer and all the Polymer elements and all that good stuff lives. And from here on out, if we have any relative URLs, it'll just pull stuff from, from that directory. So I'm pulling in web components JS. It's coming from that directory. I can import polymer.html. That'll also come from that directory. And so since we've got all this working off of our CDN, now we can actually sit here if we want. And we can just create our own Polymer element right on JSBin. So I'm going to do that right out of DOM module here. I'll give it an ID of like X foo. And I'll give it a template that just says like hello from X foo. And I'll also give it a little script tag. And inside of here, we will call the Polymer constructor. And we're going to say it is an X foo element. And then the last thing we want to do is we want to just make sure that we use our X foo tag somewhere in the page. And now you can see it showing up over there in our output. So this is really great if you're you know, hanging out on the Polymer Slack channel, you, you run into a bug or some issue, and you're not quite sure how to explain it to folks. You can just go throw together a JS bin using PolyGit and then share that JS bin with people so they can help you get unstuck. Now, I also mentioned that all the Polymer elements that we built are included in this CDN as well. So what you can also do if you find maybe a, a bug or an issue with something like paper tabs is you can go over here and you can just write an HTML import for paper tabs. So instead of just Polymer. I'll also pull in paper tabs. And then you can just start using that element in your page here. So I'll say I want a set of paper tabs. And then inside of here, I will write out maybe like two or three paper tabs. So we'll say this first tab is called foo. 
Second one is going to be called bar. And the last one will be baz. Blue bar baz. And there we go. Now over here in our output, I've got these three paper tabs working just as I was expecting. And you know, if I had some issue, I could then take this. I could save this JS bin. I could go file a GitHub issue and, and point the engineer at this particular JS bin. And that way, it's going to help them triage that issue a lot faster and help them debug the actual uh, problem that you're running into and hopefully get things fixed. Now, one of the coolest things about PolyGit is that it is configurable. So not only uh, does it pull in Polymer and the elements that that team has created, but you can add your own GitHub repos to it as well. So if you go back to the polygit.org website, you scroll down here to the bottom, you can see that there is this sort of uh, interesting configuration syntax. And it might look a little weird when you first see it. It took me a few times kind of working through it to understand what it's doing. Uh, but basically, what you want to do is when you are defining that base URL, you can configure it by saying, oh, I would also like to include this component. And this component might live like inside of some particular org. And maybe you want a particular version, like version 1.2.3. Or maybe you want a branch, right? Maybe you want like the, the master branch. I have some good handwriting right there. Uh, or maybe you want just the, the latest tag. So if you include an asterisk, instead of pulling a particular version or a branch, it'll just give you whatever the latest tag happens to be. So to show you an example of that, I've uh, again got a little JS bin here. And I'm just going to paste in a better URL here. So what I've done is I've configured PolyGit to pull in two additional dependencies. Uh, the first is the marked markdown JS library, which is in the chjj org on GitHub. And I've told it to grab the latest tag. Now I've also told it to pull in the mark dash down element, which is something that I wrote myself that lives in the Rob Dodson org on GitHub. And again, I've just told it to pull in the latest tag there. So now both of those are available in that CDN components directory. So I can just go ahead and write an HTML import to pull in the markdown element. And then over in my body, I can just start using it. So I can have a markdown tag. And we'll just drop in like a hello world for the header there. And we can see we're getting this sort of like huge H1 rendering over there in the output. So if you're working on an element or a project or something like that, and you want to show that to folks on JSBin, you can absolutely do that uh, using PolyGit as well. Uh, the one caveat there is that it has to have been published for at least one hour for it to be picked up by the RawGit uh, caching CDN. Um, but once it's been published for about an hour, it should be available to you on PolyGit. Now, the, the last thing I want to mention here is at the very beginning of the show, we said that this is a sort of development time CDN. And what I mean by that is it's not a CDN that you want to use for production. And the reason is because we're not doing any sort of like vulcanization or anything like that uh, to optimize the elements that we're sending down. Instead, you're getting an individual dependency for everything that you import, which is actually pretty expensive in terms of HTTP requests. So it's great for uh, development time. It's great for hacking on ideas. But when you get to the point where you want to launch something into production, you still want to use a package manager like Bower. You still want to use a process like Vulcanize to make sure uh, you're sending down the absolute smallest payload possible. But you know, if, you, if you just want to mess around with some ideas, it's perfect for that. So that about covers it for today. If you have any questions, please leave them for me down in the comments. Uh, or you can always hit me up on a social network of your choosing at hashtag AskPolymer. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Welcome back. We've covered a lot of ground already, so today I want to review and reinforce concepts. To do that, we'll explore two things. First, we'll code up a basic pipeline for supervised learning. I'll show you how multiple classifiers can solve the same problem. Next, we'll build up. Well, the first slide was already there, but it was the same animation as this one. Now, the slide where instead is. The welcome to the presentation. That's it, right? OK, cool. It is. <laughs> like snappy animation, the welcome. Yeah.
That's it. Thanks. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Shanin Isri. I am a software engineer on Daydream. I hope you are all as excited as I am about the Daydream announcements two days ago. And I hope many of you developers out here and online are eager to join us and develop for Daydream. So I figured a lot of you developers might come from more traditional non-3D graphics development. And I thought it would be really fun to teach how to develop for Daydream and VR in general by making a game. So this is what we are going to do today. We are going to learn some very basic Unity 3D skills. We will add the Google VR SDK, add some gameplay, and have fun and play. Now, if you have Unity on your laptop, feel free to join me and develop with me. You can get the SDK on the link above and the game's asset on the link underneath. If you are online and you don't have Unity, get it off unity3d.com. So I'm just going to leave this slide for a moment. And I'm going to keep going. So this is what we are going to do today. Let's meet our game. We are going to make a very simple Defend the Castle game. This is also online right now on GitHub, or in our samples folder. There are going to be three bridges connecting the island from one side to the other. We'll have androids made of cardboard follow a path through the bridges and onto our castle trying to invade it. We will be adding stereoscopic VR rendering so it will work on the viewer later. We'll be adding binaural audio. Now, audio is really important for a complete and immersive VR exper um, experience. 3D auditory cues will tell you when a cannon is being shot over your head and where to look. Finally, we will add some interaction using the input and the reticle. This will work both for gaze and the old cardboard and for the controller on Daydream. Oh, and this. How many of you made games? Put up your hands if you're a game developer. Did you ever run into throttling that your GPU or CPU went too hot and you needed to take a break until you can keep uh, working? Or, you know, maybe you're like me and you just put your phone into the fridge for it to cool down? <laughs> so we are going to look into some optimization tips so you can get at 60 FPS and avoid being throttled. Now, these are the assets we'll be using in the game, assets I've made before. We have the cannon and the castle. They're really simple. And some trees I took off the Cardboard Design Lab, which is also open source online. Now, this is how we are going to make this. To make the game, I've used Unity and Blender. But you can use any other tool off the market. And whatever you like, even if you have your own engine, there is a C++ SDK, which will be introduced in more detail at Nathan Mart's talk later. OK, so a very quick overview into Unity, if you have never used it before. I'm going to go through it very briefly. This is how a Unity game editor looks like. At the center, we just have our 3D scene. We can move it and look around using a virtual camera. We can also drab, uh, drag and drop objects in the scene to move them around. On the left is the scene arcade. That's the objects that we have inside the scene. 
On the right is the inspector. You can look at any object and see what it is made of. Every object is made of several components. For example, here on the top is the transform component, saying what's our position, rotation, and scale. And at the bottom is the project assets. That's all of the scripts, models, and textures inside our project. Now, a very quick word about Blender. As a game developer for many years, I found that having some 3D editing skill really empowers you, because it means you can make your own models and experiment and make your own game if you want. However, this is how Blender looks like. Now, Blender is an open source project which is free for everyone to use, which is why I picked it. And this is how it looks, and it can be a bit intimidating. I've learned how to use it through this site, but I'm pretty sure there are many other websites out there. OK, let's get to work very quickly and see how far we can go. So I'm just going to open up Unity. If you have it and you've downloaded the project, feel free to do the same. And I'll create a very simple, empty project to get started with, just to show you the basics, really. So this is how a new project looks like. I have the scene. I can press Alt and look around or with the mouse wheel button. And I can go to the game object menu at the top and maybe add a plane to use as my ground. And now it's inside the scene. I have a beginning a starter camera, the main camera, which I can move around. On the bottom right, you can see that's the camera preview and what it will see. Now, if I add just a cube for reference, and I'm starting very basic, and we'll go on in a bit. So now I have a cube in the scene, and I can press play here at the top. And basically, we get what we see is what we get kind of editor. However, there are some problems here. The biggest of, we don't have stereoscopic rendering. Luckily, it is really simple to get it with our SDK. Now, I have downloaded the package for importing the Google VR SDK just before. And this is simply a Unity package. I can double click on it, and it will load all the relevant assets into our project. Now, next, I'm just going to delete the main camera, because we no longer need it. We want to have stereoscopic view. So I'm deleting that. And as you may see, here down at the project assets, we have the Google VR folder now. So I'll go into it, and I'll go to prefabs. And then I'll drag the Google VR main into the scene and place it just here at the back. Now, a prefab is basically a collection of game objects already set up with components. So in this case, this is what we need to do stereoscopic rendering. I can press play, and now we have all we need for VR. If I press Alt, I can simulate head movement, use my mouse, and look around. The stereoscopic camera basically works if I open up it on the left in the hierarchy. It has a head and a stereo renderer. The head also has a camera, which is a template camera for two different cameras, one camera for each eye, simulating the distance between our two eyes, basically. This is how we do the illusion of depth and depth sensation. So we know how far someone in the crowd is from me, or I am from you all. OK, now let's open up a project I have prepared beforehand so we can get started. Because if I start making the entire scene from scratch, it's going to take quite a while. And we won't make any game like it. So this is the very basic scene. I can move inside by zooming in using the scroll wheel or the trackpad. And I can look around. And let's see what we are going to do. So we have our castle made of cardboard. And on the other side of the island, we have the little android statue signifying where the invading androids will come from. Here on top of the castle, we also have our cannon that we'll be using to fire at the androids. And again, all the assets here, including the scenes, are already ready for you to download off GitHub. If I press play, I've already prepared the camera on top of one of the towers, so I can look around and see where the androids will come from. 
However, nothing is happening at the moment, so we'll need to add some gameplay. So let's see how we are going to add androids to spawn from uh, somewhere in the island. So I'm just going to disable a few things on the left. I'm going to create a new game object, let's say just an empty one, and I'm going to call it spawner because this is what's going to spawn my androids from. So I'm doing it here on the right at the inspector. Now I'm going to create a new component and I'll just call it spawner because it's simple. And then I can double click the script here on the inspector to open and tap in Mono Develop or whatever script you want to use. I'm going to add a short timer. I'll start it at maybe one second to begin with. Oops. And let's add another one for respawn time and set it up to five seconds. Now, on the update, what we should be doing is decrease our timer so we can get new androids into our scene. So we'll use time delta time. And then if our timer is, well, I keep getting code completion errors here. Oh, before I can spawn Androids, I need to have some locations I can spawn them from. So let's add a list of transformations. Call it spawn points. And just initialize it here. OK, so now if I look into the scene, you see that the spawner script is going to update in just a moment. There we go. So now we have the timer and the respawn timer. And we'll be able to add some points to let the, to let the script know where to place androids at. We also need to create a path into the island. So for that, what we can do, just to make it simple again, I'll create a new game object that, that will be a sphere. And I can place it somewhere inside the scene. And this signifies a point in space at the moment. I'll just remove the sphere collider so objects do not collide with it later on. And then I'll add a waypoint script, which I've prepared beforehand. All it does is have a list of what's the next point going to be. And then I can duplicate this, just Command C, Command V, and I can go into the first sphere and drag and drop the sphere from the hierarchy into the next. So I can have them link to each other. And then I'll have to keep doing it until they cross over the bridge and go to the castle. But this is just a way to start. So now that we have some objects, and we'll go to our spawner, and we'll add the initial point into the spawn points. And now, if the timer is less than zero, then we'll just set the timer back to the respawn timer. And we'll go to an Android pool, which I'll go to in more detail later. And I'll create the position, not at my position. I'm going to do a transform, create transform. And I'll use the size of the elements inside my list. There we go. Have we missed a bracket somewhere? All good. OK, and now that we have the two set up, and we'll press play again. 
If we go over to the scene view, we will see every few seconds, every five seconds specifically, we will have an Android coming up. Now, I'm not going to create the entire path here because I think that editing should be done later. It's not very interesting. So I do have enemies path. And if I go to layers here at the top right and mark invisible to enable it, we can see them in here. And I'll just collapse it. I'll decollapse this one. I'll go to the spanner, and I'll drag and drop my waypoints here from the left and onto the list. And now that I press play again, we'll have Android spawning from various spawn points here on the scene, and we'll go over to the castle. So the different paths. OK, so we have basic Androids coming to the scene. We can look at them from the game. I can also maximize it so you might be able to see it. But we don't have any way to interact with them. We need some kind of a way to shoot them off our island so they don't get to the castle. So let's look into our ground. Let's look at how are we going to shoot with the cannon onto the ground somehow. So selecting the terrain, I'll go to Add Component, and I'll add a target behavior. And we'll just make a very quick script so we can shoot onto the cannons. I don't actually need the start or update here. So what I'll do is make a new function on click, and then I'll use the base event data from Unity. And then I'll cast it into a pointer event data. Here. Maybe I'll actually name this. But before that, I need to make sure I actually have a cannon inside the scene. So I did add one beforehand. So I'll just make sure it actually exists. And now we'll make the cannon shoot from the can inside the scene onto the intersection point. Yeah. What am I missing here? One of those brackets. Oh, I'm using the wrong script. Sorry about that. And all I'm going to do is use the transformation from the raycast. And I'll get to more detail on that in a moment. Let's see. What position? That sounds about right. OK, but even now, if I press into the terrain, nothing will happen. We need to add a few more interactions here. The first thing we need to do is add a way to receive events from Unity and from our Google VR SDK, so we know when an object had actually been clicked in any way. So I'm going to add an event system from Unity. The event system, all it does is relay the events between objects. So it comes with a standalone input module, which I'm going to remove, because we are not going to use it. And I'll add a gaze input module. This is basically going to take the orientation of our camera and transform it into the events. At the moment, there is not such element for the controller, but this will be coming soon. So the next thing I need to do is go to my camera inside Google VR main, go to the main camera template, and we'll add a physics ray caster. Now, 
On its own, the event system will allow you to interact with UI canvas elements. But if you want to interact with objects inside the scene, you need to add um, a physics ray caster for it to interact with them. So I'm going to set the event mask. The event mask basically says which layers in the scene are interactable. I will just set it up to nothing. And then I'll set it again to the grid. The grid is the name I chose for the terrain. You can see it here up on layer that it is selected as grid. And that means that when the gaze input module is looking into the camera, finding its views, it's going to find exactly which object it is looking on, but only from the layers that you have enabled. So the next thing we need to do, OK, now we have everything kind of working and interactable, but we never actually call our script from anywhere. So going back to our terrain, I'll just click on it here in the editor. What we need to do, and this is our water, so click again on the terrain, is create an event trigger. What the event trigger does is basically say that this object is looking, is listening for the following events. And I'll add a pointer click event. And then I'll select the same object I can just drag and drop it from here, from the scene on the left, into the missing component. And then it shows me all the components that are on this object, and I can select the one I want. So I've made a, terrain be a target behavior. So I'll just select on click. And when I press play the next time, and I look around, I'll be able to activate the cannon and we'll be able to fire onto the Android. However, it's actually really difficult, and I'll just put it full screen, actually. It is actually really difficult to aim this way. I, like, I have no idea where I'm pointing at. I'm just doing this at random, almost. So what I'm going to do is add a reticle. So I'll search here in the project assets, and I'll find the Google VR reticle. And what I'm going to do is drag it down onto head. And I'll make sure that its position is reset here in the inspector. It already is, so it's good. And the next time I start my scene, you see there is a little point in the middle of the screen, which is telling me where I'm looking at. Now, if it looks at an object that is marked as interactable, it will grow to signify that the object can be interacted in some way. And I can shoot there. However, once again, we have gameplay, we have some minimal interaction, but the game feels somewhat empty. I mentioned before in the presentation that to make a really good virtual reality experience, you want to have sound. So let's look into how we're going to add some sound in. So I want to have an epic sound for the cannon whenever I shoot at the androids. So I'm going to look into my cannonball object. The cannonball object is spawned every time where I select to shoot somewhere into the scene. The first thing I will do is I will add an audio source. If you have listened to the binaural audio presentation earlier, you might be familiar with it, but this is our Google VR implementation of 3D binaural audio, and you can use it just like this. Now it's on the object. I'm going to select a specific sound, the cannonball fire sound. I've also prepared the, the cannonball behavior script, which is what controls the flight of the cannon and then the explosion at the end. And it has another element here for the impact audio. So I'll just go in here, and I'll select the Canon Impact here on the left. And if we look quickly on the Cannonball behavior, we'll see this on Impact script here at the bottom. And what it does is select the script, the variable which I have just filled in, and it will play it once our Cannonball is just about to hit the ground inside the on update. It's a pretty short script, so if you're following on the YouTube video later, you can easily find it all. Now, here you have additional settings for the sounds. 
in this case, I want it to be an epic explosion, so I'm just going to put the gain on the max and hope it will all work well on the speakers here. But you also have settings for directivity, which is how the sound is going to distribute and spread out in space. If I set this here, you'll see the circle showing how the sound waves will, will spread. If I use the alpha, you see it become larger on the front, and then it will spread more towards the back. Well, if I use the sharpness, it will make it more sharp, as you would expect. So give it more of a direction. For the cannonball, I'll use a sound that spreads in everywhere at the same time. You can also enable occlusion for the sound to bounce off elements into the scene, from the scene, but I'm going to skip that at the moment. Now, I kind of want to press play and just see how the sound is working, but it will not work. There's one more step we need to do. If I go edit here on the top and to project settings and go to audio, we need to set the specializer plugin here on the right from none to Google VR audio specializer. And once again, all of these instructions will be in the GitHub readme file. Now, the next time I press play, when I fire at Androids, and I'll maximize this again, here's one. It's coming. There we go. We'll have some 3D audio. Now, if you're with speakers, on a device or even on the computer, you'll find out that when you look in different directions, the stereo sound will come as you'd expect it to come from. I also want to add some sounds to the Androids, but I'm going to cheat here because I have a lot to cover. So a lot of it is prepared beforehand. I'm just going to look for the Android. I'm going to search here in the project. I'll find the Android prefab, and I'm going to add another Google VR audio source component. Now, I'm not going to set any sound in here. I'm going to disable the play on the wake. This is because I've already set some sounds here in different lists. And if we go into the script itself, you'll notice there are, there are multiple lists of audio clips. And when we enable the Android, it will play the charge sound and when it's going to be exploded away by the cannon, we'll play an impact sound, just as an example. Now, when I press play, every time an Android will spawn, it will have some kind of a charge, and when I shoot towards it and hit it, it will have an OO oh -oh sound and fly away. You'll probably hear it better on a device. You can get the APK from the GitHub. It's online right now. So this is the Google VR interaction, the stereoscopic rendering, and the audio. Another, a few quick more words about the interaction. When you are pointing at an element, let's do it as an example. I'm going to maximize it. The reticle is quite smart, actually. In VR, you really need to be able to converge exactly where you're looking at. And the reticle tends to take the depth of the element that you're pointing at. So if we are pointing at the terrain here, it's not only spreading up out to show that the terrain is interactable, but it's actually casting its position onto the depth of the terrain itself. However, in this case, I have not set the trees to be occluders inside the event mask, as well as the tower, which means that the reticle is probably rendering in front of them, but still being visible, which can make some issues with convergence, especially if I look down here onto the terrain, but also onto the tower. So what you want to do in these cases is go to your uh, main camera and add some more elements into the event mask down here. Uh, so for example, if we add the default, you'll notice that whenever we are looking onto a tower or a tree, it will, it will no longer grow, and the depth will be cast properly in the reticle. Now, I have just about 15 minutes, and this is a very basic game, but I really want to talk about performance here. 
When I was making this demo, I had about two and a half weeks to do it, and I was trying to do some really fancy stuff. However, doing work and working on a game demo at the same time actually turned out to be pretty difficult. And after the game was finished, it maybe ran at like 45 frames per second, which is not great. Now it's running on 60 FPS on the device at full resolution. But this gave me even more first-hand experience to give you some performance tips. So let's look into them. If we look into the Google VR, we will notice that we have a VR mode enabled, which is what we want to do. But we also have distortion correction. If we press play and we look into the distortion, you can set it to none, which means it's not going to fix the distortion. The, the distortion is concussion distortion caused by the lenses when you're looking through them onto the screen. You want to, to use distortion correction. However, there are several ways to do so. If you have watched the Vertex Distortion Correction presentation, I'm not sure if it was before mine or after, but it mentions a way to do correction without post-processing. The way we do it here is by doing it on a post-process, which means we will need to draw every pixel again with the correction. The vertex correction happens when you're drawing the objects themselves onto the screen, and it will distort them to fit and look how they should be, so you don't need to use additional pixel rendering time and waste more of your GPU bandwidth, because that tends to be one of the more expensive things. So if I'm not using the vertex-based correction, I'll use either native or Unity. In this case, I'm using Unity. And you can play with the stereo screen scale. That changes the virtual display that we are drawing to. When we are drawing our, our scene, our game or application, we are actually drawing it into an off-screen buffer, which is a larger size of our real screen. We do it so we can completely remove any, any artifacts and distortion and not lose any of our details. So we're, losing the, we're fixing the pixel er error by drawing on high resolution. But sometimes, depending on the device, you'll find that the generated resolution is too high. And you might want to change it from 1 to maybe 0 0.9 or 0 0.8. I'm going to leave it at, nine, at a 1 here because it's working quite well. Now, the other thing you can do is go into your edit menu and go into project. And we'll just look into quality here. So I like to make a new quality level. I call it Google VR, or GVR for short. And I set Android to be the default, um, use it by default. Now, depending on your scene, if you're using a lot of lighting or heavy shaders, I'd suggest to bake all your lighting into a texture. I'm not going to go over how to do it now. There's enough information on it online. But in that case, you can lower your pixel uh, count. And depending on your scene, you might even be able to move to vertex lighting. But that's in a different menu, so I'll go to it later. If you're not using soft particles or any reflections, you might want to disable this. I do suggest keeping multi-sampling at least at two. When you're looking into the screen through the lenses and you don't have multi-sampling on, then you will see all the aliasing and jagged edges. And that's not a pretty experience on your eyes to see all those jagged edges. So try to make sure that your game or application is performing well enough to enable anti-aliasing at at least 2x. Two, two because otherwise, it's just not going to look as great, unless you're rendering at much higher resolution. Now, as I mentioned, if you can play with your shadows, uh, play with your light, try to bake your shadows as well. And then, if you can, you can disable your real-time shadows or set it to hard shadows only. Another thing you can do is change the shadow cascades instead. Now, if we go into, oh, and shadow cascades is multiple shadow maps used to have different qualities between shadows that are near the camera or further away, because the shadows near the camera needs to be higher quality because the player can see all of the artifacts happening. 
Now, another thing we can do is go here into player. You have to set your default orientation to landscape left to work with the, with the viewer. Another thing you might be able to do to gain more performance and sometimes quality over mobile is disable the 3D bit display buffer. The reason for it is because some phones do not actually have 32 bit support and they emulate it using half points. So on some Galaxy phones, for example, you're getting more shadow artifacts without it because of the emulation layer. And then if you're using only 16 bits, you are getting less bandwidth usage, which means you're getting more performance and less heat is being generated on the hardware itself. If we go to auto setting, as I mentioned earlier, you can change to vertex lighting, or you can keep it at forward if you have good enough performance, depending on how you have made your scene and your game. I do very much recommend enabling multi-threaded rendering because that is going to take a big chunk of your CPU usage to another thread. And then you can do more, and you will not be as CPU throttled later for hitting up one core and using all the bandwidth there. You should use the static and dynamic batching. What that does is reduce your draw calls. So if I go to the game and I press on the stats over here, you can see that I have about 166 draw calls inside this scene, and I have 162 vertices. If I press play, I'm going to have double that amount, or just about double that amount, because Unity is going to be able to opt optimize to some level. The reason for it is because we are drawing the scene twice. So it's doing double the work, and you need to make sure that you're not having too many vertices in the scene or too many triangles. Another thing that I've noticed with Unity, and you might be familiar with it, especially if you've worked with C++, is that it doesn't really like instantiating objects. That means a lot of memory allocations. And for that, I've made a specific memory pool. So if you look at the memory pool in here, you see it will have two scripts, one for cannonballs and one for the androids. When I press play, as this object is being initialized, it's creating all these unused cannonball elements and the androids, which are slowly being used. When I shoot a cannonball, let's say over here, you see, one cannonball is being used here at the top, and in a few seconds, it will be disabled and ready to be used again. This is to avoid heavy memory allocations, which can be very expensive at runtime. So the way I make a script like that is by creating a single tone and then having a couple of static functions, one to create an element and one to destroy on the initialization of the script, it's going to make sure if there is no single tone to set its own. And then it will create however many instances of the object that I set it to do. In this case, I've put it on the code. You should put it as a variable instead. OK, so I've managed to finish a little bit ahead of time, which never happened when I tried to do it before. So if you have any questions, this is a good time for it. Okay, now I'm at the Google Cloud Platform booth, and I'm about to play Query It with Felipe. And, and I just, before we start, I'd like to ask the crowd, uh, is Felipe going to win? No. What about me? Oh. Yeah. Oh. Oh. The crowd's on my side. <laughs> in the world 
everything that is happening from 30 years ago until the last 15 minutes. What country besides the United States was mentioned with Greece the most last year? Oh, yeah, I know that one. It's a tech. They're close. Turkey? I think, I think you might be right, but... You're just screwing with me now. <laughs> Don't let me They're win, They're super Felipe. close. SQL query, analyzing all of the Which news man? from last year. This is a real-time query. So cool. It's also beautiful. Yes. I mean, the cool part I, is how fast it's querying. It's also beautiful. I do love this animation. 20 gigabytes, analyzed in 20 seconds, over a million. Germany! Turkey! Oh, 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 he was the second one. Okay, now I'm here with Brett, still in the Google Cloud Platform tent, and we're gonna take a look at the Cloud Vision API. But first, we need to take a few photos. All right, Brett, so this is the Cloud Vision API detecting facial emotions. Tell me all about it. So the Vision API does a lot of things, uh, one of which is emotion detection. So it's actually analyzing these faces, and it's going to get us a likelihood of different emotions, so joy, sorrow, anger, and surprise. Uh, and it does it by looking at different facial features, so like where your nose is, position of your mouth, position of your ears, and so forth. Uh, so we can see in these, uh, it's going to color it appropriately. So this is very likely to be joy. So you can see that there's like yellow on it. Uh -huh. um, this is angry, so it's red, and sorrow, so it's blue. So our our photos are starting to come in. Now you can see <laughs> that's an angry Timothy. <laughs> I would say that it's very likely to be angry, <laughs> surprised, <laughs> and then what is this one? Joy. All right, so it's actually zooming in. And you can see all these dots are actually spots recognized by the Vision API. Uh, so midpoint between the nose and eyes and so forth. That's amazing. Uh, and there's a whole lot of things that the Vision API does. Uh, it can analyze images to see what's in a photo. It can tell you, for example, this is a photo of a dog or furniture or chair. Uh, it can do text extraction, so you can upload an image and it can read street signs, for example. It'll take a picture of a, of a page in a book and it'll give you the text back. Um, an interesting thing is it can do safe search detection. So you can upload an image, tell you if it's not safe for work. Uh, it's powered by the same algorithm. That's really useful. Yeah. It's powered so, by the same algorithms that power Google safe search on the web. Yeah. That's really cool. So you can plug them in to anything that can make a REST API call. So you can use it from your Android app, you can use it from your web app, from your iOS app. We also have speech API which if you use like Google Now and as you talk, mm -hmm. like it sort of transcribes your text as you go. Uh, so we have a version of Speech API. We've got a Prediction API, a Translate API, and a lot more on the way. Awesome. Thanks, Brett. Yeah, you bet. There's something really satisfying about getting your app to look great on your device. But just because there's over 11,000 other Android devices out there doesn't mean you need to build 11,000 other layouts to make a great looking app. Not if you're using responsive UI principles. You may have noticed that I'm not Ian or Joanna. My name is Mike Denny, a design advocate on the Google Design team. First things first, thinking about specific phones and tablets is only going to get you into trouble. There's a wide spectrum of devices and not that much difference between the largest phone and the smallest tablet. Instead, think more generally about how much space you have to work with. This can come in three different flavors, width, height, and smallest width. Width is super important and should be the basis for breakpoints in designing and building your UI. For example, 600 dp in width is the first point where you could consider having a side-by-side -side summary and detail level view. Any lower and you won't be giving each level a full attention it deserves. Height is less common when designing a responsive UI, but keep in mind that something like a vertically scrolling container is going to be difficult to use if you can only see one or two elements at a time due to a constrained height. Smallest width, unlike height or width, is designed to be rotation insensitive as it's just the smaller of the two values. This gives you a better idea of how much space is available and is an easy way to ensure that your app remains consistent as the device is rotated. You don't want to force your user to relearn your navigation structure every time they rotate their device. This is particularly important in the multi-window world. When your app is resized, your width, height, and smallest width are going to be updated. You might be going from full screen on a tablet down to what amounts to a portrait-oriented phone worth of space. 
Here's where a good responsive UI can make for a smooth transition. There are a number of common patterns you might consider when building that responsive UI, such as revealing previously hidden content as the screen size grows, transforming your navigation pattern or switching from a list to a grid, dividing your screen into multiple sections side by side, reflowing specific elements, expanding the size or margins of individual elements, or even changing the position of specific elements like a floating action button. Check out the blog post for more details on designing a responsive UI and specific patterns you can use to build better apps. Hey there, Polycasters. Rob here. So before coming into the studio, we tweeted out a question to see what folks wanted to see in the next episode of Polycast. And a lot of folks wrote in and said they wanted to know how to lazy load Polymer elements to improve the performance of their apps. So that's exactly what we're going to cover today. Now to do that, we're going to start off over here at the Polymer docs. And we're going to go down to the API reference. And some folks might not even realize that we, we have an API reference, but it's, it's kind of hidden down here in the sidebar for the documentation. You can go click on that. And that's going to take you to this sort of uh, kind of classic Polymer doc layout if, if you've seen this before on other elements. And this is where you can find all of the properties and methods of the Polymer object itself. So a lot of really cool stuff inside of here. This is also where, for instance, like the Polymer templatizer documentation is. So if you wanted to create your own uh, version of DOM if or DOM repeat, you could use templatizer to do that. Just a helpful tidbit there. But what we're interested in here is this Polymer base object. And Polymer base is sort of the base prototype for all Polymer elements. And it's where we hide interesting like methods and properties and stuff like that. The one I'm into is called import href down here. We can hit the embiggen button to make it larger. And so what import href is going to do, it's going to give us the ability to dynamically load an HTML import at runtime. It's got a few arguments that it takes. The first argument is we're going to give it an href, so basically just a path to some component or some uh, HTML import that you want to pull in at runtime. And then it wants callbacks for on success, on error. And lastly, it takes an option, which specifies whether or not you want the link tag to have an async attribute on it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use import href, and I'm going to build sort of a sample application. This is the app that I have thrown together. It is called Polymeal. It's a social network for foodies. And I guess people that like uh, stir fry, because um, there's a lot of pictures of stir fry. And uh, you can either go to the sort of the, the browse section, and you see here that I've got all sorts of yummy photos, or you could go to the activity feed, and you could see maybe like I'd be posting status updates from all the cool, awesome restaurants that I am eating at, right? Now, the main thing to take away from this is that these two sections have very, very different content, right? This one is, is a whole bunch of cards with some paper buttons on it. Right? And this activity feed is instead just sort of these like little, little status blurb things. So there's no reason to load all of this, uh, all these card elements if the user is just starting off in the activity feed. Right? It would just make more sense to load that at runtime to kind of like uh, reduce the bandwidth for our total application. So to do that, we're going to use import href over here in our code editor. So this is my X app element that I have started off with. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have an X app element. Inside of XAP, I will chuck in a little iron pages here. And inside of uh, iron pages, we'll have sections for the different bits of our app that we are interested in. So I've got a browse section and an activity section. And we've also got the page.js router loaded into XAP as well. So if we go down to the JavaScript definition, we can see that I've got kind of a, a basic route stubbed out. And what I want to do is, when the route changes to either the browse section or the activity section, I'm going to call Polymer's import href method, load in my element definition. Once that's loaded in, I will then tell Iron Pages to switch over to that section. Now, the first thing I want to do, though, since we're starting off just at like slash, uh, right now what we're doing is we're actually just loading a shell that looks kind of like this, right? We don't have, uh, you know, we're not hitting either the browse or the activity section, so the users kind of got, you know, nothing to look at. So we'll start off by redirecting them, page redirect over to the Browse section. So this way, we just have kind of like a nice starting point. I'm going to write another handler for Browse, so page slash Browse. And you'll notice here that I'm using uh, ES6 fat arrow functions. That just makes it a little bit easier to, uh, to deal with the scoping of the this value inside of these handlers. So I'll say uh, page.browse. And what I first want to do is see 
if the element has already been loaded. Has this page been loaded before? Because if it has, there's no reason to import it again. So we'll call Polymer's is instance method. And this is something that I, I don't even think it's, it's well documented. It might seriously not even exist anywhere in our docs. But I spoke with our tech writer. This is a thing. You can use it to sort of check to see if an element is an upgraded Polymer element. So because both our browse element and our activity element have IDs, we can reference them using automatic node finding. And we could say this.$sign.browse. So if this is already a Polymer element, let's just go ahead and return. No reason to do anything. No, no importing or anything like that is needed. But we will set the selected value to browse. And then what that's going to do is that's going to tell our iron to switch to that section. So you can see we're, we're binding its selected attribute to that property. Okay. Now, if the element has not been loaded, if it hasn't been upgraded yet, now we're going to import its definition. So we'll call uh, polymer.base.importhref. And we're going to pass it a path to the HTML import for the browse section that we want to load. So elements slash xbrowse slash xbrowse.html. And then we'll give it a success handler to run. So we're going to say, all right, cool, the element loaded in. Let's now set the selected state to browse. That'll tell Iron Pages to update. And now we can return, exit our, our route here. We should be good to go. If we go back and we look at our application now and we refresh the page, it should redirect to the Browse section, and it should start loading in all of those cards. Awesome, right? Uh, now we need to do the same thing for the Activity section. So I can just grab this entire route right here and uh, do, some, do some dangerous copy and paste work here. We're just going to go through, and any place where it says Browse, we'll just flip it out for Activity. Activity. Thank you, spell check. So when we go to slash Activity, we're going to check to see if the Activity element is upgraded. If it is, return. If it's not, import it. Let's go give that a look. So refresh the page, and we see our Browse section looking good. We go to the Activity section, and boom, we got our status feed showing up right there. Now. There's still a lot of unanswered questions to this. I kind of showed you the, the quick and dirty version of using import href. But what we didn't talk about was, you know, do we need to vulcanize these things into different bundles? And if so, how do we exclude common dependencies? Or can we just use HTTP2 to maybe like server push all the things or multiplex stream all of our dependencies? So there's still a lot of things that uh, remain to be worked out. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about those in an upcoming episode of Polymer. But today, for what we've done here, if you have any questions, please leave them for me down in the comments. Otherwise, you can always ping me on a social network of your choosing at hashtag AskPolymer. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Otherwise, you can ping me on a social network at... Take two. I'll keep all the, the fun stuff up here, top two thirds of the screen. We all know from experience that people love to share things about themselves, such as photos, videos, and GIFs that express their feelings. So what do you do to let them store and share these files through your app? That's where Firebase Storage can help. Our storage API lets you upload your users' files to our cloud so they can be shared with anyone else. And if you have specific rules for sharing files with certain users, you can protect this content for users logged in with Firebase authentication. Security, of course, is our first concern. All transfers are performed over a secure connection. Also, all transfers with our API are robust and will automatically resume in case the connection is broken. This is essential for transferring large files over slow or unreliable mobile connections. And finally, our storage, backed by Google Cloud Storage, scales to petabytes. That's billions of photos to meet your app's needs, so you will never be out of space when you need it. So give your users space to share their lives with Firebase Storage, available right now for iOS, Android, and web applications. And to learn more about Firebase Storage, check out the documentation available right here. Let's be honest, you're an awesome engineer with an awesome app and you are using threading to the max. Sadly though, managing all those individual threads and assigning work between them is causing you to lose your hair. My name is Colt McCandless and please 
don't join the bald club. Instead, use the thread pools class, which is an ideal primitive for breaking up lots of work into little buckets. See, historically, it was commonplace that applications would use a dedicated thread model. Uh, that is, one thread that only deals with database rights, while a separate thread only handles streaming of music, and a third one only handles networking. Uh, these setups are okay because the amount of work per thread isn't that large, and it's okay to handle this work in sequential order. But there reaches a point where this model starts to fall over. Uh, say, for example, that you've got 40 bitmaps to decode, and each decode takes like four milliseconds or something. Uh, putting all of this work on a single dedicated thread is a bad idea, since it'll take 80 milliseconds total to get all that work done in a sequential fashion. On the other hand, if you created 10 threads and let each one decode four bitmaps, then you'd end up only taking 16 milliseconds total. But then, of course, you run into the problem of how to properly pass the work around between those threads, schedule that work, and then managing of those threads. Uh, before you start stressing out about writing all that code, don't worry. This is exactly what thread pool executor primitive is for. Uh, basically, this class will just let you spin up a number of threads and toss blocks of work to execute on it. Thread pool executor handles all of the heavy lifting of spinning up the threads, load balancing work across those threads, and even killing those threads when they have been idle for a while. Uh, basically, it handles all the heavy lifting of super parallel processing on your behalf. All you have to do is split up the work. But there's a small caveat here. How many threads should your thread pool have? I mean, technically speaking, you have the ability to create as many threads as you want, but that's not ideal. See, CPUs can only execute a certain number of threads in parallel. Once you get above that number, then the CPU has to start deciding which threads get the next free block of processor time based on how important they are. Which means that if you keep eventually adding threads, you'll hit a break-even point where your computation isn't getting any faster, even though the number of threads that you have has increased significantly. And it's also important to note that each of these threads aren't free. Uh, each thread costs you about 64k of memory in minimum, and that adds up quickly, especially in situations where the call stacks can start growing pretty large. As such, your app needs to find a sweet spot between the number of cores and the point of diminishing return with the number of threads. Thankfully, once again, the thread pool executor class has got you covered. When creating your thread pool, you can specify the number of initial threads and the number of maximum threads. As the workload in the thread pool changes, it'll scale the number of alive threads to match. Oh, and a uh, quick note, the value returned from get available processors may not reflect the number of physical cores in the device. Now, see, some devices have CPUs that will deactivate one or more cores depending on the system load to save battery. So if your device has two CPUs, but one of them is asleep, this value could return one. And of course, thread pools won't solve all of your threading problems. As mentioned earlier, unless you're dealing with lots and lots of work packets all the time, this thing's kind of overkill. It's best to use things like handler threads or async task loaders for specific types of work blocks and only throw the massive computing problems at the thread pool. And for you power users out there, remember that render script might be a better alternative to large scale parallel work on Android devices. But that's a whole separate set of videos that we haven't gotten into yet. And don't forget that SysTrace is an amazingly powerful tool that lets you visualize how work is flowing through the threads in your application. It's a great way to validate that things are working as intended and also see all the other crazy threads that are being worked on by other parts of your app. And that's the trick with performance, isn't it? I mean, you can make assumptions, but things don't always work the way you think, which is why you need to check out the rest of the Android performance patterns videos. And don't forget to join our Google Plus community to ask a lot of hard threading questions as well. So keep calm, profile your code, and always remember, perf matters. So service workers are powerful for offline caching, but they're also really good for giving you um, instant loading performance benefits when it comes to repeat visits. Yep. Right. And you can achieve that using an application shell architecture. Yeah. Now, so that's kind of the idea of it's kind of separating content from the actual visual UI. So in my head, it's kind of like native apps. You always have the banner. You've got the navigation drawer at the side. You yeah. might have some other bits. 
that could be common through like 90% of your app. Yeah. You always want it there. So when we talk about the shell, we're talking about the HTML, the CSS, and the JavaScript that's making up the bulk of your UI. Yeah. Stuff exactly. that, you know, if you cache that, you can still just like load up content in the very middle. Yeah. Um, and save yourself having to constantly reload that stuff, right? Yeah. And it's super nice when it comes to like, let's say they're visiting a page they've never been to before. If you know the layout's always going to be the same, you can still load that while you go and get the content in the background. Um, and it just makes sure that your user has like really good perceived performance. Yeah. Um, so the first time your app loads, you might show, you might like, um, you're going to have to render the shell itself. You'll cache that in your service worker. And you might show like a toast just to let them know, hey, this application now works offline. Yep. And that means that when they come back another time, like let's say they're you know, in airplane mode, uh, that shell will load up really, really quickly. Um, and then it might go to the network to fetch the rest of the content. You can then cache that content so that you know, that entire view is then available whenever they try accessing it without a network connection. Yeah, exactly. Spot on. We've got some performance testing we've done with the application shell model. Um, this is using web page tests. So on first visit, we've got um, a relatively fast uh, time to first meaningful paint. And this is super important, because I, I think that there can be scenarios where someone might take advantage of service worker to be like, ah, don't worry about your first load, but I'm just going to serve up like megabytes of stuff that yeah. I'm going to cache. Afterwards, you'll be super fast. But that first load, if that takes so long to the point where the service worker doesn't even get registered, that's pointless. And plus, for other browsers that don't support service worker, you're then kind of just damaging yourself. Yeah, that's so, going to make your users go and cry in a corner. Exactly. You don't want that. So you still want to be serving up just that static render of your site, just so then it just loads up as fast as humanly possible, and then progressively enhance with service worker to then use the AppShell model. And if you are using the AppShell model, as you can see here, we've got um, really good. We've actually slashed our load times um, for first meaningful paints on repeat visits. Uh, speaking of like actually taking a look at what impact server-side rendering has on this, uh, you don't have to use Service Worker um, you know, to actually be able to get good gains. If you're building uh, with the AppShell model in mind, with server-side rendering in mind, you will get like, a really good first paint, even in like, Safari and, and like, mobile Safari on iOS. Yeah, all the other browsers that just don't have Service Worker. Yeah. Now, if you're wondering, OK, well, should I be using the application shell model on all of my applications, um, there are going to be types of apps, like super simple apps. This, this might be overkill. Yeah. But if you're building something that's you know, a little bit more complex, a little bit more dynamic, this type of model makes a ton of sense. Um, at Google, we're using it for things like Inbox. and It's working really well there. Yeah, I think it's one of those things you end up falling into the sit there and figure out whether it makes sense for your site or not. But I think it's a good overall model that works for a lot of different scenarios. There's a whole ton um, behind this model that you know, we, we way too much to explain in just one video. But we wrote up. Uh, Pretty amazing article on this, if we do say so ourselves. Well, you wrote it up, and I just read it. So you you just added your name to the end of it. Yeah, that's how I wrote. Pretty much. <laughs> Impact. Um, that's worth checking out. That's the format. This it's show a mediocre already. article at best, but it's got pretty graphics. Yes, it does. Um, people should go check that out. Yep. Learn more about App Shell. Um, and then there's also the Getting Started Guide for your first progressive web app, where it actually talks about the application shell model, how you can make, like, take advantage of it, as well as how it applies to the demo app that you can build in this lovely code lab. Yeah. And in that article, we also link out to tools that can help you get started with the application model like, really quickly um, that we're working on. So check that out. Yeah, build a weather app. Hey, gang. Did you know you can send notifications to iOS devices using Google Cloud Messaging? Well, you can. Why would you ever want to do that? Maybe that's a better question. Let's find out the answer on this episode of Route 85. So notifications, they're a great way for you to engage with your users. They let your customers know you have important new information for them. And when used responsibly, they can be a great way to keep users coming back to your app. But they're not super fun to implement. There's a lot of steps required to set up notifications in the first place. You need logic on both the client and the server. And if you're developing a cross-platform mobile app, and most of you are these days, you have to do this for Android and for iOS. And uh, I'm not just talking about two sets of client logic either. It turns out sending notifications to iOS and Android devices requires different logic on the server too. See, if you've done any notifications work in the past, you're probably used to talking to APNS, that's the Apple Push Notification Service, to deliver notifications to iOS devices, and to GCM, that's Google Cloud Messaging, to deliver notifications to Android devices. 
And while sending notifications through these two services is similar, they each have slightly different features, use different protocols, accept different message payloads, and return different responses, all of which means that you gotta keep track of what kind of device each of your users has and use two completely different code paths to send a notification. Or do you? Well, well, no, no you don't. You see, one pretty great feature about Google Cloud Messaging that a lot of people don't know about is that GCM can relay to APNS any notifications you wanna to send to an iOS device. Now granted, you'll need to do some setup work like upload your APNS certificate to GCM and make sure your client sends its device token to the GCM service. But once you've done that, you can use GCM to send all of your notifications no matter what platform your target device is and GCM will deliver your notifications to the correct device using the appropriate service. What all this means is that you don't need to care about what device your user has anymore. You just, has, you just have to write and maintain one code path and as we all know, less code means less room for mistakes. But it's not just about using less code. By using GCM to handle your messaging for you, you can take advantage of some of the other nice features that GCM offers to developers, like topics. Topics allow your app to subscribe to notifications about any particular topic that you or your users want to. For example, let's say you've got a weather app and I, as a loyal weather fan, want to be notified whenever there's extreme weather happening in my zip code. Well, in the old way of doing this, you'd probably need to set up a database where you keep track of each one of your users and their devices and their zip codes and do this whole select users where blah 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 query, then loop through the results and send notifications to each device that you get back from this database query. But with topics, none of that's necessary. Instead, your app simply tells GCM that you're interested in subscribing to, say, the weather 94043 topic. Then, next time there's rain in California, for us that, that counts as extreme weather, Oh my gosh, there's something coming down from the sky! I don't know if it's water, if it's acid! I can't go out! I don't know how to drive anymore! Yeah, that seems about right. So yeah, with topics, your server simply tells GCM to send notifications to all devices subscribed to the weather 94043 topic. And I will get notified along with all other devices subscribed to that topic. So there's no database required. Go ahead and throw it out. Oh, uh, as long as you weren't using it for anything else, I guess. I probably should have mentioned that earlier. GCM has other useful features too, like upstream messaging, which allows your app to communicate to your server through GCM. This can be helpful in cases where you might want some lightweight communication from your clients to your server, but don't feel like dealing with the hassle of setting up and maintaining a full-blown server open to the entire world. Or read receipts, where in some, but not all, situations, you can be notified that a user has received your message, something you can't normally do through APNS alone. Oh, and in case you're wondering, all this is free, as in please send us zero dollars, uh, and it's using much of the same infrastructure that Google uses for its own apps, so it'll probably scale for yours. So there's a lot to learn when it comes to notifications, and I encourage you to get started here with our Google Cloud Messaging documentation for iOS. We also have a couple of sample applications for you to look at. There's Friendly Ping, our cross-platform chat app powered entirely through Google Cloud Messaging, as well as the GCM Playground, which lets you easily experiment with sending calls through the GCM service. And keep watching Route 85. Maybe you'll see another Google Cloud Messaging video pop up in the future. If only we had, we had some way of letting you know when that happened. Well, I'm stumped. So what if I told you there was a way you could compress nearly any stream of data by a factor of 10x or more? Wouldn't that be something you'd be interested in? Yeah, I thought so. Let's find out more on this episode of Route 85. So I want you to take a look at this array of numbers here. Imagine that we wanted to send this array of integers from a server to your user's device. Looks like just a bunch of random numbers, right? Well, that word random is actually the key to compressing these in an incredibly efficient manner. As you probably know, a random number generator isn't truly random. Supply a random number generator with the same seed and you'll get the same results out every time. And we can take advantage of that fact to recreate that list of integers using a random number generator. You see, all I need to do to regenerate that array on a device is to supply three parameters. The seed for an agreed upon random number generator, an upper bound to apply to these results, and the length of the list. I simply supply those numbers to a method that looks a little like this and I can recreate that original number stream. Just like that, I've built my array of 30 integers using just two integers and an int 32. That's a 92% compression rate. Now granted, finding that initial seed did take some work, but you know what, that work can happen in the cloud, so it doesn't really matter. What's important is that on the device, I'm able to decompress that number stream in order and time. 
And then of course, once you start looking around, you can see that there's a ton of data you can compress this way. I mean, need to compress a text string? Well, what's a string but a stream of encoded integers? Once I have my stream of integers, I simply figure out what seed I need to generate them, and voila, I've compressed my string down into just three numbers. It's a pretty amazing savings, right? Anybody with the username of stidjexmissdizixgudquibpubpa will be singing your praises in their reviews. And uh, my gosh, if you think about it, an image is really just a stream of numbers broken out into uh, several channels. Take a look at this image here, and you can see how, using our random number generator, I've been able to replace it with just three sets of integers for the red, green, and blue channels, respectively. Now, once again, finding the right seed can take some time, and I haven't found the perfect seed just yet. So if you look at the results carefully, you can see that this is not quite a lossless compression scheme. But I think you'll agree that for this kind of savings, these trade-offs just might be worth it. Anyway, I hope you consider using this technique the next time you have data that needs to be compressed. Remember, the more efficient you are with your user's data, the more they'll love you. Thanks again for watching. Be sure to check out other episodes of Route 85. And uh, remember that, as my coworkers on the Android team like to say, perf matters. All right, thanks guys. I think we're done. Uh, who let him into the studio again? I just, I couldn't say no to Elijah Wood. But that's... Elijah Wood. People love to use different mobile devices in different ways that suit their situation and lifestyle. Michael uses a phone to play games on the go, while Tony enjoys using a large tablet as he relaxes on the sofa. And Jen carries a small tablet in her purse for reading on the bus. But they all want to use your app on the devices they prefer, so you'll want to make sure they each have a great experience, regardless of screen size, OS version, and the features of the app they use the most. It can be taxing to test each one of these situations so that all your users can be happy. We know you'd rather not have to buy and store stacks of devices and test your app in all these circumstances. That's why we built Firebase Test Lab for Android to make it easy and affordable for you to test your app with a variety of devices and be sure it works great for all your users. Our device lab, hosted in the cloud, offers a variety of physical devices ready to test your app. The selection of devices is always growing, so your tests will stay current with the latest hardware and operating systems. The easiest way to use Firebase Test Lab is to run a robo-test. This is an intelligent, automated test that crawls your app to discover and exercise its features. You won't need to write any additional code to make use of a robo-test. For more advanced testing, you can also script the interactions with your app to simulate specific use cases and verify that everything works as expected. Test results include a detailed report for each device used, including screenshots, device logs, and any crashes that may have occurred during the test. This allows you to verify that your app is working correctly on the variety of devices and configurations you selected. It's easy to make Firebase Test Lab a part of your daily development routine, and we have multiple ways to help you test regularly and spot errors early. First, you can use the Firebase console to upload and test your app. There is also a command line interface for testing with continuous integration servers, so you can automatically test every build. During Android development, you can deploy your app directly to Firebase Test Lab using Android Studio 2.0. And finally, in the Play Store Developer Console, there is a special automated launch test that will run for Android apps published to an alpha or beta channel. To get started using Firebase Test Lab and learn how to regularly test your app on different devices and configurations, you can start with the documentation available right here. Happy testing! Welcome to the Googleplex. This is an incredible place with lots of great stuff being worked on every single day. Before I worked here, I always wondered what it would be like to come to the Googleplex, meet up with a Googler, and have coffee with them, and just chat about what they do, how they do it, and why they do it. And today we're going to do exactly that. Welcome to Coffee with a Googler. I'm Lawrence Moroni, and I'm here in New York City to meet with Roman Nurek. And Roman Nurek is one of our material design gurus here at Google. So material design, tell me, what, what's it all about? Oh, Lawrence, what is material design? Um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to explain. There's actually a, a video uh, okay. with a bunch of the original designers that created material design, and they get asked the same question, and they don't know how to answer it. <laughs> um, it, is a, it is a complex kind of thing. There's a lot of things going on. 
Um, I guess at the most basic level, it's it's a design language, okay. it's a design system. Um, it's it covers visual interaction and motion design. I feel like most design systems, design languages, are treated as just visual languages. Like right. here are the colors you should use and so on. But okay. you know, Material is is much more than that. It it really kind of covers the the model, the underlying physical model of a UI. Okay. So it basically tries to establish. This, this physical environment within which your apps should live, on a phone, on a tablet, on a computer, um, basically any sort of screen. Um, and then it, it basically establishes this physical environment in a set of basic rules and principles. Um, and I like to think of it along these kind of four basic axes or four basic principles. And that's uh, tangible surfaces, or okay. kind of the material metaphor. Okay. We could talk about what material is at some point. Um, also, bold graphic design, this idea that you know, we, should, we should take some of the best design ideas from the print world and see how that can help us you know, make really great apps on, you know, on digital devices. Right. Right. Um, and the third is meaningful motion, basically how all these things, how um, the surfaces and the, the ink on that surface, the, the, the graphic design stuff, how that all kind of you know moves in a consistent way mm -hmm. to help communicate what's going on, and the fourth thing, which is to me one of the most important things, is um, is adaptive design, which is how can we take all these these first three things and make sure that they work consistently and coherently across different devices, phones, okay. tablets, and everything else. Now you have a video, right, of some really good examples yeah. of material design we do. being used. So shall we shall we roll that? Let's roll it. Some pretty excellent examples yeah. there, but it's like, you know, how does somebody reach that level? For someone like me, I'm a developer, and my design skills are non-existent. So if I if I want to become somebody who can build apps with those kind of design, how, how do I get started? And well, how do it, I learn this stuff? It's a it's a great question. Um, I think first of all, I just want to, I guess, recognize some of those apps are they're doing amazing jobs, and they have they have yeah. large teams. They, some of them actually have very small teams. Uh, some of those apps are. You know, created by one person. Mm -hmm. So you can absolutely reach that level of quality from these amazing showcase apps, regardless of your team size. Okay. Um, but I'd say for the developers and designers out there that are just getting started, there are a lot of great resources out there. Um, you know, there's a there's a great Udacity course that okay. uh, me, uh, Nick Butcher, um, also from uh, from Google team here, um, and James Williams from Udacity put together. Um, and that's available at udacity.com slash Google. Right. Um, and there's also a bunch of amazing resources on design.google.com, uh, which will kind of tell you about how to come to Android if you're doing iOS stuff, okay. for example, or how to kind of get started understanding what material design is. There's obviously the, the entire material design guidelines are there. Okay. So um, I'd say that the, the first thing, the, the Udacity uh, course is probably the the best kind of first step in getting started. Um, but there's there's a whole lot of resources okay. out there. And we link to others from the Udacity okay. course. And Udacity courses, if you're not familiar with them, they are very Socratic in how they teach, right? It's it's short videos and then challenging you to do something, and then a short video and then getting you to do something. And it's a good way that someone can incrementally learn rather than be thrown into like a huge design doc or something yes. like that, right? So Yeah, it's it's definitely there's a very clear progression. We specifically design that course so that you can kind of start with some of the basics, the most elementary basic things about a screen, like what is a pixel, mm -hmm. what is a density independent pixel, and then you kind of ramp all the way up to how do I make everything work on phones, tablets, and so on. Right, and I have to assume that a design course is well designed, right? Uh, we, have some, <laughs> we have some very nice color choices in our, in our slides or our tablet drawings, so cool. hopefully. So, 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 so back to material design again, it's like why, why material? What is it that... So material goes back to that first principle. Right. Um, so the, this idea of 
uh, tangible surfaces. This idea that you know everything on a you know on on your screen and your device exists on a on a surface. Mm -hmm. uh, we like to think of them as pieces of paper. Um, so basically, you can think of um, a basically a sheet of material or um, the word material representing one of those pieces of paper. And the reason we don't just call it paper is because it actually is, it's a lot more than just paper. In the real world, paper, you know, once you rip it up, you can't really just, you know, put it back together and paper can't go from being, you know, a circle to a square or to a mm -hmm. rectangle. Um, and so we like to think of our digital pieces of material or sheets of material um, as kind of a, a smarter paper, a more kind of, you know, a still a constrained paper. You can't just do anything. You can't it can't just you know do all sorts of crazy things, but it is a physical thing that exists inside of this kind of you know environment. This this right. kind of like faux environment, but it it is something that that has a lot of thought put into it. And so the word material, you know, to me really means the the sheets of paper that everything in this world exists on. But for me, the the main thing you know to think about the the reason that motion is so important in material design is that. You know, motion should always have meaning. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, try not to, you know, like, you know, just do a, like a flip of a button or like a double rotation or something just to kind of draw attention. Every, every time something moves, it attracts our attention. And so it needs to be really thoughtful and, and really kind of carefully planned out. And so in material, we use motion or we kind of use just enough motion to convey the change in some object's state or, you know, try to get a little bit of attention. But you know, just enough motion, not too little, not too much. I understand Android Studio has some templates to allow developers to at least get started with uh, building material design into apps. Absolutely. Perhaps. So one of the one, one of my philosophies for a long time has been, you know, we can write about, you know, uh, material design. We can write about a thing. Um, mm -hmm. We can make suggestions about that thing, and we can try to teach people about that thing. But one of the best ways to get, you know, the thing into people's hands. Uh, you know, in this case, material design is to actually just you know build it into the tools. Just mm -hmm. make sure that you know, as a developer that's just getting started, even just on Android, um, if I just go to File, New Project, or New App, right, I should be able to get the latest and greatest. Mm -hmm. And so, in you know, in Android Studio now, we're actually seeing um, new templates uh, for material design. So you could do File, New Project, and then your default activity templates are going to come with material design in them. Okay. So it's going to use the material theme. Um, it's going to use some of the, some of the latest uh, support libraries for material design. So things like the Android Design Support Library, things like AppCompat. Cool. And so you're, you're just going to get a lot of great stuff for free right off the nice. bat. Nice. So for someone like me, I'm, I'm a coder, not a <laughs> designer. And so, but, so I can use Android Studio, get the, the, effectively the scaffolding done for me in exactly. these templates and then learn from something like the Udacity course. Exactly. I, I definitely suggest, you know, even before you do the Udacity course, file new project, right? Just look yeah. around the code, um, see what you get. Um, I think that, that's a great way to get started. I always valued, as, as a kid, and you know, growing up learning programming and stuff, I always valued experimentation. Mm -hmm. So definitely experiment with that. Um, but as soon as you kind of you know, uh, you know, hit some sort of, you know, if, you, if you hit an obstacle or something, Obviously, take a look at the guide and the reference and all that, but the Udacity course is a great way to say, you know what, let me just kind of see what Google thinks is the right way to kind of approach okay. understanding this, this uh, okay. system. Awesome. Well, thanks, Roman. This, this has been a whole lot of fun, and I've learned more about material design <laughs> in the last five minutes than I'd had in, in a year beforehand. So This is fun. I, I, so I, can, I can always talk about this stuff. So, <laughs> They've um, told me that about you. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is my favorite thing to talk about. <laughs> it's cool. It's been I'm, awesome. Lawrence. And thanks. I'm going to check out that Udacity course, and I recommend that you do so too. And if you're an Android developer, take a look at those templates. If you have any questions for me about this, or if you have any questions for Roman about material design, or other aspects of building for material design, just please drop us a line in the comments below. Thank you for watching this episode of Coffee with a Googler. Uh, for more great episodes of Coffee with a Googler and for more great videos on developer topics, please tune to the Google Developers channel on YouTube. Thank you. Last episode, we used a decision tree as our classifier. Today, we'll add code to visualize it so we can see how it works under the hood. There are many types of classifiers you may have heard of before, things like neural nets or support vector machines. So why did we use a decision tree to start? Well, they have a very unique property. They're easy to read and understand. 
In fact, they're one of the few models that are interpretable where you can understand exactly why the classifier makes a decision. That's amazingly useful in practice. To get started, I'll introduce you to a real data set we'll work with today. It's called IRIS. IRIS is a classic machine learning problem. In it, you want to identify what type of flower you have based on different measurements, like the length and width of the petal. The data set includes three different types of flowers. They're all species of iris, Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica. Scrolling down, you can see we're given 50 examples of each type, so 150 examples total. Notice there are four features that are used to describe each example. These are the length and width of the sepal and petal. And just like in our apples and oranges problem, the first four columns give the features, and the last column gives the labels, which is the type of flower in each row. Our goal is to use this data set to train a classifier. Then we can use that classifier to predict what species of flower we have if we're given a new flower that we've never seen before. Knowing how to work with an existing data set is a good skill, so let's import Iris into Scikit-Learn and see what it looks like in code. Conveniently, the friendly folks at Scikit provided a bunch of sample data sets, including Iris, as well as utilities to make them easy to import. We can import Iris into our code like this. The data set includes both the table from Wikipedia as well as some metadata. The metadata tells you the names of the features and the names of different types of flowers. The features and examples themselves are contained in the data variable. For example, if I print out the first entry, you can see the measurements for this flower. These index to the feature names, so the first value refers to the sepal length and the second to sepal width, and so on. The target variable contains the labels. Likewise, these index to the target names. Let's print out the first one. A label of zero means it's a setosa. If you look at the table from Wikipedia, you'll notice that we just printed out the first row. Now, both the data and target variables have 150 entries. If you want, you can iterate over them to print out the entire data set like this. Now that we know how to work with the data set, we're ready to train a classifier. But before we do that, first we need to split up the data. I'm going to remove several of the examples and put them aside for later. We'll call the examples I'm putting aside our testing data. We'll keep these separate from our training data. And later on, we'll use our testing examples to test how accurate the classifier is on data it's never seen before. Testing is actually a really important part of doing machine learning well in practice, and we'll cover it in more detail in a future episode. Just for this exercise, I'll remove one example of each type of flower. And as it happens, the data set is ordered so the first setosa is at index 0, and the first versicolor is at 50, and so on. The syntax looks a little bit complicated, but all I'm doing is removing three entries from the data and target variables. Then I'll create two new sets of variables, one for training and one for testing. Training will have the majority of our data, and testing will have just the examples I removed. Now, just as before, we can create a decision tree classifier and train it on our training data. Before we visualize it, let's use the tree to classify our testing data. We know we have one flower of each type, and we can print out the labels we expect. Now let's see what the tree predicts. We'll give it the features for our testing data, and we'll get back labels. You can see the predicted labels match our testing data. That means it got them all right. Now keep in mind this was a very simple test, and we'll go into more detail down the road. Now let's visualize the tree so we can see how the classifier works. To do that, I'm going to copy-paste some code in from Scikit's tutorials. And because this code is for visualization and not machine learning concepts, I won't cover the details here. Note that I'm combining the code from these two examples to create an easy-to-read PDF. I can run our script and open up the PDF, and we can see the tree. To use it to classify data, you start by reading from the top. Each node asks a yes or no question about one of the features. For example, this node asks if the petal width is less than 0.8 centimeters. If it's true for the example you're classifying, go left. Otherwise, go right. Now let's use this tree to classify an example from our testing data. Here are the features and label for our first testing flower. Remember, you can find the feature names by looking at the metadata. We know this flower is a setosa, so let's see what the tree predicts. I'll resize the windows to make this easier to see. And the first question the tree asks is whether the petal width is less than 0.8 centimeters. That's the fourth feature. The answer is true, so we proceed left. At this point, we're already at a leaf node. There are no other questions to ask, so the tree gives us a prediction, setosa, and it's right. Notice the label is zero, which indexes to that type of flower. 
Now let's try our second testing example. This one is a versicolor. Let's see what the tree predicts. Again, we read from the top, and this time the petal width is greater than 0.8 centimeters. The answer to the tree's question is false, so we go right. The next question the tree asks is whether the petal width is less than 1.75. It's trying to narrow it down. That's true, so we go left. Now it asks if the petal length is less than 4.95. That's true, so we go left again. And finally, the tree asks if the petal width is less than 1.65. That's true, so left it is. And now we have our prediction. It's a versicolor, and that's right again. You can try the last one on your own as an exercise. And remember, the way we're using the tree is the same way it works in code. So that's how you quickly visualize and read a decision tree. There's a lot more to learn here, especially how they're built automatically from examples. We'll get to that in a future episode, but for now, let's close with an essential point. Every question the tree asks must be about one of your features. That means the better your features are, the better a tree you can build. And in the next episode, we'll start looking at what makes a good feature. Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Pop quiz, hotshot. You've got 48 milliseconds of work to do, but only 16 milliseconds per frame to get it done. What do you do? My name is Cole McCandless, and while threading on Android can help cure your performance woes, it can also end up creating some huge problems, if you don't understand how it's all working under the hood. So let's take a few minutes and make sure we're all on the same page. <laughs> See, a thread by default does three things. It starts, it does some works, and as soon as that work is done, it terminates. Now, by itself, that's not too useful. Instead, what you want is a thread that sticks around for a while so you can feed it packets of work to operate on. But to do that, you need a little more scaffolding. First, since threads die when they run out of work, you need to have some sort of loop running on the thread to keep it alive. Just make sure to put it in an exit condition so you can terminate that loop later. In addition, you'll need some sort of queue that the loop can pull blocks of work from to execute on. And of course, you'll need some other thread that creates work packets and pushes them into the queue for execution. Now, if you've ever tried to write this setup yourself, you know it gets a little gnarly to get all of that machinery working correctly. Thankfully though, Android has a set of classes to do all that for you. For example, the looper class will keep the thread alive and pop work off a queue to execute on. And rather than always inserting work at the end of that queue, the handler class gives you the control to push work at the head, the tail, or set a time-based delay that'll keep some work from being processed until that time has passed. And don't forget that units of work in Android are explicitly defined as intents or runnables or messages, depending on who's issuing them and who's consuming them. And then the combination of all these things together is called a handler thread, which lets this look like this. Yeah! Pretty nifty, huh? So let's look at how you can use this in your application. When the user launches your app, Android creates its own Linux process. Alongside with this, the system creates a thread of execution for your application called the main thread, which at its core is just a handler thread. This main thread handles processing of events from all over your app. Uh, for example, callbacks associated with lifecycle information, or callbacks from input events, or even events that are coming from other applications. And most important is that these callbacks can trigger other work that runs on the thread too, like making a change to the UI will create work packets that allow the UI to be redrawn. Basically, this means that any block of code your app wants to run has to be pushed into a work queue and then serviced on the main thread. The takeaway here is that with so much work happening on the main thread, it makes a lot of sense to offload longer work to other threads as to not disturb the UI system from its rendering duties. And this is how the entirety of Android's threading model works. Now, lots of packages of work being passed around between threads and worked on as needed. So, with all this in mind, some of Android's threading classes make a little bit more sense. Uh, see, each threaded class is intended for a specific type of threading work, so picking the right one for your needs is really important. Uh, for example, the async task class is ideal for helping you get work on and off the UI thread in the right way. Handler threads are great when you need a dedicated thread for callbacks to land on, and thread pools work best when you can break your work up into really small packets and then toss them to a bunch of waiting threads. And intense services are really ideal for background tasks or when you need to get intent work off the UI thread. And like everything else, there's not a silver bullet here, but knowing which primitive is best for what situation can save you a lot of headaches. 
Now, if you ever want more insight into how your app is leveraging threading, make sure you spend some time getting comfortable with SysTrace. It's a fancy tool that'll school you on how all that mumbo jumbo is working underneath the hood. And if you're looking to get schooled more, make sure you check out the rest of Android Performance Patterns videos. And don't forget to join our Google Plus community for more tips and tricks on threading. So keep calm, profile your code, and always remember, perf matters. Hey there, Polycasters, Rob here. Welcome back to the show. Uh, as we've been working on Polymer, one of the probably biggest requests that comes in from developers is, when are we going to get a CDN for Polymer and for web components? Because it's kind of a pain in the butt every time you want to sort of like hack on an idea and you've got to use Bower and install a bunch of packages and wait for everything to download just so you can, you know, play with stuff. So recently, the Polymer team has put out a brand new project, which is called Polygit. It is a development CDN, which I'll, I'll talk about what that word means uh, in just a second. Uh, but basically, it is a CDN that includes Polymer, all the Polymer elements, and the Web Components polyfill. So if you want to hack around using something like JSBin and Polymer, you can totally do that. So if you go to the website polygit.org, you see that it bills itself as the Polymer magic server. And what it's actually doing under the hood is it's just using GitHub's raw Git CDN and extracting things from there and pulling them into you know, JSBin or, or wherever you want to use the CDN. So what I want to do here is just sort of like show you some examples of how you can use the CDN, how you can configure it to actually pull in your own packages as well, and, uh, and basically just get hacking really quick. So, uh, over on jsbin.com, I've already set up this little sample bin. And the main thing to notice here is I'm using this base tag right here. And if you're not familiar with a base tag, uh, in HTML, a base tag or a base element, it just allows you to set a URL. And then any sort of subsequent URLs that you use, like for script tags or imports, they will all be relative to that base. So what we're saying here is we want the base URL to be polygit.org slash components. This components directory is where Polymer and all the Polymer elements and all that good stuff lives. And from here on out, if we have any relative URLs, it'll just pull stuff from, from that directory. So I'm pulling in web components JS. It's coming from that directory. I can import polymer.html. That'll also come from that directory. And so since we've got all this working off of our CDN, now we can actually sit here if we want, and we can just create our own Polymer element right on JSBin. So I'm going to do that right out of DOM module here. I'll give it an ID of like X foo. And I'll give it a template that just says like, hello from X foo. And I'll also give it a little script tag. And inside of here, we will call the Polymer constructor. And we're going to say it is an X foo element. And then the last thing we want to do is we want to just make sure that we use our xfoo tag somewhere in the page. And now you can see it showing up over there in our output. So this is really great if you're you know, hanging out on the Polymer Slack channel, you, you run into a bug or some issue, and you're not quite sure how to explain it to folks. You can just go throw together a JS bin using polygit and then share that JS bin with people so they can help you get unstuck. Now, I also mentioned that all the Polymer elements that we built are included in this CDN as well. So what you can also do if you find maybe a, a bug or an issue with something like paper tabs is you can go over here and you can just write an HTML import for paper tabs. So instead of just Polymer, I'll also pull in paper tabs. And then you can just start using that element in your page here. So I'll say I want a set of paper tabs. And then inside of here, I will write out maybe like two or three paper tabs. So we'll say this first tab is called foo. Second one is going to be called bar. And the last one will be baz. Foo bar baz. And there we go. Now over here in our output, I've got these three paper tabs working just as I was expecting. And you know, if I had some issue, I could then take this. I could save this JS bin. I could go file a GitHub issue and, and point the engineer at this particular JS bin. And that way, it's going to help them triage that issue a lot faster and help them debug the actual uh, problem that you're running into and hopefully get things fixed. Now, one of the coolest things about Polygit is that it is configurable. So not only uh, does it pull in Polymer and the elements that that team has created, but you can add your own GitHub repos to it as well. So if you go back to the polygit.org website, you scroll down here to the bottom, you can see that there is this sort of uh, interesting configuration syntax. 
And it might look a little weird when you first see it. It took me a few times kind of working through it to understand what it's doing. Uh, but basically, what you want to do is when you are defining that base URL, you can configure it by saying, oh, I would also like to include this component. And this component might live like inside of some particular org. And maybe you want a particular version, like version 1.2.3. Or maybe you want a branch, right? Maybe you want like the, the master branch. That's some good handwriting right there. Uh, or maybe you want just the, the latest tag. So if you include an asterisk, instead of pulling a particular version or a branch, it'll just give you whatever the latest tag happens to be. So to show you an example of that, I've uh, again got a little JS bin here. And I'm just going to paste in a better URL here. So what I've done is I've configured Polygit to pull in two additional dependencies. Uh, the first is the marked markdown JS library, which is in the chjj org on GitHub. And I've told it to grab the latest tag. Now I've also told it to pull in the mark dash down element, which is something that I wrote myself that lives in the Rob Dodson org on GitHub. And again, I've just told it to pull in the latest tag there. So now both of those are available in that CDN components directory. So I can just go ahead and write an HTML import to pull in the markdown element. And then over in my body, I can just start using it. So I can have a markdown tag. And we'll just drop in like a hello world for the header there. And we can see we're getting this sort of like huge H1 rendering over there in the output. So if you're working on an element or a project or something like that, and you want to show that to folks on JSBin, you can absolutely do that uh, using Polygit as well. Uh, the one caveat there is that it has to have been published for at least one hour for it to be picked up by the RawGit uh, caching CDN. Um, but once it's been published for about an hour, it should be available to you on Polygit. Now, the, the last thing I want to mention here is at the very beginning of the show, we said that this is a sort of development time CDN. And what I mean by that is it's not a CDN that you want to use for production. And the reason is because we're not doing any sort of like vulcanization or anything like that uh, to optimize the elements that we're sending down. Instead, you're getting an individual dependency for everything that you import, which is actually pretty expensive in terms of HTTP requests. So it's great for uh, development time. It's great for hacking on ideas. But when you get to the point where you want to launch something into production, you still want to use a package manager like Bower. You still want to use a process like Vulcanize to make sure uh, you're sending down the absolute smallest payload possible. But you know, if, you, if you just want to mess around with some ideas, it's perfect for that. So that about covers it for today. If you have any questions, please leave them for me down in the comments. Uh, or you can always hit me up on a social network of your choosing at hashtag AskPolymer. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. There's something really satisfying about getting your app to look great on your device. But just because there's over 11,000 other Android devices out there doesn't mean you need to build 11,000 other layouts to make a great looking app, not if you're using responsive UI principles. You may have noticed that I'm not Ian or Joanna. My name is Mike Denny, a design advocate on the Google Design team. First things first, thinking about specific phones and tablets is only going to get you into trouble. There's a wide spectrum of devices and not that much difference between the largest phone and the smallest tablet. Instead, think more generally about how much space you have to work with. This can come in three different flavors, width, height, and smallest width. Width is super important and should be the basis for breakpoints in designing and building your UI. For example, 600 dp in width is the first point where you could consider having a side-by-side -side summary and detail level view any lower, and you won't be giving each level a full attention it deserves. Height is less common when designing a responsive UI, but keep in mind that something like a vertically scrolling container is going to be difficult to use if you can only see one or two elements at a time due to a constrained height. Smallest width, unlike height or width, is designed to be rotation insensitive, as it's just the smaller of the two values. This gives you a better idea of how much space is available and is an easy way to ensure that your app remains consistent as the device is rotated. You don't want to force your user to relearn your navigation structure every time they rotate their device. This is particularly important in the multi-window world. 
When your app is resized, your width, height, and smallest width are going to be updated. You might be going from full screen on a tablet down to what amounts to a portrait-oriented phone worth of space. Here's where a good responsive UI can make for a smooth transition. There are a number of common patterns you might consider when building that responsive UI, such as revealing previously hidden content as the screen size grows, transforming your navigation pattern or switching from a list to a grid, dividing your screen into multiple sections side by side, reflowing specific elements, expanding the size or margins of individual elements, or even changing the position of specific elements like a floating action button. Check out the blog post for more details on designing a responsive UI and specific patterns you can use to build better apps. Hey there, Polycasters. Rob here. So before coming into the studio, we tweeted out a question to see what folks wanted to see in the next episode of Polycast. And a lot of folks wrote in and said they wanted to know how to lazy load Polymer elements to improve the performance of their apps. So that's exactly what we're going to cover today. Now, to do that, we're going to start off over here at the Polymer docs. And we're going to go down to the API reference. And some folks might not even realize that we, we have an API reference, but it's, it's kind of hidden down here in the sidebar for the documentation. You can go click on that. And that's going to take you to this sort of uh, kind of classic Polymer doc layout, if, if you've seen this before on other elements. And this is where you can find all of the properties and methods of the Polymer object itself. So a lot of really cool stuff inside of here. This is also where, for instance, like the Polymer templatizer documentation is. So if you wanted to create your own uh, version of DOM if or DOM repeat, you could use templatizer to do that. Just a helpful tidbit there. But what we're interested in here is this Polymer base object. And Polymer base is sort of the base prototype for all Polymer elements. And it's where we hide interesting like methods and properties and stuff like that. The one I'm into is called import href down here. We can hit the embiggen button to make it larger. And so what import href is going to do, it's going to give us the ability to dynamically load an HTML import at runtime. It's got a few arguments that it takes. The first argument is we're going to give it an href, so basically just a path to some component or some uh, HTML import that you want to pull in at runtime. And then it wants callbacks for on success, on error. And lastly, it takes an option, which specifies whether or not you want the link tag to have an async attribute on it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use import href, and I'm going to build sort of a sample application. This is the app that I have thrown together. It is called Polymeal. It's a social network for foodies. And I guess people that like uh, stir fry, because um, there's a lot of pictures of stir fry. And uh, you can either go to the sort of the, the browse section, and you see here that I've got all sorts of yummy photos, or you could go to the activity feed, and you could see maybe like I'd be posting status updates from all the cool, awesome restaurants that I am eating at, right? Now, the main thing to take away from this is that these two sections have very, very different content, right? This one is, is a whole bunch of cards with some paper buttons on it. Right? And this activity feed is instead just sort of these like little, little status blurb things. So there's no reason to load all of this, uh, all these card elements if the user is just starting off in the activity feed. Right? It would just make more sense to load that at runtime to kind of like uh, reduce the bandwidth for our total application. So to do that, we're going to use import href over here in our code editor. So this is my X app element that I have started off with. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have an X app element. Inside of XAP, I will chuck in a little iron pages here. And inside of uh, iron pages, we'll have sections for the different bits of our app that we are interested in. So I've got a browse section and an activity section. And we've also got the page.js router loaded into XAP as well. So if we go down to the JavaScript definition, we can see that I've got kind of a, a basic route stubbed out. And what I want to do is, when the route changes to either the browse section or the activity section, I'm going to call Polymer's import href method, load in my element definition. Once that's loaded in, I will then tell Iron Pages to switch over to that section. Now, the first thing I want to do, though, since we're starting off just at like slash, uh, right now what we're doing is we're actually just loading a shell that looks kind of like this, right? We don't have, uh, you know, we're not hitting either the browse or the activity section, so the users kind of got, you know, nothing to look at. So we'll start off by redirecting them, page redirect over to the Browse section. So this way, we just have kind of like a nice starting point. I'm going to write another handler for Browse, so page slash Browse. And you'll notice here that I'm using uh, ES6 fat arrow functions. That just makes it a little bit 
easier to, uh, to deal with the scoping of the this value inside of these handlers. So I'll say uh, page.browse. And what I first want to do is see if the element has already been loaded. Has this page been loaded before? Because if it has, there's no reason to import it again. So we'll call Polymer's is instance method. And this is something that I don't even think it's, it's well documented. It might seriously not even exist anywhere in our docs. But I spoke with our tech writer. This is a thing. You can use it to sort of check to see if an element is an upgraded Polymer element. So because both our browse element and our activity element have IDs, we can reference them using automatic node finding. And we could say this.$sign.browse. So if this is already a Polymer element, let's just go ahead and return. No reason to do anything. No, no importing or anything like that is needed. Uh, but we will set the selected value to browse. And then what that's going to do is that's going to tell our iron pages up here to switch to that section. So you can see we're, we're binding its selected attribute to that property. OK? Now, if the element has not been loaded, if it hasn't been upgraded yet, now we're going to import its definition. So we'll call uh, polymer.base.importhref. And we're going to pass it a path to the HTML import for the browse section that we want to load. So elements slash xbrowse slash xbrowse.html. And then we'll give it a success handler to run. So we're going to say, all right, cool, the element loaded in. Let's now set the selected state to browse. That'll tell Iron Pages to update. And now we can return, exit our, our route here. We should be good to go. If we go back and we look at our application now and we refresh the page, it should redirect to the Browse section, and it should start loading in all of those cards. Awesome, right? Uh, now we need to do the same thing for the Activity section. So I can just grab this entire route right here and uh, do, some, do some dangerous copy and paste work here. We're just going to go through, and any place where it says Browse, we'll just flip it out for Activity. Activity. Thank you, spell check. So when we go to slash Activity, we're going to check to see if the activity element is upgraded. If it is, return. If it's not, import it. Let's go give that a look. So refresh the page. And we see our browse section looking good. We go to the activity section. And boom, we got our status feed showing up right there. Now, there's still a lot of unanswered questions to this. I kind of showed you the, the quick and dirty version of using import href. But what we didn't talk about was, you know, do we need to vulcanize these things into different bundles? And if so, how do we exclude common dependencies? Or can we just use HTTP2 to maybe like server push all the things or multiplex stream all of our dependencies? So there's still a lot of things that uh, remain to be worked out. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about those in an upcoming episode of Polymer. But today, for what we've done here, if you have any questions, please leave them for me down in the comments. Otherwise, you can always ping me on a social network of your choosing at hashtag AskPolymer. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Otherwise, you can ping me on a social network at to I'll keep all the, the fun stuff up here, top two thirds of the screen. We all know from experience that people love to share things about themselves, such as photos, videos, and GIFs that express their feelings. So what do you do to let them store and share these files through your app? That's where Firebase Storage can help. Our storage API lets you upload your users' files to our cloud so they can be shared with anyone else. And if you have specific rules for sharing files with certain users, you can protect this content for users logged in with Firebase authentication. Security, of course, is our first concern. All transfers are performed over a secure connection. Also, all transfers with our API are robust and will automatically resume in case the connection is broken. This is essential for transferring large files over slow or unreliable mobile connections. And finally, our storage, backed by Google Cloud Storage, scales to petabytes. That's billions of photos to meet your app's needs, so you will never be out of space when you need it. So give your users space to share their lives with Firebase Storage, available right now for iOS, Android, and web applications. And to learn more about Firebase Storage, check out the documentation available right here. Let's be honest, you're an awesome engineer with an awesome app and you are using threading to the max. Sadly though, managing all those individual threads and assigning work between them is causing you to lose your hair. 
My name is Colt McCandless, and please don't join the bald club. Instead, use the thread pools class, which is an ideal primitive for breaking up lots of work into little buckets. See, historically, it was commonplace that applications would use a dedicated thread model. Uh, that is, one thread that only deals with database rights, while a separate thread only handles streaming of music, and a third one only handles networking. Uh, these setups are okay because the amount of work per thread isn't that large, and it's okay to handle this work in sequential order. But there reaches a point where this model starts to fall over. Uh, say, for example, that you've got 40 bitmaps to decode, and each decode takes like four milliseconds or something. Uh, putting all of this work on a single dedicated thread is a bad idea, since it'll take 80 milliseconds total to get all that work done in a sequential fashion. On the other hand, if you created 10 threads and let each one decode four bitmaps, then you'd end up only taking 16 milliseconds total. But then, of course, you run into the problem of how to properly pass the work around between those threads, schedule that work, and then managing of those threads. Uh, yeah. Before you start stressing out about writing all that code, don't worry. This is exactly what thread pool executor primitive is for. Uh, basically, this class will just let you spin up a number of threads and toss blocks of work to execute on it. Thread pool executor handles all of the heavy lifting of spinning up the threads, load balancing work across those threads, and even killing those threads when they have been idle for a while. Uh, basically, it handles all the heavy lifting of super parallel processing on your behalf. All you have to do is split up the work. But there's a small caveat here. How many threads should your thread pool have? I mean, technically speaking, you have the ability to create as many threads as you want, but that's not ideal. See, CPUs can only execute a certain number of threads in parallel. Once you get above that number, then the CPU has to start deciding which threads get the next free block of processor time based on how important they are. Which means that if you keep eventually adding threads, you'll hit a break-even point where your computation isn't getting any faster, even though the number of threads that you have has increased significantly. And it's also important to note that each of these threads aren't free. Uh, each thread costs you about 64k of memory in minimum, and that adds up quickly, especially in situations where the call stacks can start growing pretty large. As such, your app needs to find a sweet spot between the number of cores and the point of diminishing return with the number of threads. Thankfully, once again, the thread pool executor class has got you covered. When creating your thread pool, you can specify the number of initial threads and the number of maximum threads. As the workload in the thread pool changes, it'll scale the number of alive threads to match. Oh, and a uh, quick note, the value returned from get available processors may not reflect the number of physical cores in the device. Now, see, some devices have CPUs that will deactivate one or more cores depending on the system load to save battery. So if your device has two CPUs, but one of them is asleep, this value could return one. And of course, thread pools won't solve all of your threading problems. As mentioned earlier, unless you're dealing with lots and lots of work packets all the time, this thing's kind of overkill. It's best to use things like handler threads or async task loaders for specific types of work blocks and only throw the massive computing problems at the thread pool. And for you power users out there, remember that render script might be a better alternative to large scale parallel work on Android devices, but that's a whole separate set of videos that we haven't gotten into yet. And don't forget that SysTrace is an amazingly powerful tool that lets you visualize how work is flowing through the threads in your application. It's a great way to validate that things are working as intended and also see all the other crazy threads that are being worked on by other parts of your app. And that's the trick with performance, isn't it? I mean, you can make assumptions, but things don't always work the way you think, which is why you need to check out the rest of the Android performance patterns videos. And don't forget to join our Google Plus community to ask a lot of hard threading questions as well. So keep calm, profile your code, and always remember, perf matters. So service workers are powerful for offline caching, but they're also really good for giving you um, instant loading performance benefits when it comes to repeat visits. Yep. Right. And you can achieve that using an application shell architecture. Yeah. Now, so that's kind of the idea of it's kind of separating content from the actual visual UI. So in my head, it's kind of like native apps. You always have the banner. You've got the navigation drawer at the side. You yeah. might have some other bits. 
that could be common through like 90% of your app. Yeah. You always want it there. So when we talk about the shell, we're talking about the HTML, the CSS, and the JavaScript that's making up the bulk of your UI. Yeah. Stuff exactly. that, you know, if you cache that, you can still just like load up content in the very middle. Yeah. Um, and save yourself having to constantly reload that stuff, right? Yeah. And it's super nice when it comes to like, let's say they're visiting a page they've never been to before. If you know the layout's always going to be the same, you can still load that while you go and get the content in the background. Um, and it just makes sure that your user has like really good perceived performance. Yeah. Um, so the first time your app loads, you might show, you might like, um, you're going to have to render the shell itself. You'll cache that in your service worker. And you might show like a toast just to let them know, hey, this application now works offline. Yep. And that means that when they come back another time, like let's say they're you know, in airplane mode, uh, that shell will load up really, really quickly. Um, and then it might go to the network to fetch the rest of the content. You can then cache that content so that you know, that entire view is then available whenever they try accessing it. Just walk up and grab the yeah. clicker, wait for them to yeah. change the slides over. No, yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Nathan Martz. I'm the developer PM for the Daydream team. And I'm here to talk to you about enhancing applications and websites with embeddable VR views. I'm sure all of you have heard a great deal this week about our brand new platform for immersive, long-form VR, Daydream. Now, Daydream is amazing, and you've heard a lot about it. But today, I'm going to talk to you about a different mobile VR platform from Google called Cardboard. And even though we're talking a lot about Daydream today, Cardboard is alive and well, in part because it has some really unique properties. Cardboard still is the world's most affordable and most widely distributed VR platform. It's really, really good at bite-sized experiences. It's something you can drop into and drop out of really, really comfortably. It also works on iOS and on Android. And it's super easily branded if you want to use it in a marketing campaign or a giveaway. And especially the bite-sized nature of the content, the fact that you're not necessarily locked into VR for a long time with Cardboard, makes us think of some interesting applications. That's what I want to talk to you about today. Also, at the heart of Cardboard and of Daydream in general is this idea of VR for everyone. And when we say that, we mean not just VR for every user, but actually mean for every developer and also hopefully for every business. Google's investing in VR because we believe it's a potentially transformative technology. And so we're always thinking for ways to apply that technology outside of the most obvious applications of games and media into the real world, into the businesses that most of us run and support. And with that, um, I'd like to talk to you about a specific insight, a specific opportunity we've been thinking about. So imagine you have a travel website. Now, travel is a huge part of internet search and commerce. People spend tremendous amounts of time and money when they try to plan their vacations. And today, whether it's an app or a website, we do the best we can with the tools available. So if we want to tell someone about Machu Picchu, you know, we have a beautiful photograph. And you know, we have text and copy that tries to support that, maybe some charts and graphs. But 
if you're traveling to Machu Picchu, you'd really like to know what it feels like to be on top of the mountain, to look around the ruins. It'd be so much more amazing if you could feel like you're immersed in that space, physically present. If you're planning a trip to Machu Picchu and you're like, ah, that's what it looks like, it's so amazing, you might be more likely to travel there. And this idea of embedding immersive media into more traditional websites and applications, we think is actually a very large opportunity and not just for travel. For example, if you're in real estate, maybe you're a home builder, you, you know, your whole business is you have to sell homes that haven't been built yet. And some people are going to come to your office and they're going to be excited about your home, but they're going to walk out the door because they have a hard time buying a house if they can't look around the kitchen and then walk to the living room. Well, embeddable immersive media could let you do that. If you're in retail or support retail, you want to have somebody design a room or look at a showroom without leaving the comfort of their home, you can do that with immersive media. Maybe you work in news and you want to really leverage the power of VR as the empathy machine to bring people into the stories in a really remarkable way. Immersive media can do that as well. And of course, education is another opportunity where if you want to take your students on virtual field trips, teach them about the world, take them to places they could never go that are you know, thousands or millions of miles away, this is all possible. And so we know that even though there's this great potential, most businesses and most developers don't have a large team of VR experts on standby just waiting for this stuff to happen, right? It, building a VR app from the ground up is expensive, but we want to make it accessible. And that's why I'm here to talk to you about a technology released just a couple months ago called VR Views. And I'll tell you about it in a great deal of detail over the next half hour. So, it's much easier to experience VR views uh, than it is just to talk about them. So if anyone has a smartphone, I suspect a few of you have these crazy things called smartphones, um, there's a short URL which will take you to a live version of this demo. Um, so oh, check it out. I'll leave the URL up for just another second. It's pretty freaking cool. And bonus points if you actually brought a cardboard or a VR viewer of your choice, even better. Um, so the starting point for VR views is an embedded window. We know that most apps are not going to start users in VR. You're going to start in 2D. And you want to bring this window into an immersive world, ready to, uh, you want to bring it to users even before they've entered VR. In fact, we know that, of course, not everyone has a cardboard with them all the time. And if you're going to build this technology and integrate it into your site, you want it to work in VR and outside of VR. The cool thing is that with the embedded magic window, on mobile, when you move your phone around, you'll see that the picture actually responds. It's alive. You're looking through this magic window into this other world. Now, from there, you've got a couple of choices. There's a full screen button in the lower right. And if you press that, you get magic window, but in full screen. It's the most immersive you can get without cardboard. Now, of course, the best option is the VR option. And if you press that, you get stereoscopic, real-time viewing designed to be compatible with all of our cardboard viewers. And the cool thing about VR is it's the most immersive, especially if you have stereo 360 content. And we'll talk about how you can capture your own stereo 360 content in just a little bit. So of course, it's great to talk about what it can do, but how do you use it, right? You're developers. You want to know, how do I actually get this into my website or into my application? And I'm really proud to tell you that pretty much everywhere you want to be, VR Views already supports. We have a WebGL-based implementation that works on desktop and mobile browsers. We have native Android integrations through our Google VR SDK and native iOS integrations also through the Google VR SDK. So regardless of whether you have an app or a website, whether you're desktop or mobile, you can use this technology, use the same content across all of those surfaces and integrate it with a minimum of effort. In fact, one of the hard parts with VR views is actually compatibility, right? When you talk about browsers alone, there's lots of different browsers. Well, we support all of the leading browsers across all of the major operating systems, as long as you have a relatively recent version of the browser. I'm sorry, IE6, not supported. Uh, but otherwise, we're, we're pretty good. Um, on Android, we have support for everything from KitKat and on up. And on iOS, everything from iOS 8.0 and up. So really, really wide range of compatibility. The majority of the users you want to reach 
Uh, we've done the hard work to do the compatibility, and not just the compatibility, also the performance work to make sure that this doesn't just work, but is fast and responsive, which is super important, especially in VR. So integrations are fortunately super simple. If you want to integrate a VR view into your website, it's basically like integrating a YouTube video. You add an iframe. Uh, the most important field is that source field where you uh, can reference either scripts that we've staged and hosted on Google Cloud Storage um, or scripts that you host yourself. It's all The web version is all open source, so super simple. The GitHub link is at the bottom of the page. And then you tell us where to find the 360-degree image, and there you go. Um, we do recommend that if you're, if you're trying this out for the first time, using our scripts that we host is great. Um, but you'll run into things like cross-site uh, cores issues. You'll have to think about things like uh, browser compatibility in a couple of cases. So if you host the script on the same site as the content, it's much easier. We highly recommend you do that in any production environment. On Android, it's also super simple. You'll add your view to your layout XML file. In code, you just find that layout. Uh, in the case of an image, uh, you create a new bitmap factory, tell it what file to open, uh, and then you just need to get the options for the VR view, in this case, a VR panorama view. Tell us whether it's a stereo or mono image, and then give the raw bitmap data, uh, hand it off to the, the widget. Just that simple. And on iOS, very similarly, uh, all you have to do is allocate a new VR view, tell it what image to load, and then add the VR view as a subview to whatever your larger container is. Again, super simple, very idiomatic. We've tried very hard to make sure that this stuff is not just simple, but expressed in a way that's natural for the platform that you're developing for. And again, in all these slides, uh, I've got GitHub links, super easy to find. And I'll reference them again at the end of the talk. So one of the questions we get is, it's like, OK, great. Like, VR view is awesome. And it seems really easy to integrate. But how do you get the content, right? Like even capturing in 360 is relatively new. Well, I'm happy to say that there's some extremely affordable options in the market. And I'll walk through a handful of them today. So before I talk about specific capture solutions, I want to get a little bit of terminology, which is the difference between inside-out capture and outside-in capture. Everything we're going to talk about today is inside out, which means that the capture is taken from a single point looking outwards. And just like when you're in VR and cardboard, it's really good to be in a point looking out to the world. Outside in is the opposite of that. It's using a lot of like scanning configurations. Um, but for all of your view, you really want to be using inside out capture, not outside in capture, and thinking about use cases that are inside out rather than outside in. As an example of that, in retail, um, something like a showroom for home decorating, that's inside out. You're standing in the room looking at the drapes and the couch. Something like you know, shopping for shoes is more outside in, where you want to look at the shoe, rotate it in your hand, or you know, you're effectively moving around the object rather than looking from the inside out. So one of the cheapest, because uh, it's free, and awesome ways to capture not just 360, but stereo 360, is to use our cardboard camera app on Android. It's super easy to use, and it's one of the best ways to capture 360 stereo imagery. Um, there's a download link uh, in the short URL in the bottom. Now, if you want to use the Cardboard Camera app with VRView, um, you need to do a format conversion. Cardboard Camera is very clever, and it packs the left eye and right eye data together in a way that you need to unpack in order to use in VRView. So we have a really simple uh, website that we've put together that lets you just drag and drop an image from Cardboard Camera. We'll automatically convert it and prep it for a format that VRView can take. So again, super simple. Um, use the app, use the converter, and then you're ready to go for VRView. Another great, really affordable option is the Ricoh Theta. Uh, this is, I think, one of the simplest 360 capture options around right now. Um, the, the only limitation is that it's uh, monoscopic. So in the way that uh, cardboard camera supports stereo 360, Rico supports only mono 360, but it supports capturing both video and still photography. Now, of course, we've talked a lot about real world contexts, but the real world, like, sorry, VR views are not actually limited to the real world, right? Like, CG is a great source. In fact, if you're that, that hypothetical home builder who wants to show people what the home will look like, you're probably going to be capturing your 360 views from renders of your architectural drawings. 
And there's a lot of great plugins for everything from game engines like Unreal Engine and Unity to more traditional offline rendering tools like RenderMan and Maya. And these plugins generate the same standardized format that VRView supports. So let's talk a little bit about the specifics of the formats that work in VRView. So we support uh, the most basic format is a mono 360 pano. Um, it looks like that. Some people will call it a lat long image or an equirect pano. It's a very, very standardized format. Almost anything that can do 360 will output that format. And we also support its stereo cousin, which you'll often hear called an ODS, an omnidirectional stereo, which is really just two panos, one for each eye, stacked on top of each other. So a stereo image looks very much like a mono image, except two eyes in one image rather than one. Um, we also support, in the first version, both images and videos. So 360 stills, uh, 360 videos, and of course, mono and stereo of both of them. For images specifically, if you have a mono 360 image, you want your aspect ratio to be 2 to 1. So for example, 1024 by 2048 is a good baseline for mono 360. Um, in stereo, it's 1 to 1. It's a square because you're stacking a 2 by 1 uh, image on top of another 2 by 1 image. Um, for performance and compatibility reasons, the maximum dimensions are 4096 by 4096. Um, that's especially critical on mobile. And we support both JPEG and PNG, although generally we recommend JPEG for faster download sizes, especially for anything that looks very photographic. On the video side of things, uh, we strongly recommend you stick to MP4 H.264 with a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. One interesting thing on video is that this device support for video is much more varied, uh, especially on mobile, than it is for imagery. On pretty much any modern phone, a 4096 by 4096 texture will work. What you'll find, though, with video is that some phones cap out at 1080p, whereas other phones will decode up to 4K. So what we recommend generally is that if you want one thing that works everywhere, use a mono 1080p 16 by 9 video for your 360. However, if you want to target higher end devices and support stereo, you may want to have two versions, that simple monoscopic version that it works everywhere, and then a higher fidelity, ideally 2160p version for the maximum quality delivered to devices that you know support it. One last really funny quirk with video is that there's a wide variety of resolutions that work, but you want to make sure your dimensions, your length and your width are always divisible by 16. Uh, that's due to specifics in how hardware decoders work on mobile phones. So I think that's a really great overview of how all of this stuff works. Um, we've talked about the applications, whether you're a home builder or a journalist or in retail. And we've got a lot of great resources if you want to learn more. So we have a getting started guide on developers.google.com slash VR. Um, and we have actually two really great code labs here at I.O. So you've only got a few hours left, but I highly encourage you to check out one of the kiosks. Uh, they're really well put together. But if you're not able to get to it, um, in time for today's I.O. They'll all be available online, and they really help you understand the basics of getting in there, creating an app, creating a website, and make it better with uh, embeddable VR media. So thank you so much for the time. Um, I've got want to leave plenty of time for Q&A in case you have questions about integrations, use cases. Um, there's two microphones up front. Like, please come on up. Hello. Hello. I'm Ben from Road to VR. Uh, two quick questions. One is will we see cardboard camera for iOS? And two is, um, well, not a question, but so much of a, there's an issue with uh, VRView on iOS uh, right now, 9.0, where the Chrome of the browser, either in Chrome or in uh -huh. Safari, is always there, even when you're in cardboard view. Um, and actually, one more question. OK. Uh, will Daydream devices be able to access these views? Cool. So. Uh, Number one, uh, no additional product announcements right now. Number two, thank you for the bug report. Uh, and if you haven't filed it on GitHub, please do. That's how we track all of this stuff. Uh, we're really active in, in GitHub for all these repositories. If anyone uses things, has issues, like I said, we just launched this a couple of months ago. Like, please file issues, file tickets. Like, we're going to get them addressed as quickly as possible. Um, and I'm sorry.
tangible surfaces, this idea that, you know, everything on a, you know, on, on your screen and your device exists on a, on a surface. Mm -hmm. uh, we like to think of them as pieces of paper. Um, so basically you can think of um, a, basically a sheet of material or um, the word material representing one of those pieces of paper. And the reason we don't just call it paper is because it actually is, it's a lot more than just paper. In the real world, paper, you know, once you rip it up, you can't really just, you know, put it back together and paper can't go from being, you know, a circle to a square or to a mm -hmm. rectangle. Um, and so we like to think of our digital pieces of material or sheets of material um, as kind of a, a smarter paper, a more kind of, you know, a still a constrained paper. You can't just do anything. You can't, it can't just, you know, do all sorts of crazy things, but it is a physical thing that exists inside of this kind of, you know, environment, this, this right. kind of like faux environment, but it, it is something that, that has a lot of thought put into it. And so the word material, you know, to me really means the, the sheets of paper that everything in this world exists on. But for me, the, the main thing, you know, to think about, the, the reason that motion is so important in material design is that, you know, motion should always have meaning. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, try not to you know, like, you know, just do a, like a flip of a button or like a double rotation or something just to kind of draw attention. Every, every time something moves, it attracts our attention. And so it needs to be really thoughtful and, and really kind of carefully planned out. And so in material, we use motion or we kind of use just enough motion to convey the change in some object's state or, you know, try to get a little bit of attention. But you know, just enough motion, not too little, not too much. I understand Android Studio has some templates to allow developers to at least get started with uh, building material design into apps. Absolutely. Perhaps. So one of the, one, one of my philosophies for a long time has been, you know, we can write about, you know, uh, material design, we can write about a thing, um, mm -hmm. we can make suggestions about that thing, and we can try to teach people about that thing, but one of the best ways to get, you know, the thing into people's hands uh, you know, in this case, material design, is to actually just, you know, build it into the tools. Just mm -hmm. make sure that, you know, as a developer that's just getting started, even just on Android, um, if I just go to file, new project, or new app, right, I should be able to get the latest and greatest. Mm -hmm. And so in, you know, in Android Studio now, we're actually seeing um, new templates uh, for material design. So you could do file, new project, and then your default activity templates are going to come with material design in them. Okay. So it's going to use the material theme. Um, it's going to use some of the some of the latest uh, support libraries for material design. So things like the Android Design Support Library, things like App Compat. Cool. And so you're you're just going to get a lot of great stuff for free right off the nice. bat. Nice. So for someone like me, I'm I'm a coder, not a designer, <laughs> and so but so I can use Android Studio, get the, the effectively the scaffolding done for me in exactly. these templates and then learn from something like the Udacity course. Exactly. I, I definitely suggest, you know, even before you do the Udacity course, file new project, right? Just look yeah. around the code, um, see what you get. Um, I think that, that's a great way to get started. I always valued, as, as a kid, and you know, growing up learning programming and stuff, I always valued experimentation. Mm -hmm. So definitely experiment with that. Um, but as soon as you kind of you know, uh, you know, hit some sort of, you know, if, you, if you hit an obstacle or something, Obviously, take a look at the guide and the reference and all that, but the Udacity course is a great way to say, you know what, let me just kind of see what Google thinks is the right way to kind of approach okay. understanding this, this uh, okay. system. Awesome. Well, thanks, Roman. This, this has been a whole lot of fun, and I've learned more about material design <laughs> in the last five minutes than I'd had in, in a year beforehand. So This is fun. I, and so I, can, much. I can always talk about this stuff. So, <laughs> They've um, told me that about you. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is my favorite thing to talk about. <laughs> it's cool. It's been I'm, awesome. Lawrence. And thanks. I'm going to check out that Udacity course, and I recommend that you do so too. And if you're an Android developer, take a look at those templates. If you have any questions for me about this, or if you have any questions for Roman about material design or other aspects of building for material design, just please drop us a line in the comments below. Thank you for watching this episode of Coffee with a Googler. Uh, for more great episodes of Coffee with a Googler and for more great videos on developer topics, please tune to the Google Developers channel on YouTube. Thank you. Hello, I'm Timothy Jordan, and you're watching the Day 3 live stream of Google I.O. 2016. Stay tuned for more sessions on all four live stream channels for the rest of the day. We'll also be on the ground and behind the scenes finding the coolest and most innovative things to share with you right here on the live stream between sessions. And if you want us to track someone down with your questions, use the hashtag AskDevShow.
Hi there, I'm Timothy Jordan, and you're watching The Developer Show, a special Google I.O. 2016 on location edition. In this episode, we're going to check out the cool stuff going on at the Google Cloud Platform tent. Okay, now I'm at the Google Cloud Platform booth, and I'm about to play Query It with Felipe. And I just, before we start, I'd like to ask the crowd, uh, is Felipe going to win? No. What about me? Crowd's on my side. <laughs> All the news in the world, everything that is happening from 30 years ago until the last 15 minutes. What country besides the United States was mentioned with Greece the most last year? Oh yeah, I know that one. Not close. Turkey. I think I think you might be right, but You're just screwing with me now. <laughs> Don't let me They're win. They're super Felipe. close. SQL query analyzing all of the news from last year. This is a real-time query. So cool. It's also beautiful. Yes. I mean, the cool part I, is how fast it's querying. It's also beautiful. I do love this animation. 20 gigabytes. Analyze in 20 seconds, over a million. Germany! Turkey! Oh, he was the second one! Okay, now I'm here with Brett, still in the Google Cloud Platform tent, and we're going to take a look at the Cloud Vision API. But first, we need to take a few photos. All right, Brett, so this is the Cloud Vision API detecting facial emotions. Tell me all about it. So the Vision API does a lot of things, uh, one of which is emotion detection. So it's actually analyzing these faces, and it's going to get us a likelihood of different emotions, so joy, sorrow, anger, and surprise. Uh, and it does it by looking at different facial features, so like where your nose is, position of your mouth, position of your ears, and so forth. Uh, so we can see in these, uh, it's going to color it appropriately. So this is very likely to be joy. So you can see that there's like yellow on it. Uh -huh. um, this is angry, so it's red, and sorrow, so it's blue. So our our photos are starting to come in. <laughs> that's, can see. that's an angry Timothy. I would say that is very likely to be angry. <laughs> Surprised. <laughs> and then what is this one? Joy. All right, so it's actually zooming in. And you can see all these dots are actually spots recognized by the Vision API. Uh, so midpoint between the nose and eyes and so forth. That's amazing. Uh, and there's a whole lot of things that the Vision API does. Uh, it can analyze images to see what's in a photo. It can tell you, for example, this is a photo of a dog or furniture or chair. Uh, it can do text extraction. So you can upload an image and it can read a street signs, for example. Take a picture of a, of a page in a book and it'll give you the text yeah. back. Um, an interesting thing is it can do safe search detection. So you can upload an image, tell you if it's not safe for work. Uh, it's powered by the same algorithms. That's really useful. Yeah. It's powered so, by the same algorithms that power Google safe search on the web. Yeah. That's really cool. So you can plug them in to anything that can make a REST API call. So you can use it from your Android app. You can use it from your web app, from your iOS app. We also have speech API, which if you use like Google Now and as you talk, mm -hmm. like it sort of transcribes your text as you go. Uh, so we have a version of speech API. We've got a prediction API, a translate API, and a lot more on the way. Awesome. Thanks, Brett. Yeah, you bet. Did you know that the average user has 36 apps on their device and doesn't use three quarters of them most of the time? And of those, about one third of them have only ever been used once. Well, what if that's your app? You've done the research, you've written the code, you've performed the testing, you've perfected the design, you've gotten the installs, and then nothing. So how do you prevent this? App indexing helps you re-engage with your users through tight integration with Google Search. As well as appearing in search results, it surfaces your app through autocomplete and now on tap. All you have to do is get your app in the index. And when users search for the content that's already in your app, they'll be able to see your app directly in the search results and be able to launch it right from there. It's as easy as that. But how does it work? If your app and site have similar content, you associate them with each other. Then your app can receive incoming links from search. 
On Android, these are achieved using standard Android app links, and on iOS, using standard iOS universal links. When a user searches for your content, they can then find your app. If you have the app installed, it will allow you to link directly to it. When the app launches, it sees the address of the index content and decides which screen to load to show it. It's really as easy as that. You can also use the App Indexing SDK to submit content to the search engine based on how people use your app content. When people use your app, your search position can be improved. With App Indexing, you get into the index, putting your app into Google Search, and allowing you to re-engage your users. Hello, I'm Timothy Jordan, and this is The Developer Show. I'm standing here with Susan Koger, who is the co-founder and chief creative officer of ModCloth. Susan, welcome. Thank you. How are you? I am wonderful. Me too. <laughs> so we're going to talk about entrepreneurship and maybe some advice that you have for startup founders that are happening to be watching. But first, and I know you've told the story like a billion times, I'd like to talk to you about the origins of ModCloth. Is that okay? Yeah, of course. Okay, so here's my very specific question. You're sitting there in 2002 with Eric, your then boyfriend, now husband and co-founder, and you're thinking to yourselves, wow, Susan's really good at antiquing. <laughs> Maybe we should spend all of our free time making this into a business. Like, how do you yeah. cross from one idea to another? Yeah. How did that happen? Yeah, I love it. Like, I, I built ModCloth while I was an undergraduate at Carnegie Mellon. You know, just for me and, like, my style of leadership and, like, you know what I know about myself, I lead very instinctually. Um, and I think we did a lot of things, you know, just me and my husband being in the business and, you know, kind of almost, like, having a... Uh, like a beginner brain kind of approach to things. So you do have to, so I think it was very instinctual at first. You do have to like codify those things and actually step back and think about them and think about, you know, what's working. These are the things that we've kind of just done. What's working from this list? What can actually scale? What doesn't? What needs to go away? What new things need to be added in? You know, for me, it was starting ModCloth, like deciding to work on it full time once I graduated from CMU, because I did it part time while I was at school. You know, I was at the stage where I was like, man, if I can just like do this and I can support myself and maybe, you know, hire a few people to do the stuff that I don't enjoy doing so much, like packing boxes is really fun, but you don't necessarily want to spend four hours a day doing it, which is kind of what I was doing <laughs> when I hired my first employee. Yeah, you know, like I was like, man, if I can just support myself and like create this job and like, you know, Let's let's see where it goes, and it's just like continued to, continue to go and grow, and yeah, I feel really fortunate to be able to do it. Okay, so here's a question based on kind of what you were saying about having like this job for 14 years. I, I can't imagine it's the same job, and I have some data to back that up. Uh, in 2012, 50% growth to 100 million in sales, and in 2015, 150 million in sales. There's no way that you can get that growth and still be doing the same thing every day. But I'm curious like what the rate of innovation is. How often does your job change and how often do you have to find new strategies to grow even bigger or to deal with that growth? Yeah, it's a really interesting question and I think um, there I mean there's been so many phases and I, I used to feel like my job was changing almost every quarter. Mm -hmm. um, because honestly, it was just like we were growing so quickly. I want to say in 2010, we hired, uh, we had 100 people at the beginning of the year and we hired 150 that year. So we went from like 100 to like, I think 225-ish by the time the year was out. But it's so different and like there's no way that you can hit the level of scale that we've gotten to or hit any scale at all without being able to let other people in and, you know, empower them to do the things that they do really well. Mm -hmm. um, so part of the process for me has been learning like how to be a leader. As much as we've gone from nothing to where we're at today with like 350 full-time people across three locations, you know, the sales numbers that you, that you referenced, we're still a small fish in the big fashion sea. Like it's a huge industry um, and one that is ripe for innovation and we're doing mm. things differently and very in a very cool way, I think. Okay, so clearly you've been at this a long time and you've used a number of different ways to, to really help keep the spirit of the company alive. Um, let me just kind of like tag a few of them that I think I heard. Uh, one is that um, you had to be really innovative and you approached it with like this beginner's mind, like that's such a cool idea that it's like, what's the company we want to work at? And you put that into mod cloth from the beginning. And I think the other big thing that I heard is that you built that into the culture. 
so that throughout it wasn't just like a list of rules, but something people carried with them as part of bond cloth. Yeah. Does that sound right? Yeah. That's really definitely. cool. Okay, I have one more question for you. And this is an advice question. There's somebody out there who was where you were in 2002. They have a passion for something that uh, they think they can make into a successful startup. Where do they start? I think, you know, the first thing that I would say would be to ask for help mm. and do it all the time and be very concise and know what you're looking for at all times, right? You know, if you're doing something for the first time, if you get better, your taste is going to get better. And you're going to look back on that stuff that you did early and you're going to cringe at it. You know, like I look back at the first logo that I designed for Mod Cloth at our first website, you know, at our first photo shoots. And I'm just like, oh, my God, you know, it looks so bad to me now. <laughs> and it's I didn't think that when we launched it, uh, you know, obviously, like I cared very deeply about it. It was the best I could do. So I think that sometimes we get scared to just put something out there because, you know, it's, it's scary. It's vulnerable. You're putting something out there. People might like it. They might not. It's like, oh, my God. But here's the thing you like if you're gonna succeed you're gonna get better so you gotta start somewhere okay so don't be afraid to ask for help and you just gotta get out there yep you gotta get out there and put something out into the world and you know what it's probably gonna suck and that's okay or it'll be great and then you'll look back at it five years from now and you'll say wow that kind of sucked <laughs> I mean, i'm sure yeah every like you know, and then you'll look back at it and you'll be like, oh, this is actually kind of cute and retro. <laughs> <laughs> Susan, thanks so much for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. For more information about ModCloth and uh, some of, maybe we can put some of your favorite blogs and blog posts in the notes as well. Amazing. Check out the show notes below. See you next time. <laughs>
Instead, think more generally about how much space you have to work with. This can come in three different flavors, width, height, and smallest width. Width is super important and should be the basis for breakpoints in designing and building your UI. For example, 600 dp in width is the first point where you could consider having a side-by-side -side summary and detail level view. Any lower and you won't be giving each level a full attention it deserves. Height is less common when designing a responsive UI, but keep in mind that something like a vertically scrolling container is going to be difficult to use if you can only see one or two elements at a time due to a constrained height. Smallest width, unlike height or width, is designed to be rotation insensitive as it's just the smaller of the two values. This gives you a better idea of how much space is available and is an easy way to ensure that your app remains consistent as the device is rotated. You don't want to force your user to relearn your navigation structure every time they rotate their device. This is particularly important in the multi-window world. When your app is resized, your width, height, and smallest width are going to be updated. You might be going from full screen on a tablet down to what amounts to a portrait-oriented phone worth of space. Here's where a good responsive UI can make for a smooth transition. There are a number of common patterns you might consider when building that responsive UI, such as revealing previously hidden content as the screen size grows, transforming your navigation pattern or switching from a list to a grid, dividing your screen into multiple sections side by side, reflowing specific elements, expanding the size or margins of individual elements, or even changing the position of specific elements like a floating action button. Check out the blog post for more details on designing a responsive UI and specific patterns you can use to build better apps. Hey gang, did you know you can send notifications to iOS devices using Google Cloud Messaging? Well, you can. Why would you ever want to do that? Maybe that's a better question. Let's find out the answer on this episode of Route 85. So notifications, they're a great way for you to engage with your users. They let your customers know you have important new information for them. And when used responsibly, they can be a great way to keep users coming back to your app. But they're not super fun to implement. There's a lot of steps required to set up notifications in the first place. You need logic on both the client and the server. And if you're developing a cross-platform mobile app, and most of you are these days, you have to do this for Android and for iOS. And uh, I'm not just talking about two sets of client logic either. It turns out sending notifications to iOS and Android devices requires different logic on the server too. See, if you've done any notifications work in the past, you're probably used to talking to APNS, that's the Apple Push Notification Service, to deliver notifications to iOS devices, and to GCM, that's Google Cloud Messaging, to deliver notifications to Android devices. And while sending notifications through these two services is similar, they each have slightly different features, use different protocols, accept different message payloads, and return different responses, all of which means that you gotta keep track of what kind of device each of your users has and use two completely different code paths to send a notification. Or do you? Well, well, no, no you don't. You see, one pretty great feature about Google Cloud Messaging that a lot of people don't know about is that GCM can relay to APNS any notifications you wanna to send to an iOS device. Now granted, you'll need to do some setup work like upload your APNS certificate to GCM and make sure your client sends its device token to the GCM service. But once you've done that, you can use GCM to send all of your notifications, no matter what platform your target device is, and GCM will deliver your notifications to the correct device using the appropriate service. What all this means is that you don't need to care about what device your user has anymore. You just have, you just have to write and maintain one code path, and as we all know, less code means less room for mistakes. But it's not just about using less code. By using GCM to handle your messaging for you, you can take advantage of some of the other nice features that GCM offers to developers, like topics. Topics allow your app to subscribe to notifications about any particular topic that you or your users want to. For example, let's say you've got a weather app and I, as a loyal weather fan, want to be notified whenever there's extreme weather happening in my zip code. Well, in the old way of doing this, you'd probably need to set up a database where you keep track of each one of your users and their devices and their zip codes and do this whole select users where blah 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 query, then loop through the results and send notifications to each device that you get back from this database query. But with topics, none of that's necessary. Instead, your app simply tells GCM that you're interested in subscribing to, say, the weather 94043 topic. Then, next time there's rain in California, for us that, that counts as extreme weather. Oh my gosh, there's something coming down from the sky! I don't know if it's water or if it's acid! I can't go out! I don't know how to drive anymore! 
yeah, that seems about right. So yeah, with Topics, your server simply tells GCM to send notifications to all devices subscribed to the Weather 94043 topic, and I will get notified along with all other devices subscribed to that topic. So there's no database required. Go ahead and throw it out. Oh, uh, as long as you weren't using it for anything else, I guess. I probably should have mentioned that earlier. GCM has other useful features too, like upstream messaging, which allows your app to communicate to your server through GCM. This can be helpful in cases where you might want some lightweight communication from your clients to your server, but don't feel like dealing with the hassle of setting up and maintaining a full-blown server open to the entire world. Or read receipts, where in some, but not all, situations, you can be notified that a user has received your message, something you can't normally do through APNS alone. Oh, and in case you're wondering, all this is free, as in please send us zero dollars, uh, and it's using much of the same infrastructure that Google uses for its own apps, so it'll probably scale for yours. So there's a lot to learn when it comes to notifications, and I encourage you to get started here with our Google Cloud Messaging documentation for iOS. We also have a couple of sample applications for you to look at. There's Friendly Ping, our cross-platform chat app powered entirely through Google Cloud Messaging, as well as the GCM Playground, which lets you easily experiment with sending calls through the GCM service. And keep watching Route 85. Maybe you'll see another Google Cloud Messaging video pop up in the future. If only we had, we had some way of letting you know when that happened. Well, I'm stumped. Consider the simple URL. A few years ago, these were pretty straightforward. You clicked on one, and nine times out of 10, you went to a web page. Then things changed. People started using their mobile devices for, well, everything. And these devices in turn started supporting the idea of deep links. Click on one of these deep links, and it could take you not just anywhere on the web, but anywhere in an app as well. So you could use a deep link to point directly to a specific restaurant inside a reservation app, or give your new customers a personalized welcome based on the link that brought them to your app in the first place. At least, that's how they worked in theory. In practice, deep linking had issues. The same link wouldn't necessarily work on an iOS or Android device, and they behave very differently, or didn't work at all, for users who didn't have your app installed. And for people who did install your app through a deep link, all of that great link info was typically lost during the installation process, leaving your personalized warm welcome out in the cold. So while deep links were great in theory, their uses were a little more limited in practice. Enter Firebase Dynamic Links. Firebase Dynamic Links are deep links that work the way you want them to. So you can create one single link that behaves one way on iOS, another on Android, and even a third on a desktop browser, and it will take you to a place that's appropriate to that platform. You can also set up dynamic links to change their behavior depending on whether or not your user has your app installed. For users who don't have your app installed, maybe you send them to your website, maybe you take them to the Play Store, or maybe you show them an interstitial describing the benefits of your app before you take them to the App Store for a smoother transition. More importantly, these links can survive the App Store installation process. So if your user installs your app when clicking on a dynamic link, all of that information is still available to you when your user opens up your app for the first time. So what does this mean? It means you can use dynamic links the way you've always wanted to use deep links. You can use them in marketing campaigns, from email to social media to banner ads to, heck, even QR codes. And in addition to install attribution tracking, you know, the kind that lets you know which campaigns are getting you the highest quality users, you can also give your users a customized first-time experience based on the campaign that brought them there. So if a user installs your music app because you showed them an ad for classical music, you can make sure your app takes them right to Chopin's latest hits when they first open it up. Dynamic links are great for sharing too. Your users can use them to share recipes, links to their favorite level in your game, or even coupon codes. In fact, dynamic links are the technology that powers Firebase invites. And because dynamic links are a Firebase product, you can see their stats directly through the Firebase console. Find out how many people clicked on a link, or use Firebase Analytics to find out which of your users first opened your app through a particular link. To find out more about dynamic links, check out the documentation here and give them a try. And deep link away. Bitcoin represents a way to transfer money anonymously and at almost no cost. And since it's an arbitrary currency, with no nationality attached to it, 
you're free to exchange it with anyone in the world. What is money? Resources are limited and they hold explicit value to people. Most resources are physical and such needed to be traded in a physical form. Diamonds, gold coins, chickens or bikes. At some point, it becomes too difficult to physically transact those objects and it's easier to agree, collectively, on the value of cash instead of gold. As we know today, this has many advantages. Credit cards and the modern banking basically gave us another abstraction layer on top of cash. There is a centralized system which defines who owns what resources. All of these trades are made virtually. This is the backbone of why Bitcoin is a valid idea. What is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is decentralized, anonymous, digital-only currency that recently received public attention. Bitcoin was originally developed in 2008. Like in any good mystery, someone using the alias Satoshi Nakamoto published a paper describing how Bitcoin could work. There's a very interesting story about this guy too. He must be very smart, but he never came forward to claim ownership or any part of the revenue. Just one year later, in 2009, Bitcoin started being traded. Where do they come from? Think about gold. You could buy it or mine it, and it's the same concept with Bitcoin. You do this by using your computer to hunt for 64 digit numbers. By having your computer repeatedly solve complex mathematical puzzles, you're competing with other miners to generate the number that the Bitcoin network is looking for. If your computer generates it first, you receive Bitcoins. The Bitcoin system is programmed to generate a fixed number of Bitcoins per unit of computing time. It is also self-sustaining, coded to prevent inflation, and encrypted to prevent anyone from disrupting its code. In the year 2140, the total number of Bitcoins in circulation will be capped at 21 million. So how much is a Bitcoin worth today? You'll need to Google it. Just type Bitcoin in US dollar, for example. You could also check it out at priv.com. Why are they anonymous? Bitcoin are pseudo-anonymous because they are built upon this centralized system. The Bitcoins themselves are anonymous, the wallets are not. Here is why. The base algorithm creates anonymity, but as the recent court cases show, if your Bitcoin wallet is identified and attached to a person, then someone can go through and track every transaction you've made. Bitcoins exist entirely on their own because there's no central infrastructure to shut down. You are identified by nothing more than your Bitcoin wallet address, a string of randomized letters and numbers. There are absolutely no identifying characteristic beyond that. For the paranoid dude, you can simply create a new wallet for each transaction. Here are some interesting startups that push the technology forward. We are still in the initial phase of Bitcoins, and there are many challenges and opportunities ahead exchanges, wallets, merchant services, security, and more. But this is something for another episode. Until next time, eat your vegetables and listen to your partners. One word that's the bane of both the novice and expert programmer alike, threads. I'm Joanna Smith, and threading can be one of the greatest perf improvements you make, but it will also likely drive you crazy. Tom Sawyer illustrated threading perfectly a long time ago when he needed to paint that fence, because when you've got a large chunk of work to do and it's the same work over and over again, you call on some friends to get it done quickly. So for computations that are taking a long time, consider calling in reinforcements with threads. By allowing multiple threads of execution to operate on your dataset in parallel, you reduce the overall time required to complete the task. With Android, threading becomes especially important because the entire app runs on the main thread, which is also called the UI thread because it updates the UI. And when the UI stops responding, users stop using your app. So, when you want to perform some complex action in response to a button being pushed, for example, you'll want to move that off the main thread until it is finished so that the user can continue to interact with your app. Because there are a few things worse than the dreaded application not responding dialogue. However, 
Integrating threads into your system is not for the faint of heart. You're going to have to rethink your entire approach to computational complexity and to your memory model in order to properly integrate threads. So to avoid the rabbit hole, take advantage of the Android framework, which has been built to help you out. Careful thought and planning about your app's structure and flow will enable you to determine whether a thread should affect the UI or be entirely hidden. APIs like Async Task and Thread both help you manage the work and keep your app from hanging, but Async Task will also allow you to affect the UI, like when you want to display a progress dialog. So take a walk through your own app and see if there are places where it stops responding or gets exceptionally slow in response to a user action, and then move all of that extra work off the main thread. But, you know, thoughtfully. Don't just change things willy-nilly. Because while threading may be intimidating, it shouldn't scare you. What is scary, though, is bad performance, which is why you should check out the rest of our Android Performance Patterns content and consider joining our G Plus community for tips, tricks, and help. But most importantly, keep calm, profile your code, and always remember, perf matters. And welcome to Supercharged. Now, this is a kind of TLDW. Last week, I did a live stream with Surma where we made some swipeable cards. Now, you probably recognize swipeable cards from things like Google Now, where you just kind of take a card and you dismiss it. And you can actually see what I've got on screen. This is what we ended up making. There you go, you see? Dismiss it and all that kind of good stuff. Now, the idea is if you've not got an hour to watch that live stream back, although if you can, I would recommend it, and you can find the link to that below. If you can't, that's exactly what this is for. I want to step through the things that we learned, the things that we did, um, and just so you can get an insight into what actually went into it. So before we actually get started, what I want to do is I want to step over to Theory Corner. Oh yeah, theory, love theory. And what we can do in Theory Corner is discuss what we need to do. Join me. Welcome to Theory Corner. You can tell it's Theory Corner because there's some theory in a corner. Now, this is what we have. We've got the cards. You can tell it's a card because it says card. The cards have will change transform on it. The idea I, I have here is that we want each card to be transformed around the screen. And so we want to give each card its own layer. The compositor then can move those around with the help of the GPU. So long as we stick to transform, opacity, and we set will change, we should be good. So we move the card as you touch and swipe. But as you get across to this side, we have this marker of like 0.35. Now, I picked that at random. You could pick a different number. 0.35, if you go past that point, we basically say, well, this card is being dismissed. So we slide it off to the side. The other thing that we're going to do is we're going to change the opacity. So the further you go across, the lower the opacity in both directions. So that works there. OK, so we're going to put each card on its own layer, and shift it side to side, and fade it out. Let's go back to reality. What we're going to do here is we're going to step into the code so you can actually see bit by bit what we actually did. Here's the cards. And what we do, first of all, is we basically create an array from the cards that we've got in the document. So we'd have to have some kind of code that adds or removes those cards later on. But don't worry about that. We'll just get on with what we've got here. The next thing to notice is that I've got these named functions on start, on move, on end, and update. Now, the first three are our input events. And I choose to do it this way. What I do is I take a copy of it by calling dot .bind on this. And that takes it from the prototype into the actual instance. But it does another thing for me as well. It means that it's bound to the instance so that in those functions, when I say this dot .whatever, is actually applying to the instance and not to the target's event. No, wait, the event's target. Oh, one of those two. So it also does something else for me. It means that I can do add event listener and remove event listener. And I can call it by name. I can say like this dot on start, for example. You can see that down here in the add event listener. So I do add event listener for touch start, touch move, touch end, mouse down, mouse move, and mouse up. All of them. Yay. And I can just basically say on start, on move, on end, and so on. And if I wanted to do the remove event listeners, I could do that. And that would just work out fine for me. So. We've got our event listeners, and we have a bunch of variables here that are just sort of housekeeping, things that we need to keep a track on. The other thing I do is I start a request animation frame where I busily sort of kind of do an update. Now, if you're doing this in production, I would suggest you don't do it quite like this. I would start the request animation frame when the user starts interacting, and then when the animation's finished, I'd stop doing the request animation frame loop. But for the case of this, just to keep things simple, I just start it right at the start, and I do a kind of busy loop through. 
So what do we actually do in the on start, on move, and on end event listeners? Wow, saying event listeners over and over and over and over and over again, that's not confusing for me. No. What are we doing those? Well, first, in the on start, the main thing is this. We basically take a marker for the start position of the interaction. Where does the user put their finger down on the screen? And then we get that with page X. The other thing we do is we take a copy of that for the current position. Because as we move our finger, we're going to update the current position so we know where we started and where we currently are. And the difference is how far we want to transform the card. The other things that we do in this is we set the dragon card to say true, but as we discussed in Theory Corner, we set will change to transform. Now we can check that that actually works by going back to the code, bringing up DevTools, and in the rendering settings, we're going to show layer borders. Anything that's got its own layer is going to go orange around its border. You ready? So when I click, you can see that we immediately the card gets its own layer, which is really cool. That means that we can transform and move it around cheaply, like we discussed over there in the theory corner. Here's what we've got in the on move. It's fairly straightforward. All we do is we take the current position of the input, and we basically say that's the current x. Now inside the update, what we can do is we can say if they're dragging the card, the screen x, which is basically the position of the card on the screen, is the current minus the start. That's basically how far they've moved. And we can apply the transform to account for that. Ta-da! Now, when the user stops interacting, we actually have to make a decision. If you remember over in Theory Corner, we said if the user is past that 0.35 marker, so it's a sort of a 0 to 1 range, 1 being the full distance of the card, 0 being not at all. If they go past 0.35, which is what I've chosen, but you could choose a different number, what we want to say is they are dismissing the card. And we do this by setting a target x, which we use later on in the update. And here, we do screen x plus equals the target minus the current screen x over 4. What this is going to do is it's going to ease the card to that final position, which will either be the center or it'll be off to the side, depending on whether we've decided that they've gone past the point of dismissal or not. Then there's some. All right, good, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Fontaine Foxworth. I'm one of the product managers working on Firebase Analytics here at Google. And uh, I was actually supposed to be doing this presentation with a colleague of mine. But two days ago, he told me he wasn't going to be able to do it because his wife is having a baby the next day or so. And he felt like one big launch this week wasn't enough. So um, I'll be flying solo, so you'll have to bear with me. So we're going to be talking about Firebase Analytics. And uh, we'll be talking it in the context of growth. So actually growing your user base, trying to get more users into your app, and then keeping them there. And I'm going to talk about Firebase Analytics in three sections. First, I'll give a quick overview of Firebase Analytics. Hopefully, some of you guys have stopped by our sandbox or attended some of the other sessions, so it might not be new. But I'll go ahead and give a quick recap. And then I'll be talking about uh, using analytics to actually track your paid acquisition campaigns. So look at looking at advertising and tracking advertising with Firebase Analytics. And then finally, we're going to uh, touch on organic growth. So actually, uh, a couple of tools that you can use Firebase, use um, with Firebase, and track using Firebase Analytics. Since we know that as a marketer, advertising is only one of the tools that you're using. And when we're actually going through this, I'll be using a hypothetical marketer named Mike. 
Now, let's start with the reason why so many of us are here. We've got consumers spending a lot of time in mobile apps when they're on their phones. So between Google Play and the App Store, we've got millions of apps that are generating north of 150 or north of $50 billion annually. So that is a lot of value coming from a lot of users. So how do we actually reach those users? How do we present opportunities for the, those users to discover our apps? We know that on average, a user is unlocking their phone 150 times a day. They're usually doing specific tasks, like calling an Uber, or maybe looking for a nearby coffee shop, looking for a game to download when they're waiting for the bus. I like to think of these as 150 opportunities for us as marketers, different chances that we can get in front of our users and show them content that they could be interested in. But even though we have these 150 opportunities a day, the ecosystem has created a lot of challenges for us as marketers. So a, a couple quick highlights. First of all, it can be hard to actually find the right user in your app. So figuring out who that target audience should be, making sure it's a relevant market, making sure you're finding them on the correct devices, at the right time, et cetera. That's always an issue. Secondly, Mobile technology is just hard. You know, people who are new to marketing on apps, I feel like are always surprised when they realize there aren't cookies on apps. You've got advertising identifiers, IDFAs. They don't work well with cookies on mobile web. So the, the technology that was designed to help us connect with our users often actually ends up getting in the way. And not to mention, of course, the app stores, right? Google Play and the app store, they add a step in between uh, giving our users an ad or something like that and actually discovering the app. So it's one step or three, depending on how you look at it. So this creates a clouding marketing picture at best. And then finally, I feel like we're drowning in tools. So when I, every time I meet a developer, I always ask them, what analytics tools are they using? And almost certainly, they rattle off four or five different analytics tools they're using. And they're using all of them. They're just using them for different things, right? So they could have an SDK for, tra for tracking crash reporting, or one for tracking push notifications, or behavioral in-app analytics, or conversion tracking. So each one of these SDKs in and of himself aren't that big, not that much work to add. But when you start adding them all together, you know that's four or five SDKs for different types of analytics that you're using in your app. When you look at them all together, they could add bloat to your app. And certainly, as developers, I know that we don't like adding extra code every time a marketer asks for another tool. And that's just looking on the development side. But when you're actually consuming that data in the UI, you've got different databases, different systems, and these uh, different data silos don't speak well together. They were never designed to work together. So you end up making your decisions in a couple of different disparate places. And that's why we are bringing to you Firebase Analytics and Firebase, because we're really trying to do something different by offering this platform. So unless you've been living under a rock for the last few days, you should know that Firebase is a suite of integrated products that we're introducing to help you develop your app, grow your user base, and earn money. And Firebase Analytics is really at the core of this platform. I thought it was pretty impressive the way that this designer designed this uh, graphic. Quite literally, Analytics is at the core of this image. Um, but not only is it connecting all of the different products within Firebase Analytics, but it helps you understand each phase of the customer journey. So you can really get an end-to-end -end picture of what's going on in your app. Now, adding Firebase to your app is as simple as one, two, three. One is registering your app on Firebase.com, so you can actually create that instance within our system. Secondly, you're given a configuration file, which you'll be adding to the app. And third, you add two lines of code on iOS, and you just adjust your configuration file on Android. And just like that, you're up and running with Firebase. 
And this is a one-time task that you would do to instrument any of the features in Firebase. But no matter which feature you're implementing, you will get Firebase analytics by default. So it's a pretty easy way to get up and running to immediately start asking questions of your data. Now, I see Firebase Analytics being particularly helpful in three different ways. First of all, it's completely free and unlimited. When we set out a while ago to completely redesign an app analytics product from the ground up, free and unlimited was one of our founding tenets. We wanted to make sure that you as developers had access to all of your data without compromise. So no hit limits, no sampling, and it's your data. And this was built by the knowledge of the uh, developers and product managers of Google Analytics for apps. So we were able to take learnings from several years and hundreds of thousands of apps to take what we have and the feedback that we've been getting from our users to truly build an app analytics product that is built for app developers. And then we have automatic event reporting. So with Firebase Analytics, immediately after plugging in the SDK, you're getting over 12 analytics events captured automatically. So you can log into your dashboard, and you'll see a bunch of information without logging any additional information. But if you're new to analytics, maybe you don't know exactly how to instrument your app, we also give you guides for different verticals about what we recommend to instrument in your app, different events that we suggest you capture. And this can be used, of course, as a guide if you're new to analytics, but it is also helpful because we give you dedicated event reporting for those specific events. So if you have a specific retail event, we'll give you a report for that. Or if a specific game event, again, we'll give you a dedicated report for that. Since we understand the context, the syntax of that event, those parameters, we'll make sure to give you a report that makes sense in the context of that event. And then finally, Firebase Analytics is seamlessly integrated with the rest of Firebase. And it's not just seamlessly integrated with the rest of Firebase. It's also integrated across Google. Again, integration was one of our founding tenets of Firebase Analytics. Since we knew that developers are instrumenting, you know, they could have 14 different developer tools in their app. Again, they don't speak to each other. And what we wanted to do with Firebase was have a single platform where you can come to one place to do all of the developer tasks you need. So integration is a key point that I'm going to be diving into it a little bit more later. And of course, Firebase Analytics works on both iOS and Android, since we know that successful app developers are building on both platforms. And we're committed to being platform agnostic. Now, if you attended our session on Wednesday, you saw that Firebase Analytics can be used to help develop your app grow your user base, and earn money. And this is really, it's not a linear path, right? It's a cycle. So you'll be taking each one of these actions over and over, rinse, repeat. But right now in this session, we'll be talking about Firebase Analytics in the context of growth and how you can actually use it to augment your marketing strategy. All right, we're going to look at it in the context of a real app. So we've got this app, Transworld Endless Skater, it's available on both iOS and Android. And it allows users to uh, skate, try to attempt the longest runs in the game. And they can select from five different pro skaters that have different skills and tricks that they have access to. And another thing that you can do in this, uh, in this game is you can spend on in-app purchases to purchase virtual currency in the game. And then once you're in the game, uh, you can spend that virtual currency on other tricks, unlock new levels, or whatever. But the important part to note is that Skate's in-game economy works. So if we can find more users, bring them into the app, then Transworld Endless Skater should make more money. And that's why we hired Mike, this marketer. Now, Mike decides, Mike's responsible for growing uh, Transworld Endless Skater. And he decides that now is the right time to get the app in the hands of his users. It's right around finals time. Maybe he's looking to take advantage of some, some folks who are just getting off school and looking to find a new game for the summer. Or maybe they just need something to procrastinate while they're studying. 
but he, he thinks now is the time. And he sets a pretty ambitious goal of 300,000 installs that he's trying to drive. He's starting at around 10,000 installs, so he definitely has a lot of work cut out for him. And he thinks Firebase Analytics can help. So he logs into the Firebase console. And immediately when he gets here, he notices a ton of data is already available for him. And this is because Mike's developer named Andy had actually already been using the Firebase product for a series of other features. So Mike never had to ask Andy to add any new SDK because it was already there for him. Uh, the analytics was already available to him. So he logs in. He sees a ton of rich data. A bunch of events are being captured automatically. He can see his uh, monthly active users. He can see his revenue numbers, et cetera. Now he navigates to the events section of the app. I like to think of events as like the currency that Firebase Analytics actually runs on. These are also what I like to describe as the verbs or the action words in the app. So things like level up or in-app purchase, whatever these are. And he notices a lot of the events that had been logged automatically by just plugging in the SDK. So he can see app update. He can see OS update, session start, et cetera, even in-app purchase. Since this is a game, and Firebase Analytics captures in-app purchase data automatically on both iOS and Android. And he also notices a couple of uh, events that were captured by Andy that are specific to games. So you can see at the bottom there, spend virtual currency and unlock achievement. These are two games that are specific to games that Andy had uh, registered, logged in the um, code with just a line or two of code. And these actually contain pretty rich information about games specifically. I had highlighted those different vertical specific events earlier. These are some examples of those. So if he were to click into them, he would actually see some reporting around them. And then Mike navigates to the Attribution tab. So in the Attribution tab, he can see his conversions. His conversions are the things, the business drivers in his app that he's really looking to optimize his business around. So first open and in-app purchase, we know these are really common conversion events. So we'll enable those for him automatically. But Mike also has the opportunity to enable any of the events that he has access to to be conversions. And he can do this in the Events tab. On the far right column, there is an Enable Conversion toggle. By turning those on, that will get, uh, they will add those events to the attribution table. Now, marking something as a conversion, that basically unlocks some features and functionality for that event. So you can do attribution reporting, so you can see cross-channel campaign performance for your different conversions. Now, we talked about uh, Mike had automatically gotten in-app purchase and first open, but he decides to go ahead and indicate spend virtual currency to also be one of the uh, conversions that he wants to optimize towards. So I want to step back really quickly and talk about We've talked about the attribution section and generally what you can do within Firebase Analytics. But now I want to talk about the paid part of uh, marketing, look at how you can integrate Firebase Analytics with your advertising efforts. So Mike knows that he's going to be driving 300,000 installs. And if he's going to be spending that much money, then he really needs to make sure he understands the tools that he has access to. And so that is why he wants to basically understand what Firebase Analytics can actually do for him. Now, a key part of our integration with Firebase Analytics has been being able to integrate across other Google products. And with Firebase Analytics, one of our most important integrations from day one has been our integration with AdWords. We know that if you've run marketing campaigns with AdWords in the past, it can be sometimes difficult to actually track your conversions. So we know that you've had to keep track of your conversion ID, your conversion labels. Um, it can be a headache. Oftentimes, you had to make code changes to run a marketing campaign. And this can, be, can often sometimes create friction between the marketers and the developers in a product org. So we've been very deliberate about actually shaping our integration between AdWords and Firebase. So it comes in a couple of different parts. 
The first part is you establish a link between your Firebase app and your AdWords account. By establishing that link, that handshake, a bunch of features get unlocked. For example, you get conversion tracking. And you can import any of the conversions that you had access to in Firebase. You can track your AdWords campaigns against them. And then secondly, you can also target the audiences that you've created using your Firebase analytics data in AdWords. So a really powerful way that shouldn't require any code changes from a marketing perspective. You should be able to do everything you need as a marketer directly from the UI. All right, so Mike decides to run some universal app campaigns. And universal app campaigns are an AdWords feature that were launched last year to basically make your life as an app marketer a lot easier. So Google has access to all of these touch points when users are on their mobile phones, right? There's Google.com and users searching for apps in Google.com. Of course, there's Google Play and actually discovering those apps in the Play Store. We have uh, the mobile display network, so both on mobile web and across other apps and ad and inventory and ad mob. And then finally, of course, YouTube. Right? So we have all these different touch points. And instead of asking you as a marketer to continue to maintain each one of these channels and uh, have individual uh, strategies for each one of these, you can book a campaign once with universal app campaigns, campaigns, and then we will deploy those campaigns across all of these different touch points to remove some of the burden on you as a marketer. So from past experience, Mike knows that universal app campaigns are pretty effective at running uh, cost-efficient uh, CPIs. But basically, he knows this could be a good uh, approach to actually acquiring some of those 300,000 users that he has as a goal. And so the first thing that he's going to do, as we talked about earlier, log into AdWords. He's going to link his AdWords campaign with his Firebase. He's going to link his AdWords account with his Firebase project. So this is a one-time task, and then the rest of his campaigns and data will flow seamlessly. He's going to select which conversions to import into AdWords. And uh, as we highlighted on the attribution tab, we're going to have the first open, which is basically like installs, driving installs. Secondly. He's going to be importing his in-app purchases. So it's the items that are being purchased in the app. And then finally, it's that third conversion, the spend virtual currency conversion. Even though he's focused on driving installs, those are like first opens, he still wants to import all of the conversions that he has access to, since those are good signs of engagement. And he'd like to measure the performance of his ad campaigns across those in-app events, as well as his first opens. So he's linked his AdWords account. He's imported the conversions he cares about. And then finally, later on, we'll look at an example of him actually using uh, remarketing campaigns for the audiences that he has access to. All right. But Mike also knows that he doesn't want to put all of his eggs in one basket. He thinks that AdWords will be powerful, but he doesn't want to bet on that entirely. So that's why he's also running campaigns with a couple of other networks. So within Firebase Analytics, on the attribution section, which is going to be the home page basically for any marketer using the product, he can go into the Network Settings tab and access over 20 major ad networks to run campaigns with. So they don't have to be Google networks. These are other networks that we, as Firebase, are partnering with. And he goes ahead and sets up a campaign for Advise. Now, Advise is a hypothetical ad network. Um, but he knows or he thinks it could be successful. And there's a couple of different steps. First of all, he's going to generate a tracking URL that's available to him within the Firebase UI. And this tracking URL, he'll be able to send over to Advise. It'll include a lot of the metadata that we need to do a, a click tracking with Advise. Now, if you've ever tried to track uh, acquisition campaigns before, especially if you tried to do it with Google Analytics, this was a lot harder to do. But now we've embedded this URL builder into the product, and we've explicitly developed these integrations with a whole bunch of different networks. So from your perspective, all you have to do is copy and paste this URL, put it in your ad network when you're actually running the campaigns, and this will be the destination. We'll do the rest of the processing from here. So this is for attribution tracking. And if he ran the campaign with this, 
When he logs into his attribution section later, he would be able to see for his install campaigns basically all the advised installs that he's brought in. But if he's doing this, then he's not putting the advised SDK in his app, which is, of course, one of the main reasons why he's using Firebase Analytics. But he knows that in order to best work with Advise, it usually helps if he sends a data back to Advise, some of his conversion data, so they can actually do uh, optimization in their systems. So this is where Postbacks comes in. Postbacks is the ability for an advertiser to send their conversion data back to the ad networks they work with. This is one of the main reasons why you can replace all these specific ad network UI uh, SDKs with the single Firebase SDK. So in Firebase, you're collecting all the data. But with Postbacks, you're sending it back to the networks that you're working with. And so here in the Postback section at the bottom, he selects that the conversions that he actually wants to send back. So he's going to select all three conversions, first open, spend virtual currency, and in-app purchase. And then also, he has the option to, uh, to send just the conversions that Advise is responsible for bringing him or all the conversions that he's gotten with his app. And Mike's feeling pretty generous, so he's going to go ahead and select to send all of the conversions that he's gotten with his app, because he knows that Advise is going to do the best job optimizing when they have more information. All right. Another thing I didn't tell you when he was setting up the uh, Universal App Campaign was that he, when he set up his app campaign, he decided to target the US and Australia. And the reason why he did that was because last week, when Mike was on Twitter, he saw a couple of folks in Australia mentioning Transworld Endless Skater. And when he clicked around, he was exploring. Turns out that there is a pretty engaged developer community, or pretty engaged gaming community in Australia that had discovered Transworld Endless Skater and was pretty excited about it. However, when he looked at the performance of the app in Australia, he noticed that only less than 10% of his users are actually coming from Australia. And so this basically led him to believe that maybe there's this untapped market in Australia, that maybe he should actually be running more campaigns there, hence why he had targeted his universal app campaign at Australia specifically. So to test this hypothesis, he goes into the audiences section of Firebase Analytics and creates an audience of users who are in Australia. So because he wants to continue to analyze this particular segment of users and see if, in fact, he was right that this could be a potentially high value segment. So you can see here um, the, the list of the audiences he has access to. He just recently created this Australian users one. And next time he comes into the experience, he can uh, see if his hypothesis was, in fact, correct. All right, so at this point, I want to talk about moving the needle or moving the bottom line. So up until this point, I've just been talking about more installs. But something we haven't been talking about is around monetization. And currently, with Firebase Analytics, we track revenue for you for the in-app purchase event and the e-commerce event purchase event. So these are the transactional events that we know are revenue-based. And so that's what's factoring into our ARPU or into our LTV metrics. So Mike here has two additional goals beyond the installs goals that I talked about earlier. He had that 300,000 installs goals, but he also has uh, an engagement metric that he's trying to drive of moving the daily average engagement up from 15 minutes to 20 minutes. And then secondly, he has a monetization goal of moving his ARPU from what was originally 90 cents to $3. And when he checks in after he's been running these ad campaigns, he, did, he was able to move it up to at least $1.50. So it's somewhere. It's made some movement. But between $1.50 and $3, he has a lot of work to do. So to actually dig into how to figure out how he would better move the needle and figure out how he could drive up that ARPU, he clicks into the Funnels section of Firebase Analytics. And in Funnels, you can create basically a visualization of different events in your app and how they relate to one another, see how users are actually moving through different parts of your user journey. He creates a pretty simple funnel. This one's called Purchasers. It has only two steps. The first step is users who basically ever launched the app. It's users who had first open. And then the second step is users who actually went on to make an in-app purchase. 
When he creates this funnel, he realizes his conversion rate is a very measly 0.3%. So not very many people are actually placing purchases. So definitely room for improvement. So he's trying to figure out basically how he could make a difference on this front. And to do this, he comes back to the attribution tab. He's looking at all the relative com uh, campaign performance next to each other. And he sees that there's one network, I'm calling Stomp Network here, that is performing much lower than some of the other ones. So it is bringing in a couple hundred installs, so good volume. But when he looks at the lifetime value, value metric for this particular network, he realizes it's at zero. So they're bringing in installs, but it's not really the installs he's looking for. So he decides to go ahead and reallocate his funds away from Stomp Network and invest them in another place. All right, so that's one thing he did to uh, actually hopefully bump up that ARPU number. We're going to talk about a couple more in a few minutes. Now, another thing he notices is he had run that AdWords campaign. And uh, over the last week, he has seen over 50% of the new users he's been acquiring have been from Australia. So that's comforting. It looks like maybe, in fact, that hypothesis was a reasonable hypothesis that Australia could be an untapped market for him. All right, and then there's a couple more ways that he's going to try to move that ARPU metric up a little bit more. The first is when he came into the audiences section, he found that there was an audience named purchasers. So this is basically any of the users that were purchasing his, in his app. And when he clicked in, he realized that there was actually a, a pretty high distribution of his purchasers who were in Japan. Now, this is interesting because A, the app is not localized in Japan. He's not trying to do anything to drive users in Japan specifically. And then when he looks at just his plain usage numbers, the distribution of users in Japan wasn't particularly high. But for some reason, it seems like the users who are in Japan are more inclined to actually purchase. So he decides to go ahead and run a campaign, an acquisition campaign, with creative localized in Japanese. So even though the app isn't localized in Japanese, he wants to see if potentially localizing his creative in Japanese in his ad campaigns might make a difference to actually bring in more Japanese users. And the second thing that he does is he creates a re-engagement campaign using his purchaser's audience. So in AdWords, he sets up a re-engagement campaign, and he targets those that he already know, knows have actually purchased in the app. So they're known purchasers. They're users he wants to continue to foster a relationship with. And so he sets up a, a retargeting campaign for these users specifically. So are, those are two additional things uh, beyond taking funds away from Stomp Network that he's trying to do to optimize his ARPU. All right, and now it's at the end of the month. And I'm happy to report that Mike has succeeded in, in many of his goals. So first of all, he was able to exceed the 300,000 installs goal that, he, that we set out at the beginning of the session. He was also to, able to move the needle on the daily average engagement metric. So it had started off at 15 minutes, and now we're at 23 minutes. And then finally, for the ARPU metric, where we listed out those couple of different things that we did to try to move the needle on that front, he was able to move it up to $3.30 when his initial goal was $3. So happy, happy to report that Mike and his team will be able to celebrate with drinks tonight, much like I hope that me and my team will be able to celebrate with drinks tonight after this week. All right, so we talked a lot about advertising um, and how Firebase Analytics can be used for advertising. But I also want to highlight a couple of ways that it can be used in conjunction with some of your organic tools, since we know that as a marketer, you're probably not just running ad campaigns. That's just one of the tools that you're using in your toolbox, but you've got a couple other channels as well. So first of all, I want to touch on Firebase notifications. So notifications are a great way to engage in a conversation with your users directly. And on Firebase Analytics, they're supported on both iOS and Android. And like Firebase Analytics, they're totally free and unlimited. So a really powerful way to engage in a conversation with your users directly for re-engagement purposes. And there's two particular integrations with analytics that I want to highlight. So first of all, similar to AdWords, you can target the audiences that you've created in Firebase Analytics within notifications. So you can be serving them experiences that make sense in that context. 
And then also, you can use Firebase Analytics to actually understand how your campaigns performed. So how many notification opens did you get? How many opens did you actually drive with a particular push notification? Or for users that came in on a particular uh, campaign, what did their behavior look like once they entered the app? You can apply that as a filter throughout the Firebase experience, the throughout the Firebase analytics experience, to actually see how users who came from a particular notification then went on to navigate your app. You can also measure it against your conversions. So how many in-app purchases did a particular campaign drive? A uh, second type of organic channel I want to highlight is the app invites. So app invites are a great way to facilitate the relationship between your users and their contacts. So it's not just about you and your users and that relationship, but actually facilitating a bigger network. So again, you can use Firebase Analytics to uh, identify groups that you would want to actually notify, reach out to, target those users, and then serve, give them the opportunity to share the app using SMS or email to bring in their most frequently contacted users. Of course, you can pair this with dynamic links, which I know there's been a couple other sessions for, where you could actually take users to a specific screen in the app once they've clicked through on a download. And then finally, <clears throat> we have app indexing. So Google has indexed over 100 billion deep links. And 40% of all Android queries return app links. So basically, this is an incredible opportunity for exposure for marketers to actually help users find content within their apps. So you can imagine, initially when apps were created, apps were very much walled gardens. And in some cases, they still can be. But with features like app indexing, we're really looking to help our users discover the content within the app without actually having uh, to navigate through the full app to experience that. Um, this is particularly powerful when it comes to re-engagement and trying to get your known users back into the app. Now, there's a couple of different companies that I think have done this really well that I want to highlight. So uh, these are three different examples of uh, apps, and these are all search engine results page. So you can imagine this is basically what a user would see. And here are these blue dots are where the user would actually be clicking. So first up on the left here, we've got the Realtor.com app. And the query in Google here is, I think, homes for sale in Sunnyvale. And so when I click on that line item, which is at the top here, I get taken inside the Realtor.com app to a map focused on Sunnyvale, able to see all of the homes for sale. So pretty cool that I, as a user, had to do no additional work beyond clicking. And I'm in the app. It's a much more rich experience, and it's exactly what I set out to look for in the first place. All right, here in the middle, I've got an example of me searching for the restaurant Cookery in San Francisco. And when I click on the TripAdvisor link, I'm taken directly to that listing in the, in the TripAdvisor app. I can see the reviews for that particular restaurant. And then finally, on the right, I've got the Expedia app. I'm looking at hotels in Tokyo. And similar to the homes in Mountain View, or homes in Sunnyvale that I saw a minute ago, I'm taken into the app. I can see a map with all of the available hotels. So pretty powerful way to get our users exactly what they want with a ton of context while making them do very little work. All right, so enough from the PM on Firebase Analytics about why Firebase is so great. Uh, I want to let you hear from a couple of our app developers who have been using some of the tools as well. So I think, actually, Joe is here in the audience. He's from Spark People. Joe's right over here. Um, and so uh, Joe shared with us the ability to sync his AdWords data to Firebase Analytics has simplified his daily management and optimization from hours to minutes so he can spend more time building an app that his users will love. I would love to have hours back in my day, so where somebody would do this for my job. But um, pretty cool to see how building these types of tools can make uh, basically create more time for our app developers to do the thing that they actually want to do instead of the thing that they need to do because tools are making them do it. 
And then we also had Recruit, which is a Japanese company using uh, the integration between AdWords and Firebase. And, and one of the marketing managers on, over on that front had emailed us that AdWords and Firebase Analytics just work better together. So we built Firebase Analytics to be a growth engine for you guys as marketers. So you can develop and grow your user base, whether you consider yourself a developer or a marketer. As a quick recap of this conversation, I coupled, covered a couple of different things. First, I highlighted Firebase Analytics uh, in general. Then we talked about how you could actually use it to track your advertising or paid channels. And then finally, we wrapped up by talking about some of the organic or uh, non-advertising channels that you can use Firebase Analytics with. So as we've been crafting Firebase Analytics, we've been very deliberate about building a tool that would work well, not just for developers, but also for marketers. So we're really excited to see what you guys will do with this. Thank you. So I've got about five minutes in case anybody wants to ask questions. I think you can uh, use the mic if you want to come. Hello, and welcome to The Developer Show. I'm Timothy Jordan, and I'm standing here with Mary Grove, Director of Google for Entrepreneurs. Hi, Timothy. Hi, Mary. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Absolutely. OK, let me jump to a question about Google for Entrepreneurs. It's been on my mind for a little while because developers ask it, right. and I think it's fair, and I think we should give them an answer. Why is Google doing this? It's a great question. I'm yeah. glad you asked. So there's two ways that I look at that. One is if you look at Google's own history, our own journey as a company, it's entrepreneurship is such a core part of our DNA, right? Google began as a startup in a garage now almost 20 years ago. We are a company founded by entrepreneurs, built by entrepreneurial people, and then it makes sense that we are passionate about empowering the next generation of startups like Google to become successful, to launch, to use the internet to grow their business. So that's the first reason. Mm -hmm. The second reason, though, is actually an economic one. Right? We believe that by investing in communities, long-term investing in startup communities, these are the next set of companies who are going to come online, use the internet, leverage Google's products as well. So really, it's this notion that all boats rise. And long, long-term, it's also going to benefit our own business, too. Now, before you were the director of this huge, amazing thing, you were a BD principal at Google. And I'm curious, what did you learn um, doing those global partnerships that brought you into this new job? Sure. So my actual, my personal story with entrepreneurship begins with my parents. So my parents are both immigrants from Thailand, and they moved to America, sort of personify the quintessential American dream. They were entrepreneurs and really showed me firsthand that you can really, you know, create whatever future you dream for yourself. Mm -hmm. So at Google, fast forward many years later, I was working in new business development, as you said, looking at emerging markets for Google. And everywhere we worked, we looked for three things. One is how can we increase access, so internet and mobile penetration. Two is how can we increase content created from these regions. And the third bucket, which was my personal sort of passion, was entrepreneurship. So mm -hmm. how can we work with students, developers, any emerging entrepreneur ecosystem to really help them create the next generation of companies and really create and grow their own economies? So let's say you are a budding entrepreneur out there with an early stage startup. What's your first step getting help from Google? There's many ways to look at that, right? There's so many amazing groups and networks that Google has. Of course, Google developer groups being one of them, women tech makers being another great example. We, at the heart of it, are a technology company. So we hope that our products, our platforms can help you be successful. Beyond that, in the Google for Entrepreneurs umbrella, our mission is really about bringing together startup communities. So working mm -hmm. with partners of all types, whether that's physical space, co-working, tech hub, to accelerators and educational curricula, we try to knit together this global partner community of about 50 organizations who are supporting entrepreneurs. So we encourage you to get involved with one of them. For example, Techstars is a global accelerator running all sorts of programs ranging from Startup Weekend to their vertical accelerators. And you can find all these resources on our website, which is google.com slash entrepreneurs. Awesome. Is there anything else that you'd like to say about the program that you don't often get to talk about? You know, I think that we're based here in Silicon Valley, but Google is truly a global company. The internet has really democratized access to entrepreneurship, right? You can launch a company from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and have users in Seoul, South Korea, 
instantly. And so what I would say is, is we passionately believe that entrepreneurship is thriving all over the world. It's about getting more access, getting more opportunity, and helping companies really go global from day one and think about their market opportunity as not just their city or their, their country, but really the whole world. Mary, thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Timothy. Thanks for having me. For more information about Google for Entrepreneurs, make sure to check out the show notes for all the links that you need. I'm Timothy Jordan, and I'll see you next time. We all know from experience that people love to share things about themselves, such as photos, videos, and GIFs that express their feelings. So what do you do to let them store and share these files through your app? That's where Firebase Storage can help. Our storage API lets you upload your users' files to our cloud so they can be shared with anyone else. And if you have specific rules for sharing files with certain users, you can protect this content for users logged in with Firebase authentication. Security, of course, is our first concern. All transfers are performed over a secure connection. Also, all transfers with our API are robust and will automatically resume in case the connection is broken. This is essential for transferring large files over slow or unreliable mobile connections. And finally, our storage, backed by Google Cloud Storage, scales to petabytes. That's billions of photos to meet your app's needs, so you will never be out of space when you need it. So give your users space to share their lives with Firebase Storage, available right now for iOS, Android, and web applications. And to learn more about Firebase Storage, check out the documentation available right here. So service workers are powerful for offline caching, but they're also really good for giving you um, instant loading performance benefits when it comes to repeat visits. Yep. Right. And you can achieve that using an application shell architecture. Yeah. Now, so that's kind of the idea of kind of separating content from the actual visual UI. So in my head, it's kind of like native apps. You always have the banner. You've got the navigation drawer at the side. You yeah. might have some other bits. That could be common through like 90% of your app. Yeah. You always want it there. So when we talk about the shell, we're talking about the HTML, the CSS, and the JavaScript that's making up the bulk of your UI. Yeah. Stuff exactly. that, you know, if you cache that, you can still just like load up content in the very middle. Yeah. Um, and save yourself having to constantly reload that stuff, right? Yeah, and it's super nice when it comes to like, let's say they're visiting a page they've never been to before. If you know the layout's always going to be the same, you can still load that while you go and get the content in the background. Um, and it just makes sure that your user has like really good perceived performance. Yeah. Um, so the first time your app loads, you might show, you might like, um, you're going to have to render the shell itself. You'll cache that in your service worker. And you might show like a toast just to let them know, hey, this application now works offline. Yep. And that means that when they come back another time, like let's say they're you know, in airplane mode, uh, that shell will load up really, really quickly. Um, and then it might go to the network to fetch the rest of the content. You can then cache that content so that you know, that entire view is then available whenever they try accessing it without a network connection. Yeah, exactly. Spot on. We've got some performance testing we've done with the application shell model. Um, this is using web page tests. So on first visit, we've got um, a relatively fast uh, time to first meaningful paint. And this is super important, because I, I think that there can be scenarios where someone might take advantage of service worker to be like, ah, don't worry about your first load, but I'm just going to serve up like megabytes of stuff that yeah. I'm going to cache. Afterwards, you'll be super fast. But that first load, if that takes so long to the point where the service worker doesn't even get registered, that's pointless. And plus, for other browsers that don't support service worker, you're then kind of just damaging yourself. Yeah, that's so, going to make your users go and cry in a corner. Exactly. You don't want that. So you still want to be serving up just that static render of your site, just so then it just loads up as fast as humanly possible, and then progressively enhance the service worker to then use the AppShell model. And if you are using the AppShell model, as you can see here, we've got um, really good, we've actually slashed our load times um, for first meaningful paints on repeat visits. Uh, speaking of like actually taking a look at what impact server-side rendering has on this, uh, you don't have to use Service Worker um, 
you know, to actually be able to get good gains. If you're building uh, with the app shell model in mind, with server side rendering in mind, you will get like a really good first paint, even in like Safari and um, like mobile Safari on iOS. Yeah, all the other browsers that just don't have Service Worker. Yeah. Now, if you're wondering, okay, well, should I be using the application shell model on all of my applications? Um, there are going to be types of apps, like super simple apps. This this might be overkill. Yeah. But if you're building something that's you know a little bit more complex, a little bit more dynamic, this type of model makes a ton of sense. Um, at Google, we're using it for things like Inbox, and it's working really well there. Yeah, I think it's one of those things you end up falling into the sit there and figure out whether it makes sense for your site or not. But I think it's a good overall model that works for a lot of different scenarios. There's a whole ton um, behind this model that you know we, we way too much to explain in just one video, but we wrote up. Uh, Pretty amazing article on this, if we do say so ourselves. Well, you wrote it up and I just read it. So you you just added your name to the end of it. Yeah, that's how I wrote it. Pretty much. <laughs> Impact. Um, that's worth checking out. That's the format of this It's show a mediocre already. article at best, but it's got pretty graphics. Yes, it does. Um, people should go check that out. Yep. Learn more about App Shell. Um, and then there's also the Getting Started Guide for your first progressive web app, where it actually talks about the application shell model, how you can make, like, take advantage of it, as well as how it applies to the demo app that you can build in this lovely code lab. Yep. And in that article, we also link out to tools that can help you get started with the application model like really quickly um, that yeah. we're working on. So check that out. Yeah, build a weather app. So what if I told you there was a way you could compress nearly any stream of data by a factor of 10x or more? Wouldn't that be something you'd be interested in? Yeah, I thought so. Let's find out more on this episode of Route 85. So I want you to take a look at this array of numbers here. Imagine that we wanted to send this array of integers from a server to your user's device. Looks like just a bunch of random numbers, right? Well, that word random is actually the key to compressing these in an incredibly efficient manner. As you probably know, a random number generator isn't truly random. Supply a random number generator with the same seed, and you'll get the same results out every time. And we can take advantage of that fact to recreate that list of integers using a random number generator. You see, all I need to do to regenerate that array on a device is to supply three parameters. The seed for an agreed upon random number generator, an upper bound to apply to these results, and the length of the list. I simply supply those numbers to a method that looks a little like this and I can recreate that original number stream. Just like that, I've built my array of 30 integers using just two integers and an int 32. That's a 92% compression rate. Now granted, finding that initial seed did take some work, but you know what, that work can happen in the cloud, so it doesn't really matter. What's important is that on the device, I'm able to decompress that number stream in order and time. And then of course, once you start looking around, you can see that there's a ton of data you can compress this way. I mean, need to compress a text string? Well, what's a string but a stream of encoded integers? Once I have my stream of integers, I simply figure out what seed I need to generate them, and voila, I've compressed my string down into just three numbers. It's a pretty amazing savings, right? Anybody with the username of stidjexmissdizixgoodquibpubpa will be singing your praises in their reviews. And uh, my gosh, if you think about it, an image is really just a stream of numbers broken out into uh, several channels. Take a look at this image here, and you can see how, using our random number generator, I've been able to replace it with just three sets of integers for the red, green, and blue channels, respectively. Now, once again, finding the right seed can take some time, and I haven't found the perfect seed just yet. So if you look at the results carefully, you can see that this is not quite a lossless compression scheme. But I think you'll agree that for this kind of savings, these trade-offs just might be worth it. Anyway, I hope you consider using this technique the next time you have data that needs to be compressed. Remember, the more efficient you are with your user's data, the more they'll love you. Thanks again for watching. Be sure to check out other episodes of Route 85. And uh, remember that, as my coworkers on the Android team like to say, perf matters. All right, thanks guys. I think we're done. Who let him into the studio again? I just, I couldn't say no to Elijah Wood. But that's... Elijah Wood. Hello, I'm Timothy Jordan, and you're watching the Google I.O. 2016 live stream. It's been a great day so far, and there's lots more to come. Stay tuned on all four live stream channels for sessions throughout the day. We'll also be on the ground and behind the scenes finding the coolest and most innovative things to share with you right here on the live stream between sessions. And if you want us to track down somebody with your question, use the hashtag 
Ask Dev Show. Last episode, we used a decision tree as our classifier. Today, we'll add code to visualize it so we can see how it works under the hood. There are many types of classifiers you may have heard of before, things like neural nets or support vector machines. So why did we use a decision tree to start? Well, they have a very unique property. They're easy to read and understand. In fact, they're one of the few models that are interpretable, where you can understand exactly why the classifier makes a decision. That's amazingly useful in practice. To get started, I'll introduce you to a real data set we'll work with today. It's called IRIS. IRIS is a classic machine learning problem. In it, you want to identify what type of flower you have based on different measurements, like the length and width of the petal. The data set includes three different types of flowers. They're all species of iris, Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica. Scrolling down, you can see we're given 50 examples of each type, so 150 examples total. Notice there are four features that are used to describe each example. These are the length and width of the sepal and petal. And just like in our apples and oranges problem, the first four columns give the features, and the last column gives the labels, which is the type of flower in each row. Our goal is to use this data set to train a classifier. Then we can use that classifier to predict what species of flower we have if we're given a new flower that we've never seen before. Knowing how to work with an existing data set is a good skill, so let's import Iris into Scikit-Learn and see what it looks like in code. Conveniently, the friendly folks at Scikit provided a bunch of sample data sets, including Iris, as well as utilities to make them easy to import. We can import Iris into our code like this. The data set includes both the table from Wikipedia as well as some metadata. The metadata tells you the names of the features and the names of different types of flowers. The features and examples themselves are contained in the data variable. For example, if I print out the first entry, you can see the measurements for this flower. These index to the feature names, so the first value refers to the sepal length and the second to sepal width, and so on. The target variable contains the labels. Likewise, these index to the target names. Let's print out the first one. A label of zero means it's a setosa. If you look at the table from Wikipedia, you'll notice that we just printed out the first row. Now, both the data and target variables have 150 entries. If you want, you can iterate over them to print out the entire data set like this. Now that we know how to work with the data set, we're ready to train a classifier. But before we do that, first we need to split up the data. I'm going to remove several of the examples and put them aside for later. We'll call the examples I'm putting aside our testing data. We'll keep these separate from our training data. And later on, we'll use our testing examples to test how accurate the classifier is on data it's never seen before. Testing is actually a really important part of doing machine learning well in practice, and we'll cover it in more detail in a future episode. Just for this exercise, I'll remove one example of each type of flower. And as it happens, the data set is ordered so the first setosa is at index 0, and the first versicolor is at 50, and so on. The syntax looks a little bit complicated, but all I'm doing is removing three entries from the data and target variables. Then I'll create two new sets of variables, one for training and one for testing. Training will have the majority of our data, and testing will have just the examples I removed. Now, just as before, we can create a decision tree classifier and train it on our training data. Before we visualize it, let's use the tree to classify our testing data. We know we have one flower of each type, and we can print out the labels we expect. Now let's see what the tree predicts. We'll give it the features for our testing data, and we'll get back labels. You can see the predicted labels match our testing data. That means it got them all right. Now keep in mind this was a very simple test, and we'll go into more detail down the road. Now let's visualize the tree so we can see how the classifier works. To do that, I'm going to copy-paste some code in from Scikit's tutorials. And because this code is for visualization and not machine learning concepts, I won't cover the details here. Note that I'm combining the code from these two examples to create an easy-to-read PDF. I can run our script and open up the PDF, and we can see the tree. To use it to classify data, you start by reading from the top. Each node asks a yes or no question about one of the features. For example, this node asks if the petal width is less than 0.8 centimeters. If it's true for the example you're classifying, go left. Otherwise, go right. Now let's use this tree to classify an example from our testing data. 
Here are the features and label for our first testing flower. Remember, you can find the feature names by looking at the metadata. We know this flower is a setosa, so let's see what the tree predicts. I'll resize the windows to make this easier to see. And the first question the tree asks is whether the petal width is less than 0.8 centimeters. That's the fourth feature. The answer is true, so we proceed left. At this point, we're already at a leaf node. There are no other questions to ask, so the tree gives us a prediction, setosa, and it's right. Notice the label is zero, which indexes to that type of flower. Now let's try our second testing example. This one is a versicolor. Let's see what the tree predicts. Again, we read from the top, and this time the petal width is greater than 0.8 centimeters. The answer to the tree's question is false, so we go right. The next question the tree asks is whether the petal width is less than 1.75. It's trying to narrow it down. That's true, so we go left. Now it asks if the petal length is less than 4.95. That's true, so we go left again. And finally, the tree asks if the petal width is less than 1.65. That's true, so left it is. And now we have our prediction. It's a versicolor, and that's right again. You can try the last one on your own as an exercise. And remember, the way we're using the tree is the same way it works in code. So that's how you quickly visualize and read a decision tree. There's a lot more to learn here, especially how they're built automatically from examples. We'll get to that in a future episode, but for now let's close with an essential point. Every question the tree asks must be about one of your features. That means the better your features are, the better a tree you can build. And in the next episode, we'll start looking at what makes a good feature. Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, thank you very much for, co for coming to this talk, A Window into Transitions. It's one of the last talks of I.O., or the ultimate talk, if you will. Um, my name is Nick Butcher. I'm joined by my colleagues Ben Weiss and George Mount. We're engineers on the developer relations and Android engineering team. OK. <laughs> So we're here today to talk about the Android Transitions API. We've got a lot to cover, so we're just going to jump straight into the topic and um, get going. So first up, transitions, what are they? The basic idea of the Transitions API is to help you um, to ch um, whenever there's a change in the scene, where a scene is basically um, a view hierarchy on screen. So the idea is that when a scene changes, my animation doesn't work properly, ironically. and um, we perform a transition. So a transition being look at what has changed and then animate that difference. So the API for the transition is, is pretty simple. It does exactly this thing. What has changed? 
Firstly, it, um, there'll be two callbacks into your transition, which is capture start values and capture end values. Um, passing in this object, this transition values object. So this object has um, the view. And you can look at the view and capture properties about it and save it into some kind of map in the transitions values. Um, so you do that in the start state and the end state. And then we'll call the create animator um, method, given those, um, those two states. And you create animators to you know, animate the change between those two states. Cool. So that's the very basic API covered off. There's a bunch of transitions which come um, in the Android framework, which you can and absolutely should use. So let's have a quick survey of what they are so you know what these um, primitives that you can build with are. The first and super handy one to know about is um, the change bounds transition. So this will help you out whenever you are moving or resizing a view. Um, it will animate the top left and bottom right properties to help you move it around. Um, Crucially, this change bounds also um, helps suppress layout. So you don't want to be calling request layout repeatedly, because that's going to be bad for performance, whereas change bounds will do this in a performant way for you. Secondly, uh, the fade transition, which, as the name suggests, um, helps fade things in and out. So anytime an object's visibility changes or gets um, added or removed from the hierarchy, you can run a fade to um, ease that change. And lastly, there's this awesome little guy called the auto transition, which will put some of those things together. So when a um, hierarchy changes, it will fade new, uh, newly arriving things in. It will move and resize items which are remaining or changing position, and then fade out anything which is disappearing. Very handy. In API 21, Lollipop, um, Transitions API got a bunch of new and exciting um, additions. Uh, first up was the slide. So you can, um, and anytime anything's entering or exiting the scene, you can like, do so from an edge in a kind of like, nice staggered manner. And then there's um, a bunch of um, transforms for um, whenever you're changing the bounds. So you can actually just clip the bounds of something changing size. Or if um, you're doing a change transform, which will affect the um, rotation and scale of a view. Or if you're doing an image, say you're changing from one scale type to another scale type, um, this will help animate the changes to the matrix of the image view um, to change between those scales. The transitions object itself got some upgrades in 21. Um, so firstly, it got this thing called path motion, which basically allows you to control the movement um, along a path. So here, for example, we're looking at a um, transition, which is a shared element. And we can control the path that it follows when it moves from one state to the other. Don't actually do this kind of horrible, loopy thing. This is exaggerated for effect. Please don't do that. Um, the classes you'll probably want to look at when doing this kind of um, control on the path are called arc motion and pattern path motion, and we'll return to those later. And lastly, the transitions API got this new um, ability to control the propagation and epicenter. So what these two properties let you do um, is to choreograph the way a group of views are going to move. Easier shown with an example. So in this example here, when I click on an item, see how the views around the grid all move out together. This is called an explode transition. But basically, this, um, by passing in the epicenter, which will be the, the view you touched on, you can then like, set the start delays on the other views which are exiting as well in order to have this coordinated movement. So these are the, the, the kind of APIs to look for if you're trying to build this kind of um, transition yourself. So that's transitions. It turns out that um, quite frequently when you're changing scenes and want to perform an animation on those changes is um, activity boundaries, so when you're going from one activity to another. So API 21 added a whole bunch of new um, APIs to help um, do this kind of thing, um, which we call window transitions. There's two main types. Um, the first type is a, a content transition. So that's when a, a window exits or a new window enters. You have an opportunity to run um, animation on the content coming in. So in this example here, if we go from the grid and we launch into like a details type screen, we're running an enter animation on the views uh, coming in in the details where they're sliding in from the, from the bottom. The second type is a shared element transition. So this is where, oh, went too far, go back. Uh, there we go. A shared element is where when you tap on one view, the element transitions smoothly from one activity um, into the second activity. And as you just had a sneak peek of there, those two things aren't mutually exclusive. You can, of course, um, run a shared element and a content um, transition as well. So here we are sharing a view and also sliding in the unshared content, as it were. Now, a note on um, shared element views, like shared element transitions, excuse me. You can't actually share a view between two activities. You can't pick up an image view from one activity and supplant it into the other one. Um, so what we do, as many animation things uh, APIs do, is, is kind of like fake it. It'll allow you to uh, give the appearance of what, that's what's happening while still um, you know, maintaining your even one activity or the other. 
So the way we do it is when you click on an image in the source um, activity, we record some information about that view, um, just a small amount of information like the position and the bounds and a few other things. And then we pass that information over um, to the destination activity. So we then launch the destination activity, but don't show anything just yet. And then we um, lay out and measure um, all the views in the destination activity and work out where that shared view wants to end up. Then we do something a bit sneaky. We actually we apply transforms to the shared element in the destination view um, to kind of put it back into the position of it was in, in the source view and then fade out any unshared content. So at this point, destination activity is, is launched. It's the um, activity on top. But it you know, appears as if you're still in the source activity because it's been transformed to appear so. Then we simply run animations to um, move the shared element back into place and fade back up um, any unshared content. Voila. Looks like you've shared a view from one activity to the, to the other, but it hasn't. So this is important that, um, to remember that everything happens in the destination activity. You're never actually um, changing the view in the source activity other than hiding it. So shared element and uh, content transitions can run at um, a number of points. So there's a kind of a life cycle to think about here. So when you go from one screen to the other, so when you call start activity, you have the opportunity to run um, and transitions on the exiting uh, source activity and on the entering destination activity. And then on the way back, you can also then animate on the return and re-enter. So, so these are the four points you can hook into. And it's worth noting that these kind of come in pairs, um, such that if you were to set an exit transition from the source activity, so you know, do something with the views on the way out, well, by default, if you don't specify a different re-enter one, we'll just run the same transition um, in reverse. So but worth bearing in mind that's what's going on there. So that's, in a nutshell, what the Transitions API is trying to do. To give you an example of um, how to do it, Ben's going to walk you through a, an example application that implements these APIs. Thank you, Nick. Um, so as we saw, we had a couple of transitions going on there. And um, let's see what we're going to aim at. Uh, we will have an application having a master activity and a detail activity. Um, and once you tap on one of the items, it will move the image and perform a couple of other transitions. So let's get started. Um, we, have the, uh, we have our app. We have, before we actually um, got started with the, with, with the transitions, this is what the system gives us. We tap up one of the views, and the detail activity slides and fades in. Pretty cool. But in order to um, do the transitions, use the transitions API, what we want to do is we first enable the uh, window activity transitions within our app theme, or simply inherit from theme.material, or as many of you use it, uh, AppCompat is uh, also inheriting from uh, theme.material on Lollipop and Plus. Um, so once we got this, we can go through the next step and do the shared element transition for the image view. In order to do this, we set a transition name on both the starting and the target view. And um, remember, those have to be, or should be at least, unique for the view hierarchies in order to avoid a couple of uh, issues that we will cover later on. After we have uh, taken a look into this, we need to tell the system how to actually deal with the shared element, because as we just learned, um, sharing the element is something that happens within the receiving or the detail activity. So we have to tell the system that um, at the point where we actually start the new activity, um, that a couple of things have changed. We do this by calling the make scene transition animation, um, pass it the image that we want to share, as well as the identifier for the target view, so the name that we just set on that. Pretty cool, pretty straightforward, and um, awesome to use. After that, we add the exiting transition for the grid, which is the explode that we just saw, um, which is probably one of the uh, things that you should think about if you actually want to do it, because uh, it can confuse users. It can be very handy as well, on the other hand. So make sure that you don't just uh, throw explodes in everywhere, because um, it can be uh, not helpful on the other hand as well. So to do this, we create a transition in the uh, transitions folder called grid exit. And we just say explode. And that's it from the um, declaration of the transition. Pretty straightforward again. Uh, we then set that in, uh, we then have to declare the window exit transition within our homes activity, home activities theme. Um, and as we just learned, this will be replayed, uh, reversed on the way back in when the activity uh, does its re-enter transition when we press back on, from the detail activity. 
Let's go and take the next step for the detail activity. We also want the content that is not shared to be slide, to slide in from the bottom. You, don't you can't just uh, create the, the transitions from XML, but you also can do this directly within code. So let's take a look how you can do that. We just created a new slide transition. We want to slide the, have the content slide in from the bottom. And we want to have it enter at full speed and then ease in all the way up until it reaches its rest resting point. To do this, we uh, inflate an interpolator to do exactly that. Then on the window for this activity, we set the enter transition to be the transition we just created. This can be um, a lot more complex than this if you want to. But to get started, um, just adding one transition, seeing if you actually got the right things in, in place works pretty well. Since we are already in the motion of getting things feel more natural by having them enter very quickly, let's take a look at uh, another thing that Nick already mentioned. It's curved motion. So usually, you have just one linear motion of the shared element view. But we want to have this motion in the end so that it feels while, you grow, while, the, while, the, while, the, while the view is growing, uh, it should also have a curved path that it follows to make it feel more natural. Let's take a look at one of the transitions that we use there. We have a transition set, which is, a, um, which is a, a collection of different transitions that will be run at a point in the animation. And um, we basically just have to do this on the set bounds. We just say we want to add an arc motion to that. Pretty straightforward again. Um, and it helps to get exactly this, uh, this uh, done. You can also set uh, maximum, minimum angles on that to make sure that the user actually sees what's going on. Um, you shouldn't exaggerate, uh, like, like Nick earlier said. Um, so, but for development purposes, this can be pretty handy. So those are all built-in transitions. Uh, let's take a look at a thing that we can do with uh, getting into custom transitions. Um, we also want to share the detailed text. So the title uh, is the author of the picture. And we did a couple of things there, other than just, um, growing, just, just sharing that. Um, we also grow it. And um, to do this, from the declaration point of view, we just go back to the transition that we already had, add another transition, uh, add a target to both of this, to the, to the transition to have the initial tar uh, transition set only target the photo that we already shared. Then we go and uh, add a second transition set targeting the author that we want to share as well, and um, add a text resize transition to that, which is a custom transition that George will cover in a minute. And um, then, of course, we need to tell the system what's going on and that things have changed. So far, we, changed, we, we shared the image and the target directly. If you only have one shared element, uh, this, is the right, uh, this is a good way to actually uh, get started with that, uh, to share this information with the uh, detail activity. If you have multiple shared elements, though, you want to have um, pairs, which can be created in separate ways. But this is one of the ways. You just create a pair which basically contains the same information. It contains the detail view, the, the starting view, as well as the target transition name. And then instead of uh, having this, uh, this on here, you just pass those two pairs in here um, and start the activity as is. And after all this is done, this is the nice transitions that you get. And with that, <laughs> let's take a look behind the curtain. All right. How's that fire hose, everyone? Good? Let's, let's drink some more. <laughs> All right, let's talk about some uh, making your own transitions. Uh, we saw the built-in ones, change bounds, change transform, those ones. Those are great basic transitions. But uh, if you want to change the text size, for example, it's not built in. We have to do that ourselves. So let's see how we go about making it. Let's make this resize text transition. All right. So we need to capture some data, right? And we need, of course, the font size. That's obvious, right? We need to capture the font size at the beginning, capture the font size at the end. And we also need some other data. But when we return the data set that we're going to track in our transition, we only, want, we only care about the font size. Because if the other stuff changes, like if the bounds changes only on your text view, we're not going to do any transition on that. We're only transitioning when the text size changes. So we just ignore the rest of the data. We still want to capture it. So that we, that's why we have those, those pieces of information, that, that tag that we're going to use in our transition values. But we just don't want to keep that uh, for the transition API, for the transition uh, framework. So if, when we capture our start values and end values, you remember this from what Nick said, uh, we want to capture them. And we have, this is the same thing in both the start and the end. We have a common uh, function to do. And 
first thing we have to do is we can just throw away anything that's not a text view, right? We're only animating text views. So anything else, we just ignore. Of course, we want to capture the font size, the text size here. And we also want to capture some other data. And I just stuck this all in its own class and so, you know, kind of hide that information. But we're, it's basic things like the bounds of the text view, because we're going to need that for the animation. All right, when you animate text, what do we do? Are we going to animate the font size? Well, if we do that, we're going to thrash our font cache, right? Every font size between the start and the end is going to be used and created in our, in our font cache. And we're going to have like font size 26.281. And you know, we're never going to use that again. It's just going to thrash our font cache. We don't want to do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to capture a bitmap at the start and a bitmap at the end. And we're going to animate. So here, if we, if we animate just the start, it looks pretty terrible, right? You see that thing blown up from the beginning. And also, if you animate just from the large size down, you end up with a, uh, a little bit of kerning error in the final text view. And you might not see it here on this, on this slide, but you're definitely going to see it when you're looking at the phone. And you really don't want to see your user, users to see that, that effect. You want to see a perfect transition. So instead of this, what we're going to do is we're going to animate piecewise. So we animate a little bit from the start, and you don't really see that blown up image, right? And then we're going to swap it out for the final image, just scaled down. And then we're going to animate the rest of the way. And because it's done during the motion, nobody will see that animation, that change, that swap there in the middle. OK? Let's see how we do that. OK? When we create our animator, first thing we have to do, of course, is to capture that we use our start values and end values. But here, we are checking the start values for null. What does null mean? It means the view didn't exist. So if the view didn't exist at the beginning or at the end, we don't want us to animate size. That's for fade, right? That's for the other, other transitions. OK? Next thing we have to do, of course, is capture the start bitmap. Right? So we just capture that bitmap. That's where that extra data is useful. And we also have to capture the end state bitmap. And then, of course, we have to say, don't text view. Don't draw yourself. Set yourself to transparent. All that text stuff, make it transparent. We don't want you to draw it. Because what we're going to do is create a drawable with those bitmaps that we just captured that's going to do the swapping for us. All right, so we need to animate some things on that drawable. One of them is the font size. We're going to have this font size that we're going to animate on the drawable. And we also have to animate those other things, that, all that other data I captured. But we need to know that stuff. So we, we get property values holders for those. And then we create the animator, right? And then we're all set to return, right? Everyone? Not quite. Remember what we just did? We set it to be invisible. Like, no, no, draw, don't draw that text. When the animation is done, we want it to go back to the normal state. So we set the text color back to normal. And we remove that overlay we just added. All right, so we're all set. We, our transition looks great. We're all set. Let's put it in an activity transition. All right, what does it look like? Holy moly. <laughs> Did you do this? <laughs> all right. No, no, OK. Remember what happened, what, what Nick was saying about this. The values are captured in the destination activity. And when the values are captured in the destination activity, text view doesn't have the text size of the source activity's text. So it doesn't even know that it was there. It doesn't know what that font size was. So what we have to do is send that along as extra data. Now, the, the, activity, the tra activity transitions system will send the basic stuff for you. It'll send you position, size, and image scale, right? Because those are very common things. And those are the things that are built into the system. Those are the transitions that are built into the system. But the other stuff, anything that you need to animate, you're going to have to send along as well. So we put those in as intent extras. That's easy enough. And then we get that intent extra in the target activity. And we get the, the, our font size. And then we call this shared element callback. The shared element callback is where you put all the really complex part of your activity transition. This is a callback that has lots of extra stuff for you to hook into to do the little tweaking that you need to do. And dur uh, during the start, what we will have to do, of course, is capture the, the, uh, transition, the text uh, size of the current text view, and then set it to the one that we want it to be in the start. 
And in the end, of course, we have to reset the text size back to what it was before. Otherwise, you just animate to the little tiny font from the start. So what happens now? You end up with a beautiful transition from activity to activity, nice and smooth. Now, Nick's going to come back and show this really awesome transition that he made up. <laughs> I, you guys have to see this. Thanks, Fjord. Awesome. Um, so that's been some pretty cool transitions we've looked at so far. One of my favorite things in the updated motion guidelines in the material spec is this um, section on transforming things. If you haven't seen this, I, I highly recommend you check out both this as well as there was an awesome session at I.O. Um, on Wednesday uh, by John Schlemmer about the updated motion guidelines. This talks about material design, about how things are you know, sheets of digital paper and so on, and that they can transform from one thing to another. This transition in particular caught my eye, uh, which is um, transitioning, transforming sorry, a floating action button, this circular fab, um, into a different sheet of material. Um, I thought this was pretty cool, and I wanted to use this in an um, open source app which I build called, called Plaid. Um, and I wanted to transform from this fab here into this, um, this bottom sheet, which is essentially a lin linear layout. So unlike the transitions we've looked at so far, which are pretty much um, acting on the same kind of view, so transitioning an image view in one window to an image view in another, or a text view to a text view, for example, um, this is like pretty different, right? We're going to go from a floating action button, basically an image button, um, to a, a linear layout, essentially. So how, how do we do that? Um, so it's really, really important to remember, as we've talked about before, that everything happens in the destination window, so in the window with this kind of bottom sheet here. So as with most animation things, we do some tricks to make it look like that one thing is transforming into the other. So what we do is in the um, destination window, we um, use set translation x and y to basically center the dialog on the, where the coordinates of the fab, so where it started from, just translation x and y. And then we use the view overlay again. So if you haven't used the view overlay, this is uh, the ability to add like drawables on top of um, the view. So we add a, a solid um, color drawable, as well as an icon um, on top of the view and locate that so it's in the center. And then we run some animations on this entire view. So first we, um, we fade out the color and the icon. We run a circular reveal animation, so that applies a circular clipping mask. And we start from the, um, the size of the fab, and then we animate that clip mask um, out to um, show the whole dialogue. And at the same time, we move along a curved path using this motion thing. So when we run all of those animations at the same time, you get this effect. It looks like you're transforming from the fab to the dialog. Um, so do you want to see how we build this? Oh, yeah. Before we do, you have to, let's think about what information we need to build it. Uh, so in order to build this transition, we need to know um, the positions, like where the um, fab was to where the dialog is. Uh, we need to know the color it's going to and the icon. Because as we've talked about, we keep on hammering on about, um, it all happens in the destination window. So the sheet doesn't know anything about the fab, right? So how do we um, get all this information? So the position is, is pretty easy. As George said, the position is one of the few things that actually does get passed through. So we can just, in the um, capture star and capture end bounds, we do the same thing. We just call capture values. And we um, put those bounds into um, the value, uh, transition values map. And we'll get access to those a bit later on. So we have the bounds of the fab and the dialog. So for the color and the icon, um, I basically created a, um, a couple of constructors that you can use. So just like views, um, transitions can, have, um, can be inflated from XML. So when we looked at the XML transition sets that Ben was showing you before, um, you can define your own transitions uh, as we did with the text resize. Uh, but you can also add your own attributes. So here's an example where we're doing um, you know, context.obtain style attributes, just as you would in a custom view. And you can define your own um, declare stylables and pull them out of that attribute. So we could pass in the color and the icon um, through attributes. And just a, a quick note. Um, we're setting the path motion here. So this is what we talked about before, adding a path motion to control the um, path, which is going to move along later. And we'll come back to using that in a second. But as an alternative, um, I also added a, a dynamic way of determining this, because there's actually um, different entry points I have into this screen. So um, I can't, couldn't statically declare in the um, details activity um, what color and icon it was going to come from, because it can come from multiple places into that screen. Um, so I added a, um, a constructor which will pass in um, the color and the icon to use. 
And so we can do um, the technique which George talked about earlier of using um, intent extras to pass this information to details activity. Um, but here's a pattern which I found um, really helpful for implementing this. This isn't part of the transitions API contract, but it's just a pattern I found useful. Uh, so I added a, um, a static method onto the transition object itself um, called add extras. Uh, so you can call this from the source activity, from the activity which has the fab and knows about the icon and the color. Um, so pass in those things in a static method, and it will add them to the um, extras for you. And then a corresponding um, setup method, I called it, which you would call from the destination activity, so from the activity with the bottom sheet, which will then um, pull those activity, those um, uh, parameters out of the intent um, extra fields. Um, and then it will actually create um, an instance of this transition object, which I called fab transform itself, um, set the target, and then set it on the window as the shared element enter. The reason I like this pattern is because it, it means it keeps the, um, the keys and so on private to the transition. You don't have to worry about exposing that. It kind of keeps it nicely encapsulated. Um, notice here that we're using um, set shared enter um, element transition. Um, but if you remember from the animation, it goes both from the fab to the sheet as well as animating from the sheet back down. So what that means is um, the, the, element, the, sorry, the shared enter transition was going to get used on the uh, return transition as well. So bear that in mind. It's going to become important in a second. Right, so we have all the information. We've created the transition object itself. How do we actually create the animators to, um, to run this transition to make it all happen? First off, we grab out the bounds that we saved into the transitions values map um, and hold on to those. I then do something where I just check basically which of those is wider. <laughs> it's uh, maybe not the most uh, sophisticated method, but that's how I work out if I'm going from the fab to the dialog or from the dialog to the fab. I'll basically use that Boolean later on um, to set up the appropriate um, animations. So for example, if you're going from the fab to the sheet, you do an expanding uh, circular reveal. Or if you're going from the sheet to the fab, you do a contracting circular reveal or circular hide. I don't know. So, um, next up, the view is always the end values.view. So even though you're given the start values and the end values, you're always acting on the end values.view. And something that took me a little while to get my head around was that it, the, that view is always in the state that it ends up in, which is to say, um, when we were going from the fab to the dialog, it was already laid out and positioned in the dialog's position. And then we reversed it by setting those translations and so forth to put it back into the fab's position, right? So it was already in its um, end state. Well, the same is true when I'm going back. So what that means is when I'm about to do the animation from the dialog back to the fab, the, fab's act the dialog's actually laid out like this, just in the exact same bounds as the, as the, um, as the fab. And so what you need to do is um, to manually call measure and layout onto the dialog in order to put it back into the position that you want to animate from. So it may sound counterintuitive at first that you have to call layout and measure yourself. Um, but this is just how the system works, that it's already in that same state. It was easy for us on the way in. We have to do a little bit more work on the way back. And then I just want to highlight the translation as well. So this is how we use that path motion. So we set a path motion on the, on, in the constructor early on. And here I'm using one of the overloads of Object Animator, which will actually animate two properties at once. So here I'm animating the translation x and y of the dialog. And we get hold of that path motion again and call get path, passing it in the start um, x and y and the end x and y. And that will generate the curved path and animate the translation along the curved path for us. We do some more um, animators for the circular reveal and the uh, fade and so on. And we put them in a set and return that. And that gives you that um, entire animation. So that's how it's done. And this is all open source as well, so there'll be a link at the end. You can go have a look if you want to go into all the nitty gritty details. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So let's talk about a few things that I think you guys will find really useful here. Transition names. Now, if you do things well with transition names, the system will work for you, and that will help you a lot. For example, we have a an animation here, transition, to go from this little guy to a big, take up the big thing. We have an activity, activity transition like that. And what's happening in our activity transition is, of course, we call start act, uh, make scene transition animation. And we have this view. And it, we do, it, my view doesn't have a transition name here. Or please don't do this. You call view.set transition name right here in this call. Uh, don't do that, OK? And I'll show you why. We have our activity here. We launch a new one. 
And then we or change the orientation of the phone. What happens now? That's right. Our activity gets rebuilt. But further, the thing underneath it gets rebuilt too. So even if you called view.setTransition name, you just lost that. It's gone. So now when the view goes, tries to come back, it has no idea which is the shared element. The transition name is used to identify which is, you know, going from the source to the target. And so it, it can map those two. And if it loses that transition name, it won't know what to do. You, of course, can fix that up for it if you want. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But the transition name is your friend. So in a system like this, where you have a recycler view, for example, when you bind your view, that's when you set your transition name. And it should be a unique name that you have for that item. And it can be a URL or whatever you want. It's fine. It's as long as it's a string that's unique. Uh, here, I bound it to the position. In my view holder, position is unique. Whatever. Uh, or, and a little plug for data binding, you can do it right in the layout, too, if you're using data binding. All right, that's awesome, by the way. I know some guy <laughs> who works on that. Let's talk about changing the shared elements. That means we have a different shared element than you originally thought. Here I have a view, an, uh, an activity, and it launches another one, and then we scroll in the detail view. And when we go back, we want to go back to a different shared element, right? Now, the transition system, of course, is going to try to go back to the same one you had before. We have to tell it something else. Step one, when you launch the activity, ask for which shared element is coming back. So you start activity for result. Okay. Step two, before you go back, set the result. Tell it which shared element is going to come back to you. Here I have an ID that I'm, I'm going to send back as a result. Step three, in on activity reenter, not on activity result. Now, I've gotten bitten by this just yesterday, I think it was, <laughs> when I was writing a, uh, a demo. Uh, on activity reenter, that's a new thing just for activity transitions here. It will be called before the shared element comes back. And this is where you can uh, do some tweaking. Here I'm going to get the data, get the shared element. Okay? And that's going to come back to me. All that data is coming back to me. And then we can also call a shared element exit callback, set the shared share element callback for the exit. Now, the exit is used for the exiting and also for the reenter. It's the same callback used for both. Okay? And this is where we can switch up our, activity, our shared elements. We can set our shared element to whatever we want in our view hierarchy. So here I've just I used the ID I just had, got before from the on uh, activity reenter, and I used it right now for my share, to change my shared element. And now it works perfectly. Let's talk about overlays. Shared elements often go into the overlay. If it'll just go right into the overlay, uh, unless we specifically tell it not to. Now, the great thing about this is it's drawn on top of everything, right? Because you don't want to have your shared element drawn underneath something over there, right? And it's also not clipped by the parent. And that's really important. But the problem is it's drawn on top of everything. <laughs> and when it's drawn on top of everything, there's a little bit of a problem. And, it, uh, and it's also not clipped by the parent. <laughs> Sorry, it's All right. Now, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, here's a, a real example I had of this issue, which is um, in this screen, again from Plaid, um, when you click on a, you know, a, a, a list item, it, it, I wanted to have this expand and grow out. So I wanted to um, have a shared element where the, ba the background was actually one of the shared elements. So if you look at this transition, there's two shared elements going on here. There's an image going from one position to the other, but also the background transitions to give that growing effect. So this is all well and good, but if you were to use the um, overlay to do the transition, if you put the background into the overlay, it's going to be on top of everything else, right? So you get this horrible effect where it kind of grows up, and you don't see any content, and it snaps in, right? That's not what we want. We actually want the content to be able to kind of come in on top of the uh, background. So hopefully we can control that, George. Yeah, we can. Well, all we have to do to make the shared amount do something different is tell it not to. And so we just set this value in your, uh, in your styles. But you might end up with a little bit of a problem. Uh, I think it was you. You did it, right? No. Uh, well, the problem is this. Let's see what's going on here. The shared element is, of course, popped into the new activity. And when that happens, 
it's being clipped by its parent. And it's only visible when the shared image slides into the parent view. So what we can do, of course, is tell the parent, don't clip it. So you say, uh, tell the parent, say, set clip children to false, and also set clip to padding false as well. Now this is, might cause you a little bit of a problem with your drawing, so be careful with this. And also it's a performance issue, you might consider uh, doing this only during your transition. But you can't do it just on the parent of the view of the shared element. You have to go all the way up because the grandparent can also clip the child and clip your shared element. That's no good. The other option is to do as Nick did in his, is to put it right into the root, into the root of his uh, layout as a child of that. And now it's not going to be clipped by anything because the root, of course, owns the whole window. It's fine. All right, let's take a look at it now that it has no clipping. It comes in instead of like a, a flash, comes in on top, just like we want. All right, Ben. Cool. Whoop. So as you may have seen, uh, within some of these transitions, and in general, if you work with transitions, you uh, also have access to the window decorations, those basically status bar and the navigation bar backgrounds. Um, so let's take a look at what you can do is um, you just say define a slide transition, and what will happen with that is that it slides all the content in. Um, as we, uh, we highlighted the uh, status bar here to show you what's going on. So it slides the status bar in as well. But we actually don't want to do this. And as you can see on the bottom on the navigation bar, there's also a flash. And in the last moment of that, it still it slides up as well. So in order to avoid this, there's a couple of ways you can do this. But what you want to do is you want to exclude both the status bar background and the navigation bar background. So we provided IDs as well as transition names for those um, so you, get, you can work with them. That is one of the ways that you can do it. Obviously, you can do this um, not just in XML, as we showed you before, but also uh, when you do this within your, uh, within your code. You basically just say, on this transition, exclude the target and um, set those, those values to true. But you can also do something a little bit more uh, nifty. You can add this to the uh, shared element transitions. So you could have recolors in there or just fade out stuff when you want, uh, or fade them out um, within a shared element transition. Um, this is, in order to do this, you basically go all the way up in the view hierarchy. You get the decor view of your window. Then you find the views by ID. You create the uh, pairs. This is the second way you can create pairs. So in other than, it's another way than to, to calling that. Um, and then adding them to the shared element transition to actually have the system being aware of exactly that. And then you get the desired behavior of no, no flashes, no exploding or just moving out of the way um, status bar or um, navigation bar background. And with that, we actually have um, a little room for questions. So you can start lining up if you have questions, about six minutes. Um, thank you very much for being here. Um, it's been a pleasure to uh, talk to you about transitions. And we have open source all the code already for uh, the samples that we gave here. So the new one, the, the one with the images that we just showed, is uh, on Unsplash. You definitely have to take a look in Nick Butcher's Plaid app if you want to go into the advanced things on transitions. There's also Topeka out there and another sample called Our Streets. Um, you can take, we uh, looked through the training that we have. And um, yeah, thank you very much for your questions. Hi, I'm Timothy Jordan, and you've been watching the Google I.O. 2016 live stream. Thanks for joining us. I hope that you've had as much fun as we have. If you want to make sure not to miss a single session, head on over to the Google Developers YouTube channel. The playlist is now live.